Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to Golden now. Radio Golden Hour. Radio Hour. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I know that Dr. Watson will agree with me when I tell you that the best way to begin a good meal is with a glass of Petri California Sherry. Before you sit down at the table, pour yourself and your family a glass of Petri Sherry. Try it. There are many ways to tell a good wine by its color, its aroma, and its flavor. On every count, Petri Sherry is outstanding. The color of Petri Sherry is a clear, deep amber. Perfect. The aroma? Well, Petri Sherry is as fragrant as a bunch of dew-covered grapes picked in the early morning. But most important to you, and to me, is the flavor of Petri Sherry. We want a wine that tastes good. And believe me, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri Sherry. And just to make sure you get a wine that's exactly the way you want it, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. The regular and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure which you like better, why not try them both? Don't buy one, buy two. Just be sure you always buy Petri. Petri Sherry. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Martin. Quiet, quiet, it. I don't want it. <laughs> Dogs seem very chipper tonight, Doctor. Have they been getting into any more trouble lately? No, no, my boy. It's been a relatively quiet week for them. One meeting with a dead seal, two visits to my neighbor's chickens, and a losing battle today with a cross-eyed... Sammy's cat. <laughs> you, you call that a quiet week, huh? Oh, it is for them, but never mind about the dogs. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. You're just in time to join me in a, in a glass of sherry. That'll be very nice, Doctor. Oh, I see you have the old dispatch box out again. Yes, my boy. As the story I'm going to tell you tonight took place in 1887, I thought I'd better refresh my memory on some of the details of the case. Shortly after my marriage, and as I had bought a practice in the Paddington district, I saw very little of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. How was doctoring in those early days? A struggle, my boy, a distinct struggle. Dr. Farquhar, from whom I had bought the practice, had at one time an excellent clientele, but his age, combined with an unfortunate affliction, the year that resembled St. Vitus's dance, uh, had very much thinned it. I had uh, uh, confidence, however, in my, in my youth and in my energy. And I was convinced that in a very few years, the practice would be as flourishing as ever. But, as I said, I saw very little of Holmes in those days. I guess you were too busy to visit Baker Street, aren't I? Yeah, you guessed quite correctly, Mr. Bartow, quite correctly. Uh, Holmes seldom went anywhere himself, save on professional business. You can imagine my surprise, therefore, when one day on coming home from a heavy day's work, I found that Holmes had decided to pay us a visit. My wife persuaded him to stay to dinner, and as the three of us sat at the table, the flickering candlelight dancing strange patterns on the walls, but it quite like old times. Holmes was in an unusually gay mood, and I can remember the twinkle in his eye as he turned to my wife and said, You're a brave woman, Mrs. Watson, to feed an unexpected guest on the maiden night out. I'm extremely grateful. Mrs. Hudson's cooking, though excellent of its kind, lacks variety. Uh, your dinner has been quite a treat. <laughs> That's a very gracious little speech, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> yes, uh, I've never known you to be so observant about food, Holmes. <laughs> Perhaps the lack of your company, my dear chap, and the consequent lonely meals have made me conscious of Mrs. Hudson's culinary shortcomings. <laughs> uh, I, um, I suppose you're taking John out with you tonight on one of your cases. <laughs> oh, no, Mrs. Watson. Oh, I can understand your suspicions. My visit was purely social. Then well, let's go into the other room and, and have a pipe, shall we? Well, uh, don't you think you'd be more comfortable at the club? <laughs> Miss old Mary, I believe you want to get rid of us. Oh, <laughs> no, dear, it's not that. It's just that... Uh, that um, well, your visitor is due at any moment and you had counted on the house being empty by now. Why, how on earth did you know that, Mr. Holmes? <laughs> Past half hour, you've been glancing at the clock with mounting anxiety. I feel sure that... Um, 
If it had been, if it had not been for my unexpected visit, your uh, your good husband would already have been walking towards his club. Yeah, it is my custom to go to the club on Thursdays, but uh, but how do you know? <laughs> I know your habits, my dear chap, as well if not better than you do. It's a it's a good thing I'm a bachelor, isn't it, Mrs. Watson? Yes, indeed. A wife could keep no secrets from you, Mister Holmes. I'm sure. Uh, well, Mary dear, who who is your visitor, and uh, what is the secret that you you've been hiding? <laughs> it's innocent enough, John. As Thursdays is the maid's night out and you've been going to the club, I've been letting Alicia Wentworth meet her young man here. With me as chaperone, of course. Oh, that's a mystery. Well, Watson, <laughs> yes. the library's on the wing and I'm sure we're dreadfully in the way. Let's uh, stroll to Baker Street, shall we? Well, of course, I'll get my coat. Uh, oh, why didn't you tell me, ma'am? Well, I was afraid you might be angry, John. Angry, of course, ma'am. Alicia is such a sweet girl. And Harry Prendergast is a very charming young man. He comes from an excellent family, has a commission in the infantry, and the children are tremendously in love. But her beastly guardian forbids them to meet. So I... Oh, there she is now. Well, we can pretend that we were just leaving anywhere. Yes, I'll get my coat. Hello, Alicia, dear. Oh, Mrs. Watson, I'm so glad to see you. Come here. Alicia, this is my husband... And Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, my dear? It's a shame that we have to go now, but my friend and I have some very important business to attend to. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective, aren't you? Yes, Miss Whitworth. Please don't go, Mr. Holmes. Please don't. I need help so badly. Why, Alicia, what's wrong? You're as white as a ghost. Let's go into the drawing room, shall we? What's troubling you, Miss Wentworth? It's Harry, Captain Prendergast. I don't know exactly what's the matter, but something dreadful has happened to him. Oh, now sit down here beside me, dear. That's it. Miss Wentworth, uh, what reason do you have to suppose that Captain Prendergast is in trouble? I've seen friends of his today. They spoke of him almost as if he were dead. And yet they wouldn't tell me why. And just now I went to his club. And they told me that Captain Prendergast was not a member. But he is a member. He's been a member for years. Oh, what's happened to it? What has happened to it? There, there, dear. Mr. Holmes will help you. Now, don't you cry. Have you uh, been to the police, Miss Wentworth? No, Doctor. You see, I went to my guardian, but he wouldn't let me go to the police. He said there'd be a scandal. But then he hates her. The Prendergast are a fine family. Uh, why does your garden object to, uh, object, uh, object to him so strongly? I don't think he would approve of anyone I choose. He doesn't want me to get married. Oh, sounds like a positive ogre to me. Uh, who, who is your guardian, my dear? Colonel Moran. Colonel Sebastian Moran. Indeed. He's a man who has many entries against him in my ledgers, but a man that I've never met. I have long hoped to cross swords with him directly. But... But how could Uncle Sebastian have anything to do with the criminal profession, Mr. Holmes? He's the son of Sir August Moran. And he was once British minister to Persia. Oh, oh, you must be confusing him with someone else. No, my dear, it's the same man. And furthermore, I'm almost certain that your guardian is the right-hand man of a certain friend of mine whose name also begins with the three letters M-O-R. Good Lord, Mariate. I have no proof. And yet I suspect that Colonel Moran is the second most dangerous man in London. That's Harry. It must be Harry. Oh, poor girl. I do hope you can help her, Mr. Holmes. I shall do my best, Mrs. Well, Watson. that is her young man at the door, it's more than likely her problem doesn't exist any longer. I hope you're right, Watson. Though with Colonel Moran as a guardian, I'm afraid the young lady is destined to have trouble. Come on, Harry. Good evening, Mrs. Watson. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Harry. Uh, this is my husband. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, my boy? And Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Captain Prendergast? How do you do, sir? Harry, what's wrong? I can tell by your face that something dreadful has happened. It has, darling. Tell Mr. Holmes about it. He's promised to help us. Well, sir, I'm afraid this is a little outside of your province. <laughs> you will find that my friend's province is quite extensive, Captain Prendergast. I should be more than happy to do anything I can to help, sir. That's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes. Well, it's pretty bad. Last night I was accused of cheating at cards at the Tankerville Club. Oh, dreadful. Of course, I don't have to tell you that I didn't cheat, but the evidence was dead against me. I'd been winning heavily, and the cards were proved to be marked. Marked? How? Oh. There were pinpricks on the edges. Pinpricks which indicated the card's value. Hmm. How did the pack of cards come into play? That's the devil of it. I myself broke open a sealed pack given to me by the club porter. And I swear, that was the pack that was later found to be marked. Was everyone searched? Yes. But they found a new, unopened pack in my pocket. The obvious implication being that you had substituted the marked cards, of course. I can see what happened. Somebody deliberately tried to incriminate you by dropping the new pack in your pocket. Of course, darling. But what I can't understand is how the marked pack was introduced into the game. Were there any other cards found in the room? None, Doctor. The Tankerville, eh? Colonel Moran is a member of the club, isn't he? Yes, he is. Uncle Sebastian uses it all the time. He was present at the game last night, Alicia. Oh, Harry. Now we're worse off than ever. 
If he thinks you cheated at cards, he'll never let us get married. Now, don't worry, Alicia. I'm sure that Mr. Holmes can find a way out of this. I'm afraid it'll be too late. I couldn't marry you now, Alicia. What do you mean, Harry? But they forced me to resign from the club. That's a bad enough disgrace. But I know there's worse to come. You see, I was expecting my promotion to major any day. Now it'll be a miracle if I'm not cashiered from the regiment. What kind of a life can I offer you? Harry, you're talking absolute nonsense. I think, Captain Prendergast, the next step is obvious. We must remove this apparent stain on your character. But how? Miss Wentworth can stay here with Mrs. Watson. The doctor and I will drive over in a cab with you to the club and see what can be done. What kind of a, a card game were you playing last night, Prendergast? Stud poker. Ever since the American ambassador introduced it at the club, it's been quite a favorite. The perfect game for marked cards, which requires no elaborate dexterity in the dealing, simply the knowledge of your opponent's whole card. How many of you were playing? Half a dozen of us. Uh, you, uh, you were winning heavily, you say? Yes, Doctor. Though one of the others, a fellow named David Harkness, was doing well. Now I come to think of it, Harkness almost seemed to know when I was bluffing as though he could see the marked card. Well, perhaps he was the one who marked them. It's possible. And yet certainly no one could accuse him of tricky dealing. He was so clumsy with his bandaged finger, eh? How did you know he had a bandaged finger, Mr. I'll Holmes? tell you that, Captain Prendergast, when you tell me what's really on your mind. There's a great deal more at stake than a card scandal, isn't there? Yes, there is. I didn't dare to tell Alicia about it. You see, I'm fighting a duel tomorrow. A duel? Lord, with whom? Colonel Moran. Huh? He insulted me last night. He goaded me beyond a man's patience. He taunted me until I couldn't stand it any longer. And so I challenged him. And in so doing, gave him the choice of weapons. Yes, confound it. Of course, he chose revolvers. Moran is a big game hunter of note. He was reputed to be the best shot in England. And I'm probably the worst in London. If only I could shoot as well as I can box. I'm regimental champion, you know. Revolvers? Good heavens, man. Revolvers, a, a duel with Moran is, is suicide for you. No, it's not suicide. Ah, the tank of those clubs. Here, cabby. Keep the change, will you? Oh, blimey. Thank you, Governor. Suicide. No, what's not suicide? This is a carefully laid plan for murder. Pray heaven that we are not too late to avert it. It's Mr. Harkness that you want him, sir? Yes, he... He went to his room half an hour ago, number 108, up the main stairs and down the corridor, sir. Thank you. I uh, want you to follow us in precisely one minute and bring a sealed pack of the club's playing cards to Mr. Harkness' room. Do you understand? Oh, yes, sir. And thank you. Did you, uh, did you make the arrangement? Yes, come on. Let's go up to Harkness' room. The three members have cut me dead since I came in here. The most humiliating experience. A little patience, Captain Prendergast, and I'm sure your honor will be entirely vindicated. I wish I knew what you were up to, Holmes. I'm going to try and restage the drama that was presented in this club last night. The only difference being that my production will have a cast that's a little different. Now, here we are. Now, let me do the talking. Yes? Did you want something? Prendergast, I don't want you in my rooms. I don't know why they allowed you inside the club. Let us in, Mr. Harkness, please. No, I won't. Take your foot out of the door, confound uh, Mr. Harkness, there are three of us. <clears throat> I think you'd better let us in. You're going to let us in, Harkness. Oh, all right. Come in. Ah, oh, thank you for your hospitality, sir. Now perhaps you fellows will tell me what the devil you think you're up to. With pleasure. As you very well know, Mr. Harkness, this is probably Captain Prendergast's last day on Earth. He has one request to make of you that you join him in a farewell game of poker with us to show you bear no grudges. Oh, it's fantastic. You're all insane. Oh, by the way, Mr. Harkness, I'm delighted to notice that your sore finger seems to have healed with great rapidity. By an odd coincidence, you'll observe that uh, I seem to have injured mine. Mr. Holmes, when did you do that? Oh, in the carriage just now. A mere scratch. Fortunately, I had some first aid materials in my greatcoat. Come in. Yes, Taylor, what is it? Begging your pardon, Mr. Harkness, but... The gentleman asked me to bring this sealed pack of cards here. Uh, put them on the table, Taylor. Very good, sir. Well, what's the game? 
stud poker, Mr. Harkness. A game with which you're quite familiar, I understand. And the stakes? A man's honor. Possibly another man's freedom. Open the pack, Mr. Harkness, and deal us all a hand. I should think this might be a very unusual game. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to explain that Petri California Sherry is not only an ideal wine to serve before dinner, but it's also the perfect wine for almost any occasion. Petri Sherry is fine after dinner, when you're listening to the radio or just sitting around talking. And, of course, you couldn't ask for a finer party wine than Petri Sherry, especially if your party is at cocktail time. If you don't know what wine to buy, you can't go wrong with Petri Sherry. But be sure it's Petri. Look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Well, Dr. Watson, that was quite a game of poker you were settling down to. Uh, I have a feeling that Sherlock Holmes had an ace or two up his sleeve, didn't he? Well, figuratively, he did, Mr. Bartell. Though at the time, I must confess that, as usual, I was pretty much in the dark. David Harkness opened the new sealed pack of cards, and the four of us played a hand of poker. It was easy to see that our unwilling host was far from happy. His ferrety eyes darted from one to the other of us as he played our cards. <clears throat> He knew that he was the victim of a conspiracy, and so he was watching every move we made. Finally, as that strange game progressed, Captain Prendergast leaned across the table and said, I think you're bluffing, Harkness. Do you? Well, it'll cost you exactly the limit to find out. How curious are you? My Joe, I think you are bluffing, Harkness. I'll see you. You'd be a fool to Watson when he has a straight flush. What do you mean, Holmes? My dear Harkness. The markings are quite apparent, I assure you, to someone who knows what he's looking for. Scott, you mean that these cards are marked too? Examine them for yourself, old chap. They are marked. They're pinpricked just like they were last night. Well, that's impossible. Harkness broke the seals on the new pack just now. We all saw him do it. He couldn't have switched the pack. And why would I do that, even if I could? I wouldn't try and cheat Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would I? No, Mr. Harkness. I just wanted you to know that I understood the trick. What trick, Mr. Holmes? The same one that was played on you last night, Captain Prendergast. This was a demonstration of how easily a sealed pack of cards may be turned into a marked one by a man with a sore finger. What has a sore finger got to do with it, Holmes? Oh, it's very simple, Watson. A pinhead or a thumbtack hidden under the bandage, a tiny pressure against a card one wishes to mark as it comes into one's hand, and after several deals... (laughs) Hey, presto, a marked pack. Oh, so that's how it was done. You can't prove it, Holmes. You can't prove a thing. You weren't here last night. Oh, unfortunately, I wasn't, Mr. Harkness. Otherwise, I should have had the great pleasure of exposing your trick at the time. As it is, I shall have to rely on a public confession. (laughs) You'll never get a confession from me. Possibly not, but I'm sure that you'll be interested to know that I've made quite an extensive study of card shopping. In fact, I considered giving a little lecture or demonstration here at the club. What are you talking about? This game that we've just played was in the nature of a rehearsal. I should, of course, stress this particular method as being of uh, great local interest. I'm sure most of the gambling members will recall one man who has had uh, unusually bad luck with his fingers. Holmes, you're trying to ruin me. Well, you were willing to see Prendergast ruined. And killed. But a pistol duel with Colonel Moran is almost equivalent to murder. What? What do you want me to do? Uh, From the direction of your glance, Mr. Harkness, I'm certain that you keep a loaded revolver in your desk drawer. That's a very poor solution, I assure you. Why not be a man, write a confession, and sign it? It'll free Captain Prendergast from any stigma, and it'll help to trap the real culprit, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Moran? Where does he come into the picture, Holmes? Mr. Harkness knows, don't you? And I think I know now. Why don't you tell us, Harkness? One thing at a time, Prendergast. I owe it to you to write a confession. I'll do that. Rather than face a public exposure in the club, but that's as far as I'll go. If you have any ideas about Moran, go and talk to him yourselves. There's a certain honor, you know. Even among thieves? Thank you for the implication, Mr. Harkness. You have writing materials here? Yes, I have writing materials, Holmes. Splendid. Then while you're telling the truth about last night's episode, we'll call on Colonel Sebastian Moran. Have you any idea where we might find him at this time of night? Yes, I have every idea. You'll find him in the gun room. Thinks he has a jewel on his hands tomorrow. In the gun room, eh? Thank you, Mr. Harkness. We'll go and talk to him. You may expect us back within half an hour. Turn the gas up, can't you? Colonel Moran, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? 
Uh, Colonel Moran, I've been wanting to meet you for a very long time. Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> I've heard a lot about you. And I of you, Colonel. Harry, what are you doing inside the club? Mr. Holmes brought me back. We've just left David Harkness's room. He's writing a confession that he engineered the swindle last night, that he deliberately tried to involve me. So, in that case, I suppose I need oil this revolver no longer. Harkness is a cheat. Dear me, how shocking. Aren't you glad that my name will be cleared in this business? Of course I am. I'm delighted. And you'll apologize for the things that you said last night? Yes, Harry, I'll apologize. But you must realize that this revelation makes no difference to my feelings about your marriage to Alicia. Upon my soul, Colonel Moran, it seems to me that one way... Dr. Uh, uh, Watson, I think the name is. Watson, yes, my name's Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson, I would suggest that the happiness of my ward is a matter that cannot possibly concern you. Now, look here, sir, I, I don't want to go... Me, will you, old chap? Oh, sorry, uh, Colonel Moran, I think I may be able to change your mind on the question of your ward's marriage. How very interesting. Mm -hmm. And what makes you labor under that delusion? Would you care to have it known at the club that you had deliberately planned Captain Prendergast's murder? What in thunder are you talking about? You know, sir, that a revolver duel with you is no duel. It's a cold-blooded killing. Rubbish. I was challenged. Therefore, I had the choice of weapons. Naturally, I chose the weapon with which I was most familiar. And you had the choice for a very good reason, Colonel Moran. You forced Prendergast into a duel because it was the only way you, be you could be certain that he'd never marry your ward. Alicia? What do you know about her? More than you think, sir. She's at my wife's house this very minute. As she suspects you of jealousy. I think it's far more likely that the financial aspect of guardianship is involved here. A financial accounting is due upon her marriage, isn't it? That's none of your business. An accounting is due, Mr. Holmes. Alicia told me that herself. Exactly. And the accounts were in no state to undergo scrutiny. The answer is obvious. David Hartness, a card shop, was in need of money. You induced him to practice his cheating last night in order that you could trap Captain Prendergast into a duel. <laughs> <clears throat> Harkness, what the devil do you want? Put that revolver down, you fool. I don't care about my own disgrace, but you're going to pay for your share in it, Moran. Drop that revolver, Harkness. Don't you see that you're... Oh, oh. Moran, you... You shot him. You saw that it was in self-defense, gentlemen. He was waving a loaded revolver at me. It's most unfortunate, but it was in self-defense. Yes, self-defense that removed the one dangerous witness who could have testified against you. He's dead, Watson, isn't he? Yes. Shot right through the heart. Moran, you're a cold-blooded, murdering devil. I demand satisfaction for that insult. These gentlemen are my witnesses. I apologize for the misunderstanding last night, but this is a different matter. You've insulted me, Harry. The duel will take place, Colonel Moran, and Dr. Watson and myself will act as seconds for Captain Prendergast. Let's make the necessary arrangements, shall we? <laughs> Watson? Yes, Alicia, dear. It's two o'clock. What can have happened to them? They left here just after eight. Oh, well, if, if you'd been married to John for any length of time, my dear, you wouldn't worry. When your husband goes out with Sherlock Holmes, you're prepared not to see him for a few days. Mrs. Watson, what are you saying? I haven't got a husband. Hmm? Oh. Oh, now, Alicia, don't, don't glower at me like that. What did you say the time was? It's just after two, and they left here at eight. What can have happened? Well, I don't know. But Mr. Holmes was with them. So don't worry, my dear. He's frightfully clever. I wouldn't be surprised. There's the front door now. They're back. Oh, dear me. Now I'll have to make Coco. Harry! Harry, darling, what's happened? Oh, lots of things, darling. I'm a member of the Tankerville Club again. I'll probably become a major. And you'll certainly become Mrs. Prendergast before very long. Oh, it all sounds wonderful. What have you two been up to? Doc? Oh, it's the old story, Mary, dear. Holmes solved the case and it all ended happily. Happily? My dear Watson, that's hardly the word to use. Harkness is dead and Colonel Moran is probably in hospital. Please, tell me what happened. <laughs> well, your, your guardian challenged Captain Prendergast to a duel. Um, he overlooked the fact that uh, since he was the challenger, the choice of weapons belonged to his opponent. Well, perhaps you can guess what that choice was. Boxing gloves. Yeah, we've just come from the gymnasium at the club, Alicia. I'm afraid I really gave him a thrashing. Uh -huh. And a well-deserved one, too. I'm only sorry that I couldn't put him where he belongs, behind prison bars. Oh, Harry. He'll be the laughing stock of London. I'm glad of it. But 
But that means that he'll never consent to our being married. I disagree, Miss Wentworth. If we keep his secret, and we've hinted that we might, I'm quite certain that he'll withdraw his objections to the marriage, and somehow he'll make up his deficiencies in his guardianship account. Probably by borrowing money from Professor Moriarty. Oh, oh I think it's all wonderful. But it's well after two o'clock in the morning. Let's go into the kitchen, shall we? I'll make some cocoa. Cocoa? cocoa for a whiskey? Uh, Harry, yeah? you and Alicia stay here. You probably have some plans to make. Oh, cocoa's not a very exciting drink. Oh, it? shush, John. Oh, sorry, no. As soon as the cocoa's ready, we'll call you. Well, Doctor, that was, that was some story. You know... I'm glad the age of dueling is over. I'd hate to have someone challenge me to a duel. What's the matter, Mr. Bartell? Are you afraid of being uh, hurt? Afraid of being hurt? Of course not. If someone challenges me to a duel, I, I have the right to choose the weapons, don't I? Yes, and what weapons would you choose? Cream puffs at 30 paces. Nobody's going to hurt me. <laughs> I see that. See that. <laughs> How long? Come to think of it, instead of cream puffs, I'd rather have a piece of cake. Oh, why a piece of cake? Because it tastes so good with a glass of Petri Sherry. Any questions? Uh, no questions. <laughs> For a while there, I'll bet you thought I'd forgotten all about Petri oh, wine. Oh, forgotten about it. Not you, Mr. Bartell. No, not anybody Never who's ever tasted it. it. Petri wine is the kind of wine you'll always remember. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. They've been making wine for generations. Winemaking is their heritage. It's an art that's been handed on down in the Petri family from father to son, from father to son. Every drop of Petri wine is clear, fragrant, and delicious. As delicious as the luscious, sun-ripened California grapes from which it's made. Remember, the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that their wine is the kind of wine you like. For any occasion. You can't miss with Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Uh, next week? Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that took place in the gay Vienna of the 90s. Concerns a strange tragedy that occurred on a ballroom floor and a weird series of murders that were punctuated by the sound of music. I call the story The Waltz of Death. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Five Orange Pips. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week. Next week, many communities will change time, and this program will reach some of our listeners at a different hour. Consult your local newspaper or mutual station for the exact time in your area. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Sherlock Holmes considered himself as the only unofficial consulting detective, and rightly so. In point of fact, Holmes worked outside the law. If he'd been a policeman working for Scotland Yard, he would certainly not have had the freedom that allowed him to use his unorthodox methods. This both pleased the police and frustrated them. Pleased them because he almost invariably let such men as Inspector Lestrade and Inspector Gregson take the public recognition for a case that he had solved. Frustrated them because he could literally work on a case using his own specialized abilities while they had to stay within prescribed limits. 
Yet Holmes did respect the law, for he was, in fact, an amateur, and felt it best to have a healthy relationship with the professional police. This encouraged such men as Lestrade and Gregson to bring various unsolved crimes to him for his solution. His freedom outside the restraints of the law allowed him to assume many roles in disguise and to work with Watson as his accomplice. Excellent examples of this kind of work can be found in such original stories as uh, A Scandal in Bohemia, The Man with the Twisted Lip, and The Illustrious Client, to name but a few. He often broke open safes to get information, set fires to force some action out of an individual, such as uh, Irene Adler, or broke into homes in order to gain access to information that would lead to the solving of the crime. Any admonitions by the police were soon dropped when Holmes produced the criminal or solved the crime. Most of this work was done by Holmes and Watson in London or various other parts of England. In The Waltz of Death, Holmes and Watson find themselves in Vienna on a case. Now here, on foreign territory, and completely outside the orthodox methods of the English police, Holmes had even more free reign. He still used his brilliant sense of deductive logic, but now he did not have to worry about reprimands from Scotland Yard. And besides, there was new excitement for Holmes when he could deal with murder from other than the English criminal. Join me now as we present Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in The Waltz of Death. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson as he tells you another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'm going to tell you about a swell idea. The idea of serving Petri California sherry before dinner. Tomorrow night, just before dinner, instead of that last-minute rush, take it easy. Pour yourself a glass of Petri sherry. Now, if you'll do that just once, I wouldn't have to say another word about Petri sherry. You'd be a customer for life. Because Petri sherry is good wine with a capital good. Judge that Petri sherry any way you like. By its beautiful amber color, its heart of the grape aroma, or by the best test of all, its flavor. Petri sherry is delicious. And you have a choice of two kinds. Petri regular and Petri pale dry sherry. If you're not sure which you'll like better, try them both. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's go in and join. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. All set for tonight's story? Yes, my boy, I'm all set, as you put it. It began in Vienna in 1889. The old Vienna of bright lights, lovely ladies, and lilting music. What were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing there, Doctor? Mr. Bartell, what were we doing there? Yes, sir. Were you just taking a trip? Oh, in those early days of our association, we didn't have either the time or the money for trips. No, we were in Vienna at the express command of the Emperor Franz Josef. It was in October, I remember, that we arrived in the city, and for several days we were forced to cool our heels awaiting the imperial pleasure. It was on one of those idle evenings that the good services of our friend, the Chief of Police, Count Frano, secured us an invitation to a resplendent ball that was being held at the palace of Princess Stephanie von Kram. It was an incredibly colorful spectacle, Mr. Bartell. A string orchestra high in the gallery of the palace ballroom played a haunting Strauss waltz, while on the floor below, the cream of Viennese aristocracy swayed and glided gaily to the lilting music. I can remember the picture so well, Mr. Bartell, that Holmes and I stood there talking to the chief of police, Count Lefrano. A colorful scene, is it not, gentlemen? 
By George, yes, Captain Fowler. It must be a real holiday for you and Mr. Holmes. What makes you say that, Watson? Well, it's hard to think of the criminal world when one looks at such a gathering. And yet Count Perfano knows as well as I do that the criminal is not confined to class or environment. Indeed, no, Mr. Holmes. I can assure you that every guest here tonight has been scrutinized as he entered. Yes, I imagine that many plainclothes men are present in this room now, aren't they, Count Perfano? Oh, yes. We take no chances. Well, you can't afford to. There's enough jewelry being worn here tonight for a king's ransom, I should say. Ah, uh, the waltz is finished. Now I can present you to our hostess, Princess von Kram. Stephanie, my pigeon. My pigeon must know the princess pretty well. Yes, I'm glad to see that in Vienna, the profession of criminal detection carries no social stigma. Allow me to present you Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, the Princess Stephanie von Kram. I'm very honored to meet you, Your Highness. I'm most happy to meet you, gentlemen. Permit me to introduce my protege, Janos Hervat, the Hungarian composer. Thank you, Mr. Hervat. This ball tonight, Mr. Holmes, will mark a rare occasion. A signal honor is to be conferred on Herr Horvat and myself before tonight is through. The next waltz is a new composition of his. Tonight will be its debut. Indeed, how very interesting. It is a great honor the princess has conferred on me. A new composition could not possibly be presented under more auspicious circumstances. Count Frana, you spoke of an honor in connection with yourself. May I tell them our secret, Stephanie? No, I will tell them myself, Anatole. After your waltz has been played, Janusz, and Anatole and I shall be the first to have the privilege of dancing to it, my father is to make a public announcement. He is to announce my engagement to Count Anatole Refond. Oh, indeed. My congratulations, congratulations. you yes. both. Very lucky yes. fellow. Yes. Well, Am I not the luckiest of men? Yes. Is she not exquisite? I, the gay man of Vienna, the cavalier who swore that no one woman would ever capture him, I confess it, gentlemen, I'm in love. Oh, oh but I pity you. Even the great waltzes of old Vienna could hardly be worthy of this moment. <laughs> oh, Anatole, you are a born flatterer. Oh, come, the waltz is about to begin. I shall see you, gentlemen, later. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. <clears throat> the orchestra is tuning up, Herr Horvath. I imagine this is a great moment for you. A very frightening one, I assure you, my friend. In a few minutes, I shall know whether my new work is to be crowned with success or failure. Count Frano is leading the princess to the center of the floor. The conductor is raising his battle. This is your moment, Herr Horvath. Good luck. Pray for me, gentlemen. Pray for me. There they go, the princess and Count Frano. They're starting the waltz. Ah, they make a striking pair, don't they? Here come the other couples out on the floor. Charming. Quite charming. It reminds me of... <laughs> Great stop, Captain. That was a revolver shot. It's the princess. She's been shot. Come on, Watson. Out of the way, please. Out of the way. Count Rufano, what happens? Stephanie, Dr. Watson, see what you can do for her. Count Rufano, there's... There's nothing I can do, I'm afraid. She was shot through the brain. She died instantly. Stephanie is dead. Stop that devilish music. Lock all the doors. There's a murderer to be found. Count Rufano, have you found any clues? One of my men found a revolver. It had been tossed into the earth of a potted palm. May I see it, please? Of course, here. Rammed into the soft earth. Confound it. Count Rufano, your fiancée was an extremely beautiful woman. You must have had rivals. Yes, several, but none of them are present tonight. Uh, who will inherit her estate? A six-month-old nephew. Who's his guardian? The Emperor Franz Josef himself. No, no, Mr. Holmes. I know of no obvious motive for someone wishing poor Stephanie dead. Well, perhaps it was a political crime. She was a wealthy aristocrat and a very prominent one. Yes, it's very possible. Many nihilist assassins have been active in my country recently. Meanwhile, we have a ballroom full of suspects waiting for us. I was just going to suggest we went back there. We can't find out very much by staying here in the library. It's a delicate matter. Almost everyone present tonight is known to me personally. Uh, may I suggest that you go back to the ballroom and have the male guests file past you? Detained for questioning anyone whose evening clothes do not fit perfectly. Clothes don't fit? What's the cut of a man's clothes got to do with this? Anyone invited to such a ball as this would naturally have his own tailor. I think, Count Rufrano, if you found a man who had to hire his costume, uh, he might be an imposter and may well prove to be your assassin. <laughs> Well, 
Mr. Holmes, your plan has not been effective so far. We find one Englishman who is unusually badly dressed, and what do we discover? He's an English milord whose luggage was lost on the train. Yes, and the second suspect proved to be a perfectly respectable Viennese doctor whose nasty little child had taken the last minute snip at his tail coat with a pair of scissors. And the third was poor Horvath, the composer, who cannot yet afford a good dress suit, eh? Well, Count Rafano, why not have the next suspect shown in? Yes, of course. Shoba, bring in the next man. Yeah, Herr Count. Come and see Herr Einbitter. Einbitter, what a frightful looking fellow. Your name, please. My name is Groening. What do you wish with me? Groening? Your name was not on the list of invitations. Now one moment, please. Let me see your right hand, Herr Groening. You have no right to touch me. Now where did you get these fresh earth stains? Your right thumb is pitted and the nail is full of dirt. What does that poor policeman... Not a short while ago, you tried to hide your revolver by ramming it into an earth-filled flower pot. Give me that revolver, please, Count Rufano. It will be easy to compare the samples of Earth. It will not be necessary. Well, you, you admit that you murdered the princess tonight, then? Certainly, I admit it. Why did you kill her? She was an aristocrat. She was an oppressor of the poor. I'm glad I killed her. One day, I and my party will kill all of you filthy aristocrats. Count Rapano, put down that revolver. Shoot him like the dark he is. No, 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 Count Rapano. Even you can't take the law into your own hands. Why do you not shoot me? I'm not afraid to die. You haven't taken away, Shoba. Nehmt den Hund ins Gefängnis. Thank you for stopping my hand just now, Doctor. But when he spoke of Stephanie that way, I could have killed him just as he killed her. A very understandable impulse, sir, but uh, one that would have ruined your life. My life? Now that she is dead, my life is empty. What right do love and beauty have to exist in a world that no longer holds Stephanie? She was all light and life. Now, but I am hardly displaying my Viennese blood, am I? The murder is caught, thanks to you, Mr. Holmes, and my life, such as it is, must go on. Somehow, must go on. And that's how the story began, Mr. Bartell. It began? Well, it sounds like the end of a story to me, Doctor. Far from it, my boy. The next day, Holmes and I had our interview with His Imperial Majesty and learned the nature of the services expected of us. Services that required our leaving the city. And that's why, my boy, we were gone from Vienna for some weeks. We didn't know that during our absence, Herr Hovitz Waltz, which had had such a tragic debut, was beginning to make a sort of morbid history. Now, look, Herr Baron, the Horvath Waltz. We have had many requests for it. Gladly, we will play it, Herr Baron. Isn't that the Horvath Waltz they are playing? Yes, my dear, and see who is walking out to the floor to dance to it. Leah Mollenstein, the actress. A beautiful creature. Are you trying to make me jealous, Hans? Captain oh! Himmel, it's Leah Mollenstein! She's been shot! A new ballet. And to the music of the Horvath Waltz. Magnificent. Never has Krasnova danced better. Have you ever seen such exquisite pirouettes? Shoba, all beautiful women and all killed to the music of the Horvath Waltz. There's a homicidal madman at large in Vienna. There's only one thing to be done. We must forbid absolutely the playing of that waltz by imperial decree. We hear all of this, Mr. Bartell, until we return to Vienna. And then, I suppose, Sherlock Holmes was drawn into the case again, Doctor. Yes, my boy. Holmes immediately made a close study of the newspaper reports on the tragedies. And it was with great difficulty that I tore him away from his investigations to attend the reception at which the Emperor was to thank us for our services on the mission that we just completed. As we arrived at the Imperial Palace, almost the first person we ran into was the Hungarian composer, Janusz Hovart. Dr. Watson, 
You have heard of the tragedies connected with my walls? Yes, we have indeed, sir. We have indeed. I was making a close study of the newspaper reports on them just before I came here. You must do something, Mr. Holmes. People will hardly listen to other music. They want my waltz. But that is forbidden. I'm losing a reputation and a fortune while that waltz remains unplayed. Or perhaps, Herr Horvath, you are laying an excellent foundation for a later reputation and fortune. What do you mean? All this publicity, however distasteful to you at the moment, must in the long run prove invaluable. Ah, there you are, my dear Count Rufano. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm, I'm glad to see you back in Vienna. You've heard of the murders? Yes, Count, we were just discussing them. I need your help again, my good friend. For over a month now, the murder has been at large, and I cannot seem to get on the stage. But I'm crooning the first killer. What have you done with him? Released him. What? Released him? Great Scott, why? At the hearing, it was obvious the man was an egomaniac. He boasted of the murder of Stephanie apparently out of pure vanity. The liberal newspaper editors made quite an issue of the case. They brought pressure to bear, and we had to let him go. Confound it. I wish I hadn't left Vienna. Well, if the fellow's at large again, Count Rufrano, it's pretty obvious that he's the murderer of the other women, too. On the contrary, Doctor, he was in prison until yesterday. The last of the murders was committed three days ago. Comes his Imperial Highness Franz Josef. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Your Hi. Highness. Good evening. Your Highness. Well, well, I see we have very distinguished company tonight. Not only the masterful Sherlock Holmes and his colleague, Dr. Watson, our English friends that we are honoring, but I see that we have a distinguished representative from our Hungarian Empire, Janos Horvath. It was a success, I'm told. As a breed of composers for whom Vienna is famous. Your Imperial Highness is most kind. There's a pipe organ in here. It's in excellent condition, I am told. Will you not play as one of your compositions here, Horvath? Well, I shall be most honored, Your Highness. Sit down, gentlemen, sit down. Thank you. What shall I play, Your Imperial Highness? Anything you wish, young man. Anything you wish. Thank you, Your Highness. With your permission, I choose to play... Great heavens, he's playing the death waltz. On your guard, Watson. Even in the Imperial Palace itself, this twirling tune may invoke murder. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, which just gives me time to remind you that if any one wine could be called the perfect wine for almost any occasion that one wine would be Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is not only a fine before-dinner wine, but it's wonderful after dinner, too. And, of course, when you're entertaining or when guests drop in, whether in the afternoon or evening, there's nothing better than a glass of Petri Sherry. And it's comforting to know that you can serve Petri Sherry proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. Dr. Watson, you certainly left me hanging on a cliff that time. You broke off your story just as the Hungarian composer started to play his ill-fated waltz to the Emperor Franz Joseph. What happened? At the time, my boy, fortunately, nothing happened. Herr Hovart completed his composition without apparent incident, and shortly afterwards, we attended a banquet that was given in our honor, a banquet that concluded with a rather curious ceremony at which the Emperor presented Sherlock Holmes with a medal to commemorate his services. Uh, I don't know what anything was. Oh, 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 never mind about that. Finally, it was shortly after 10 o'clock, I remember, Holmes and I, together with Count Rufrano, left the royal chambers and started to descend the spiral staircase leading to the main hall. You were greatly honored tonight, Mr. Holmes. I've only known His Imperial Highness to make three such presentations before, and they were all to my own countrymen. Oh, he might have made another one. He was about no, please, it. Watson, get please, Watson, please. Holmes, huh? The Emperor was most kind. I can't help feeling that he over-evaluated my You're services. You're being though. unusually modest, Holmes. Perhaps because I feel that my visit here is incomplete until I've solved the death waltz murders. I hope you'll be able to stay in Vienna long enough to do that. I confess I am at my wit's end. I've been giving the matter a great deal of thought, Count Rufano. I have a plan for trapping the killer. It's in rather an embryonic stage at the moment, but over a few pipes at the hotel tonight, I expect to develop it thoroughly. I shall call at your office in the morning and explain it to you. I shall be awaiting your visit eagerly. Oh, one more of these murders in the newspaper outcry might become so loud that I should have to resign my post as chief of police. Well, when Horvath made that daring gesture and played the death waltz tonight, it proved one thing. It's not infallible. 
The death of a beautiful woman doesn't always follow the playing of the melody. Very true, Doctor, but... Watson! Uh... Yes, sir? Strike a match, will you? Huh? There's a figure here slumped on the landing. Great Scott, it's the body of a girl. And a very beautiful girl, too. Shot through the forehead. You were wrong, Watson. The death waltz is infallible. But I swear to you that the killer has struck for the last time. Ah, there you are, my dear Counsel Plano. Yes, I followed the instructions you gave me this morning, Mr. Holmes. Chainbaum's is, at the moment, the smartest restaurant in Vienna. I preserved the best table for you, and I've invited the guests that you named. A strangely assorted couple, I must say. Janos Horvath, the composer, and that grinning fellow, the one that admitted shooting your, your fiancé, Counsel Plano. It's as much as I could do to keep my hands off him when he arrived here, Doctor. But Mr. Holmes insisted that I ask him. Just the same, I wish you would tell me his plan. I'm completely in the dark. Completely in the dark. I can sympathize with you, Count Refrano. Holmes never tells me a thing either. Let's join our guests, shall we? In a very few minutes, I'm sure that my uh, plan will be perfectly apparent. Good evening, Herr Horvath. Oh, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. How do you do, Herr Horvath? And how are you tonight, Herr Gruning? Angry at having to come here against my will. My party does not approve of these aristocratic padded pigsties. But Count Refrano informed me that if I did not come here tonight, I could expect to find myself back in prison. How could I resist such a persuasive invitation? Ah, here comes the third guest for our table. I met her at the hotel a few hours ago. Oh, Miss Banks, I'm name? so glad that you were able to come. Hello, Mr. Holmes. I didn't know this was going to be a party, but I couldn't be happier. Allow me to present you, Count Refrano, Dr. Watson, Herr Horvath, Herr Gruning, Miss Barbara Banks from the United States how of America. Do you do, how do you do, uh, Holmes? I wish I knew what you're up to. And how can a young American girl afford to come to Vienna, may I ask? Of course you can ask. My father made a lot of money, and he wanted me to have the advantages he never had. Your father made money because he ground the faces of the poor. Oh, my father never ground a poor face in his life. He was a capitalist. I spit on him. Oh, that's rather unfriendly. And also, geographically speaking, something of a problem. You see, he's living in Wyoming. You make fun of me. <laughs> Only because you made fun of me. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I did as you asked me. I'm very grateful, Miss Banks. The orchestra leader didn't want to play it. He, he seemed scared. But I waved a lot of money in front of him, and I promised to pay the fine as well. Splendid. Great Scott, I see it all now. So do I. You persuaded Miss Banks to bribe the orchestra leader to play. My waltz. My forbidden waltz? Yes, Herr Horvath. I felt that if the request came from a young American, it might seem quite reasonable. Particularly if the requests were accompanied by American talus crowned out of the faces of the poor. You are being unpleasant to me, aren't you? We're playing at your waltz, Herr Horvath. The death waltz. Mr. Holmes, this is against the law. The Horvath waltz is forbidden by imperial decree. True, nonetheless, my dear Count, I implore you not to arrest the orchestra leader until after the waltz is completed. In which case, since I requested it and it's still playing, I'd like a partner. W will you dance with me, Count Refrano? I'm sorry, Miss Banks, but to this melody I shall never dance again. Oh. Well, how about you, Dr. Watson? Oh, I like you very much, my dear, but I'm afraid I'm not as light on my, on my feet as I used to be. In any case, I was never much of a hand at the waltz. See, <laughs> polka's more in my line. Dear oh. me, I'm getting an inferiority complex. Oh, please do not, Miss Banks. You'll observe that the general public seems singularly unwilling to dance, too. Not one couple has ventured onto the floor. Oh, can you blame them? The waltz with Horvath may mean death. How can you blame them? I'm not afraid. After all, Herr Horvath, it's your own music. I'll dance with you. You're most kind, Miss Banks, and courageous. But to be a partner of the only woman on the floor would mean ruin. An admission of failure. My third refusal? I'm a wallflower. No, my dear Miss Banks, the aristocrats, they're afraid. But I, plain, simple Gröning, I will dance with you, Miss Millions. Oh, bless you, Herr Gröning. And I assure you, my father does not grind the faces of the poor. He does grind the faces of the poor, this I Stop know. her, it's suicide. I think not, Herr Horvath. I think so. And I'll not stay here to watch it. Where the devil's he off to? Do not worry, Doctor. I shall keep an eye on him. Yes, and we'll keep an eye on both of them. Come on, Watson. Horvath is, is leaving the room. But as Count Rofrano has deserted his trail and has slipped behind one of those pillars. Good Lord, he, he's drawing a revolver. Exactly, Watson. He's our man. Put down that revolver, Count Rofrano. Put it down, I say. He's turning it on himself. Count Rofrano! I 
still can't believe it, Holmes. Not the fact that Count Frano blew his brains out, but the fact that he was a murderer. Yes, I was slow to believe it too, old chap, and I blame myself in consequence. Two things should have been instantly apparent about the madman who killed beautiful women when he heard the Horvath waltz. Firstly, he must have had some motivation which drove him to such an act. Secondly, he must have carried a revolver with him at all times, since he was invariably armed when the occasion presented itself. Exactly, and that factor made me think of the police official. Then, of course, I saw Rufrano's motivation. He loved the Princess Stephanie dearly. Her death in his arms was a psychological shock that was more than his mentality could stand. And when he heard that music, it reminded him of the dead princess and forced him to kill. That's right, old fellow. You will recall that uh, what he said to us after his fiancée's death, what right do love and beauty have to exist in a world that no longer holds Stephanie? When he heard the music, he couldn't bear to think that other loveliness existed, and so, well, he, he destroyed it. But who killed the Princess Stephanie? The man who was first arrested for it, Herr Grinning. He admitted it. After a little persuasion, when the police arrived, taken back to prison in the carriage that just took Count Frano's body. It's shocking to think that seven innocent women have been murdered before this case is solved. Yes, a fact that will be a constant reproach to me, I assure you. Oh, I didn't mean that, my dear fellow. We weren't even in Vienna when five of the killings took place. Hello, hello. Here comes Miss Banks. Mr. Holmes, what happened to that funny little man who danced with me? Herr Grinning? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he went to prison, Miss Banks. He was a murderer. Well, I must say this is a strange kind of a party you asked me to, Mr. Holmes. One of the guests blows his brains out, and the other, the only man who danced with me, turns out to be a murderer. Oh, I see now why Father sent me to Europe. An evening like this could never happen in Wyoming. Look, look, look. Helvis walking out in, in front of the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen. Shh, shh. Listen. Ladies and gentlemen, I almost thought of it. Wish to assure you, upon the word of the great English detective, Sherlock Holmes, that never again shall my new waltz be an accompaniment for murder. <laughs> Henceforth, its melody will be for life and love and laughter. I have ordered a bottle of the finest cocaine sent to each of your tables. Raise your glasses and pledge me as I now conduct my waltz. Free at last from the kiss of death. Say, Doctor, I, I, I really like that story. That was a baffle. Yes, wasn't it? A highly placed police official is the last person in the world you'd think guilty of murder. I must confess I wasn't of so much to help to, to Holmes in solving that case. Oh, don't let that worry you, Doctor. After all, Holmes almost missed solving it himself. Oh, thank you, my boy. Very nice of you. Thank you, boy. But it certainly was one of the most interesting cases that I was ever connected with. I know what you mean. You know, I, I came across quite an interesting case myself the other day. Oh, you don't say where? Right in my own house. Oh, that's interesting. Well, what kind, uh, kind of case? Sherry. Oh, good gracious me, Sherry. <laughs> that's right, a case of Petri California Sherry. You see, I buy it by the case, Doctor, because that Petri wine is really extraordinary. But all Petri wine is unusual wine, unusually good, because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Because this is so... And because the Petri business has been owned and operated by the Petri family ever since its beginning, and is today the largest independent family-owned wine company in America, naturally the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. Naturally good wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Illustrious Client. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios.
This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. At first, when Herr Gruning confessed to the killing of the Princess von Kran, I didn't believe it. When the other women were killed, I felt sure that Herr Gruning was innocent. I at least suspected Count Refrano of having committed the other murders. But then, that's exactly what Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher wanted, don't you think? The two episodes you have just heard, The Out-of-Date Murder and The Waltz of Death, are part of The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and are a 1988 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Ben Wright. Won't you join me again soon for more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes? Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Golden Radio Hour. The Mysterious Traveler. Another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? You'll find out when we get there. I hope it's not making you nervous being alone with me here in the dark. Darkness stirs strange terrors in some minds. For the things that happen at night are sometimes most upsetting. Things such as cats that vanish or die, as in the tale of The House of Death. Living out in the country this way, Louise. We're so isolated from everyone. Yes, Martha. It was much nicer when we lived in our own house in the village. And even if Roger and Hester are our nephew and niece, we should never have let them persuade us to move out here with them. Mm. Oh, doesn't that wind ever stop blowing? Oh, Martha, Roger and Hester are coming. I, I, I just saw the car turn into the drive. Well, I hope they've brought a maid. What's the matter with Toby and Queenie? Oh, mother's little darling's hungry. Mm. Even Toby and Queenie don't like living here. Yes, they, they do seem unhappy. But Toby hasn't been eating well at all. Oh, Louise is very foolish out living here with Roger and Hester. I think we should move back to our house in the village where we can really be happy. Oh, Martha, could we? I see no reason why we can so much nonsense about our being invalids and too old to live alone. Hello, Aunt Martha. Aunt Louise. Oh, Roger. Were you able to get a maid for it? Oh, I'm sorry about that, Aunt Louise. I tried, but it's just impossible to get a maid these days. But, Roger, you know we need someone to push Louise around in her wheelchair. It's too much for me. Well, I'm sure Hester will do anything you ask. How are you, Aunt Louise? Aunt Martha. I brought you some good hot tea and some biscuits. Thank you, dear. Uh, Roger, uh, Louise and I have been talking things over. Now, it is very kind of Hester and you to invite us to live with you, but we were much happier living in the village and would like to go back to our house. What? But, Aunt Martha, it's much better for you here. Why, of course. You're homesick, that's all. Why, certainly in time you'll come to love this place as we do. Now, we don't want to hear another word about your leaving. 
We couldn't be happy thinking of the two of you living alone in that house in the village. Come along, Roger. Let them drink their tea. Yes, Hester. Well, see you both later. They're really so good to us, Martha. But I, I do wish they'd let us return to our own house. Mm. Tea tastes strange. Hmm? You tried it, Jeff Louise? No. Well, yes, you're right. It, it, it does taste funny. Probably the water yeah, they use. Nothing out here seems as good as it was home. You better not drink any more of it. No, oh, do you remember the little teas we used to give when we lived in the village? Mary Thompson came over every afternoon. It was so nice. Mm, there's no reason why we can't move back to our house and have those teas again. But you heard what Roger and Hester said. Our health isn't so good, and we need someone to look after us. Well, what of it? With all that money Father left us, we can afford a dozen servants. Yes, Louise, I think we'd better plan to return home. The mail car in sight, Louise? No, Martha, not yet. You know, I've been thinking quite a bit these past 24 hours about returning home, and I think we'll leave here in a few days. Oh, Martha, that would be wonderful. Oh, look, here, here comes George Gibson now with the mail. Oh, and that time, too. Yes. Uh, uh, how would that Toby and beautiful Queenie like to go back to their own little home? Oh, Martha, they understand perfectly what you're saying. Look how happy they are. <laughs> Good they do. Oh, and Martha, oh. And Louise. George Gibson just delivered the Sentinel. Oh, Here thank, you are. Thank you, Roger. We've been waiting all day for you. Oh, that's all right, Aunt Louise. Hester will soon bring you your supper. Uh, now, let's see. Yes. Oh, Martha. Let's look at the obituary notices first. That's just what I was turning to, Louise. Ah, uh, here we are. Did anybody we know die? Now, let me see. Oh, yes, yes. yes. You remember Amos Wilson, don't you? Yes. He died two days ago. Poor Amos. He was about your age, wasn't he, Martha? Certainly not. He was a good deal older. <gasps> Martha, look at this. Hmm? Why, it says that Mary Thompson is entering the home for the infirm. The poor house? Oh, no, it can't be. Oh, the dreadful place. I'd sooner be dead than in that home. Poor Mary. Oh, I shudder every time I think of that horrible place. The poor house. Martha, after we move back to the village, can't we have Mary come to live with us? Yes, of course. Going to the poor house would be the death of her. Oh. Huh? Louise, what are you staring at in this paper? No. No, it can't be. What can't be? Read what it says in the real estate column. Hmm? The old Abbott mansion, owned by the Mrs. Martha and Louise Abbott, has been put up for sale by their nephew, Roger Abbott. What? Why, it must be a mistake. We never told Roger to sell our house. I wouldn't dream of it. Why, Martha, it's been in the family for almost a century. How could Roger do such a thing? I'll soon find out. Roger! Roger! Now, Martha, you, you mustn't get excited. But why should he want to sell our house? Are you calling me up, Martha? Yes, Roger. What's this in the Sentinel about our house being for sale? Oh, is it in the Sentinel? Oh, I'm sorry. It is a mistake, isn't it, Roger? No, Aunt Louise. Oh. You see, as co-trustee of Grandfather's estate, I thought it would be a good idea to sell the house. Prices are high these days, and the house is rather old. But you have no right to put the house up for sale without telling me. I won't hear of the house being sold. Now, you mustn't get excited, Aunt Martha. If you don't want the house sold, I'll remove it from the market. Oh, please do. We couldn't live in the house if it was sold, could all we, All right, please? all right. I'll take care of everything. Everything's going to be all right now. <sighs> I don't like it, Louise. I don't like it at all. Why did he try to sell it without telling us? It, it does seem strange. Louise, we must get in touch with Judge Smith. Yes. He's the administrator of Father's estate. And he'll take care of everything for us in the way we want it. It isn't that I don't trust Roger, but you must recall the scrapes he was in when he attended college. His conduct after that was... Then there was the matter of that bad check Roger gave. If it hadn't been for his dear Shh. father, he was... Someone's coming, Martha. I have your socks for you. 
Now, please eat them before they get cold. Yes, Chester. There you are. Just call me if there's anything else you want. Yes, does Mother's beautiful Queenie want something to eat? I don't see Toby any place around. Well, he's probably in the kitchen. Now, say pretty please, Queenie, and Mother give you this nice piece of meat. <laughs> That's Mother's darling. Here you are. Oh, isn't she lovely, Louise? Oh, yes. Queenie has such wonderful manners. Uh, we'd better eat our soup before it gets cold, Martha. Yes. And as I was saying, Louise, I don't care for Roger's attitude at all. Ask me, he's been behaving very strangely. Yes, Martha. Martha. Hmm? Martha, that, that piece of meat you gave Queenie doesn't seem to have agreed with her. She looks ill. Oh, yes, you're right. Oh, Queenie, what's the matter with Mother's little oh, darling? Oh, Martha, she's in agony. Yes. What can we do? Oh, Roger, Roger, come quickly. Oh, poor Queenie. Roger. She's suffering so hard, oh, Mother. Oh, Roger, do something. We must help poor Queenie. Oh, Roger, look. I'm afraid it's too late, Aunt Martha. She's dead. Dead? But she can't be. Oh. She was all right just a few oh. minutes ago. Things like this will happen, Aunt Martha. She was old. She probably had cramps. Roger, you better take Queenie out of here. All right, dear. Poor Queenie. We've had her ever since she was a little kitten. Twelve years now. There, there, Aunt Louise. You mustn't cry. You still have Toby. Now, why don't you eat your supper? You'll feel much better if you do. Yes, sir. How can you speak of food at a time like this? With poor Queenie's body not even cold. I'm sorry, Aunt Martha. If you want me, just call. Oh, Martha, it won't be the same without Queenie. I simply can't understand it. One minute Queenie was perfectly well, then after you gave her the meat, she became ill. Yes, she was perfectly well until she ate the meat. Mm. Louise, the meat, that's it. Don't understand, Martha. The meat, it was poisoned. Poisoned? Louise, that poisoned meat was meant for us. Martha. You don't mean that Roger and Hester... Oh, no. Yes, no. Louise, they're after our money. Oh, what are we going to do? We, we, we can't get at the phone. We have to get in touch with Judge Smith. Oh. Our lives depend upon it. The two old ladies stared at each other, terror in their eyes. The minutes dragged into hours. And each hour was a nightmare as they waited for the time to come when they could make the one contact between themselves and the outside world. Do you see George Gibson's car yet, Martha? No, Louise, but he should be in sight any minute now. Oh, what if Hester or Roger come home before he gets here? Then we won't be able to talk to him about our message to Judge Smith. Now, Louise, you know Roger isn't due home from work for another hour. Yes, yes, but what about Hester? She's over at the Miller's farm, and she's liable to return any minute. Please, I see George Gibson's car. Oh, he's just turning oh, into hurry, the drive. Hurry, hurry, Martha, hurry. Oh, right, hurry. Please, hurry. The window. Oh, Martha, Martha, call to him quick before he gets away. Uh, George? George Gibson? Hello? Who's calling? Uh, look over this way, George. It's Martha Abbott. I want to see you. Oh, it's you, Martha. Howdy, Adam, come in. He's coming, Louise, you hear? Now we'll be able to get in touch with Judge Smith. But after George Gibson left the Abbott sisters, he met Hester a half mile up the road. The two conversed for a minute. Then George Gibson continued on his way. Hester stared after him as he drove away, her face tense and white. Then, as if suddenly understanding the implication of his words, she turned and ran towards her home, her heart pounding with fear. Roger! Roger, I just met George Gibson, and he told me that when he delivered the mail here, Aunt Martha and Aunt Louise called him into the house. Called him into the house? Yes, they asked him to get Judge Smith for them at once. I told you it wasn't safe to leave them alone, even with the phone locked in our room. All our plans may have been for nothing. Oh, Roger, do you think they suspect? I don't know. But I do know it was a mistake letting them talk to George Gibson. After all our careful work, we can't let everything be spoiled now. <laughs> Oh, 
Martha, these past 24 hours have been endless. Where can George be? He's probably delayed somewhere. Oh, Martha, Martha, there. George is coming. He just turned into the drive. I told you he wouldn't fail us. Oh, but Roger and Hester are in the house now. What if they don't let George see us? Nonsense. When George has a message to deliver, he delivers it. I've just, just gone out to get the mail, but... Louise. What is it, Martha? What's wrong? That isn't George Gibson driving the mail car. What? The man driving it's only a youngster. Now oh, he's leaving. Martha, what does it mean? I don't know. I don't understand. Perhaps George is ill and he, he couldn't come today. Hello, I'm Martha Louise. This magazine just came in the mail. Thought you might like to see it. Thank you, Roger. Why didn't George Gibson deliver the mail? Oh, so you noticed there was a new driver today? Yes. I'm sorry to tell you this, but poor George Gibson was killed last night. Killed? Oh, no. He had an accident as he was returning to the village. An accident? Yes. I don't want to speak any more about it. It'll just upset you. Hester will bring you your supper soon. Oh, poor George. That means Judge Smith never got our message. Oh, Martha. Do we, don't you see? It wasn't an accident. But Roger said it was. George it? was deliberately killed to keep him from going to Judge Smith. Oh, Martha, you don't mean that Roger and yes, Hester... Yes, they won't stop at anything to get our money. Oh, Martha, I'm so frightened. Oh, we must have courage or we're lost. Oh, but if we can't get word to the outside and, and they're poisoning our food, well, we haven't eaten a thing since poor Queenie died. We can't go on throwing food away or we'll starve. There's only one thing to do, Louise, if we're not to starve. Toby, must sample our food before we eat it. You mean to see if it's poisoned? Yes. Oh. Oh, I know it's dreadful risking poor Toby's life like that. But it's the only thing to do. And meanwhile, we must get in touch with Judge Smith. We must. You are, Toby, a nice piece of meat for Mother, little darling. Uh, Martha? Why are you feeding Toby? He gets plenty to eat in the kitchen. Of course. I've always fed Toby for my own plate. He expects it. But Aunt Martha, if you feed that meat to the cat, there won't be enough for you. Yes. If you're to get well, you need all that food. Now, I don't want you feeding Toby any more of it. Here, Toby. Come along, boy. Come on out to the kitchen while Aunt Martha and Louise eat their supper. What, Martha? Louise, I've brought you your lunch. Doesn't it look good? Yes, Hester, it's very nice. Lunch, eh? Here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Hester, have you seen Toby? No, Aunt Martha, I haven't. Oh, but where could he be? Toby's always on time for meals. Well, he's probably someplace around the house. Oh. Now eat your lunch before it gets cold. Oh, Martha, where can he be? Toby will be along in a few minutes. We won't touch a bit of this food until he's tried it first. Oh, I do wish he were here. I'm so hungry. Please, don't touch a thing on that tray. It isn't safe. Oh, here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. Good evening, Aunt Martha. Louise, how are you? Good evening, Roger. I have your supper here for you, too. But, Aunt Martha, neither of you ate your lunch. What's wrong? We, we weren't hungry, Hester. Have you found Toby yet? No. I've looked everywhere for him, but he seems to have disappeared. Oh, no. Now, you mustn't worry. I'm sure he'll turn up. Yes. Oh. Aunt Martha, you and Louise can't afford to miss meals in your state of health. Why, certainly not. Now, we want you to eat everything that Hester has brought you. Yes, you'll make us very unhappy if you don't. Now, eat it while it's hot. Come along, Roger. I'll get you your supper. All right, dear. Did you hear what she said about Toby Louise? Yes, he's vanished. Nonsense. They've killed him. You saw how angry they were last night when we fed Toby from our plates. They've killed him so he won't spoil their plans. Oh, Martha, what are we going to do? I'm so hungry. Got to get word to Judge Smith before it's too late. But how? 
tomorrow. I'm going to go out to the road and try to get to the village. But, Martha, it's, it's two miles to the village, and you know you can't walk more than a few yards. You, you're not strong enough. Louise, with either starvation or poisoning staring us in the face, we haven't any choice. I must try to reach the village. <laughs> The next morning, after Roger had left for the village and Hester had gone to the Miller farm, Martha dressed as quickly as her shaking hands would permit. Louise watched nervously as her sister quietly opened the door and started on her long, painful way to the village. Hello, Aunt Louise. Oh, why, where's Aunt Martha? Aunt Martha, um, she's someplace around the house, but I've just been through the house. Why, her closet is open, and her hat and coat are missing. Aunt Louise, did Martha leave this house? Why, uh, oh, why, yes, she, uh, she said she wanted to go for a walk. Go for a walk? At her age and in weather like this? Why, it'll be the death of her. Did she start out toward the village? Answer me. Hey, hey, yes, Hester. I'll phone Roger at his office. She must be stopped. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, as Roger drove along the road leading to his home, he saw a small figure in the distance. It was Aunt Martha. There was a weary, painful look on her face as she hobbled towards the village. In spite of her determined resistance, he put her in his car and drove rapidly on home. One thought was uppermost in his mind. He must make sure that this could never be repeated. Oh, Martha, I'm so hungry. Yes, Louise, I know. So am I. We've gone three days now without eating. We left them our money and our wills. Why must they kill us? Then nothing but common murderers. Oh, if there was only some way to get word to the village. Louise, I've got an idea. What is it, Martha? If we were to set fire to the house, they'd see it in the village. Yes. And then, then the fire company would come out. Then we'd be able to tell them we'd be saved. Oh, oh but Martha, Hester and Roger would put out the fire before it could get big enough. Louise, I know a way we can prevent them from putting out the fire. You do? Yes, and we can save ourselves, Louise. We can save ourselves. <laughs> Here, Toby. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Aunt Martha. Why are you looking down the cellar? You should be in your room. Yes, it's drafty out here in the hall. Now, come on, close the cellar door and go back to your room. But I heard Toby crying. He's down in the cellar, and I won't go to my room until I get but him. But Aunt Martha, Roger, he... just to put Aunt Martha's mind at ease, why don't you go down to the cellar and see if Toby is there? Oh, all right. If you ask me, it's just a waste of time. Oh, please help him look for Toby, Hester. You'll find him so much quicker if you both look for him. Oh, very well. But you go back to your room so you won't catch cold. Roger, do you see him? He doesn't seem to be any place here in the cellar. Oh, now we'll see just how smart you are trying to poison us. There, you won't stop us from escaping now. Oh, I must get Louise. Louise! Louise. Yes, Martha. Oh, Louise, it worked. Martha, you mean you you were able to lock them in the cellar? Yes, and with the door locked, they can't get out. Oh. And Martha, unlock this door. Let us go. Oh, they found out they're locked in. Don't you worry about it, Louise. I'll take care of everything. Oh, Martha. And Martha. Martha, what are you doing with that kerosene lamp? I'm pouring the kerosene around the room so that it'll burn better. Oh. You ready to leave, Louise? Yes, Martha. Then strike a match and start the fire. Oh, oh, how quickly it's starting to spread. Yes, we better leave. I'll push your wheelchair, Louise, and you try to help by rolling the wheels. Yes, Louise. There. Yes, we're coming along nicely. Oh, Martha, I hate to do this. Louise, you mustn't waste any pity on them. Even if they are our niece and nephew, they're nothing but common murderers. Yes, I suppose you're right. Now I'll just open the front door and we'll be free. 
roll the wheels a bit, Louise. Yes, I am. Just a few feet more and we'll be safe. There. 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 Far enough away from the house to be perfectly safe. Oh, my. The whole house is on fire now. Yes. Lovely fire, isn't it? I don't feel cold at all. Oh, do you think they can see it in the village by now, Martha? I'm sure they do. I remember, Louise, when the fire company gets here, we don't know what happened to Roger and Hester. We just managed to get out ourselves. Yes, Martha. If we told them what we were forced to do to escape, we'd have to reveal that our own niece and nephew were poisonous, murderers. We don't want to disgrace the family name, Louise. Oh, no, Martha. Of course not. Oh, oh look, look, Martha, look. The roof is beginning to go. A few minutes later, the fire company arrived to find Martha and Louise in the garden staring at the roaring fire which had been their home. It was too late to save the other occupants of the house, so the men were forced to stand by helplessly and watch it burn. Good morning, Judge Smith. Good morning, Miss Martha, Miss Louise. I trust you're... Well, after that terrible ordeal last night? We're much better, thank you, Judge. Well, now that your niece and nephew are gone, we must plan for your future. Oh, you don't have to bother, Judge. All we want to do is move back to our old house, hire a few servants, and live as we used to. Oh, and I was wondering if you could arrange to have Mary Thompson come live with us. I won't hear of her going to that dreadful home for the infirm. Oh, no, it would be the death of her. Ladies, I'd hoped I'd never have to reveal the truth to you, but now it appears I must. I don't understand, Judge. Last month, the bonds in the trust fund your father left you became utterly worthless. What? Your nephew and niece were afraid the shock of learning you were penniless would kill you. So it was decided to keep the news from you. That's why the three of us persuaded you to move in with them. Your house here in the village had to be sold to meet debts of the estate. <gasps> Father left us so much. It's all worthless now. Perhaps I should have told you this a month ago. But your niece and nephew wouldn't hear of it. In spite of the fact that they had only Roger's salary to live on, they were determined to prevent you from ever learning of your misfortune. But the... The deaths of poor Queenie and Toby. Of, of, of George Gibson. George Gibson? Yes. I'm afraid I don't understand. Surely you heard he was killed a few days ago when a tire on his car blew out and it overturned. You mean he wasn't murdered? Certainly not. Oh. Are you feeling well? Has my news been too much for you? No, no. Well, now that your niece and nephew are gone and there's no one to support you, I'm afraid there's only one thing left. One thing left? What's that? I'm sorry to say... The home for the infirm, the poor house. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? Too bad about the Abbott sisters. Such nice old ladies. But then, how were they to know that poor Queenie died of cramps, not poison? After all, you can't be too careful, can you? Would you care for a sandwich? They're very delicious. I make them myself. Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week. You've just heard Chapter 9 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, 
the House of Death, Irene Hubbard played Martha Abbott and Elizabeth Morgan played Louise Abbott. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Robert Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled The Man Who Knew Too Much. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. I hope it's not making you nervous, being alone with me here in the dark. Darkness stirs strange terrors in some minds, particularly those of children. For children live in a world of their own, a world far removed from that of adults. Who among us knows the psychology of the child mind with its devious thoughts and actions, as in the tale of The Good Die Young? <laughs> Years ago, when I was practicing medicine, I brought a child into the world, a girl who was named Sandra. In the years that followed, she grew into an extremely beautiful and clever child. But my story begins the day that Martha, the housekeeper, was finishing her duties for the last time. Sandra, come in here. I want to see you. Sandra! Were you calling me, Martha? Yes. I told you to come right home after school. Where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry, Martha. I didn't hear you tell me to come home right after school. I'm sorry. Truly, I am. Save your acting for your father, young lady. It hasn't fooled me for a long time. Sandra, since your mother died, you're becoming more and more of a problem every day. Well, at least after tonight, I won't have to put up with your lies and your thousand and one little tricks. What do you mean, Martha? Martha. Your father won't be needing a housekeeper anymore. I'm leaving tonight. But why? Well, I'm not supposed to tell you. But you may as well know now as later. Your father is bringing home a new mother for you tonight. A new mother? Yes. He's just married again. But I don't want a new mother. Daddy and I don't need anyone else. We're happy the way we are. Sandra, stop screaming. I won't have it. Do you hear? I won't have it. Your new mother's a very fine woman. I met her last night. I hate her. I hate her. Daddy's mine and no one else's. She hasn't any right to him. If you don't stop that screaming, I'll tell your father when he comes home tonight. Oh, no, no, no. Don't do that. I, I'll be good. But I hate her and I always will. I'll never stop hating her. That's a fine way to talk. Perhaps I ought to warn the poor woman about Sandra. Well, then it's none of my business. Besides, she'll find out about her soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> Even it's ridiculous you're carrying me across the threshold. All right, darling. It's tradition in my family to carry the bride over the threshold. <laughs> there you are. Oh, oh. oh Stephen, what a lovely house. Mm -hmm. Oh, you haven't seen the best part of it yet. Sandra. Do you think she'll like me, Stephen? I do so want her to. Of course she will. Perhaps you should have told her about us instead of breaking it to her so unexpectedly like oh, this. Oh, nonsense, Helen. I know my daughter. She's a wonderful child. And she'll fall madly in love with you at the first sight, just as her father did. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, where are you? Daddy. Daddy, you're home early. Oh, I'm so glad. How are you, darling? Oh, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I have a surprise for you. A surprise? Mm-hmm. Sandra, this is Helen. Helen, I want you to meet my daughter, Sandra. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Darling, the uh, surprise I just mentioned is Helen. We were married this afternoon. That means that Helen is now your mother. Oh, Daddy, that's wonderful. Now I'll have a mother just like all the other girls do. Oh, I'm so glad. So am I, Sandra. And I'm sure we're all going to be very happy together. Of course we are. That night, after the family had said goodbye to Martha and seen her off, Sandra was sent to bed. She lay quietly in the darkness, thinking. Occasionally, she would speak softly to her doll, Barbara. She hasn't any right being here, Barbara. Daddy and I were perfectly happy until she came along. Tonight, he didn't even notice me. Just kept looking at her. Well, she shan't have him. He's always been mine, and he always will be. Enough of that. Now let me see. Sandra! This is the second time this afternoon I've asked you not to pound the keys that way. That's no way to play. I'm sorry, Mother. Oh, it's not only the piano, dear. There are many other little things. And you pay no attention when I speak to you about them. I don't mean to do them, Mother. I just forget. Well, please try to remember, dear. Now, I want you to play the piano as you did last night for Daddy. He was very pleased. Yes, Mother. Sandra! Yes, Mother? Sandra. I thought I asked you to stop pounding the piano like that. But, Mother, I was just composing a new piece for Daddy. Well, that wasn't music, Sandra, but just noise. That'll be enough for today. Hello, beautiful. How are you, darling? Uh -huh. Well, why wasn't Sandra at the door to meet me? She's all right, isn't she? Oh, of course, dear. Uh, Stephen, hmm? I was a bit angry with Sandra this afternoon. Angry with Sandra? Why, what'd she do? Well, several times this afternoon, I had to speak to her about pounding the piano, being loud and discordant. Huh. Well, that isn't like Sandra. You know how well she plays. Yes, of course. That wasn't the way she played today. Well, I'll go up and see her. All right. Uh, supper will be ready soon. All right, Ellen. Sandra, what's this? <laughs> oh, Daddy, Daddy. Well, what's wrong, dear? You'll never cry. Uh, I was only trying to compose a new piece for your birthday next month. A new piece for my birthday? Yes, I wanted to surprise you. Oh, well, there, there, dear. You mustn't cry. I'm sure Mother understands you didn't mean to be bad. Now, here, let me wipe your tears. Oh, Daddy, I love you so. I just wanted to compose something wonderful for you. I understand, darling. Oh, Daddy, you always understand. Your supper ready to do? Mm-hmm. Where's Sandra? She'll be down in a minute. Helen. Yes, Stephen? She really didn't mean to pound on the piano and get on your nerves. Just she was trying to compose a new piece for me. But, Stephen, it wasn't music. It was just noise. Well, you mustn't be harsh with her. You know what children are like in their enthusiasm. They forget what they're told. But, Stephen... I don't know exactly what to say. It's just a question of being patient with her. Winning her love. 
All right, Stephen. Perhaps I was a bit impatient with her. You know I want nothing more than for the three of us to be happy together. I know that, darling. And the three of us will be happy together. In the weeks that followed, Helen tried to overlook Sandra's slamming of doors, and constant droppings of objects, and other nerve-wracking incidents. In time, she felt, Sandra would come to accept her love and guidance. It was just a matter of patience. Sandra, is that you? Yes, Mother. Please sit down, dear. I want to talk to you. All right, but do hurry. Daddy will be home soon. Sandra, every day I've been giving you milk money for school. Why haven't you been buying milk with that money? But I have been, Mother. Now, please, Sandra, I won't punish you. I just want to know what you've been doing with that money. I've been buying milk with it. Please, Sandra. Mrs. Gordon, your teacher, told me you haven't bought milk for almost a month now. But I have. She just doesn't Sandra, have to... I won't have you lying to me. Now, that's your father. We'll see what he has to say about this. <laughs> you don't understand. You just don't understand. Stephen? Hello, darling. <laughs> oh. Sandra, what are you crying about? I'm sorry, Stephen, but Sandra's been misbehaving. Mm -hmm. I think you'd better speak to her. You just don't understand. What's she done, Helen? <laughs> Mrs. Gordon, her teacher, told me today that for the past month, Sandra hasn't been buying milk with her milk money. Is that true, Sandra? And what's worse, Stephen, when I asked Sandra about it, she lied and said that she had been buying milk at school. Why, Sandra, it isn't like you to lie about things. I didn't mean to lie about it. I just wanted to keep it a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise. Your, your birthday present. Oh? I, I saved my milk money so that I could buy you a pipe. It's here in this box. But Sandra, you know I'd have given you money to buy a birthday present for Daddy. It isn't the same thing. I wanted to buy him a present with my own money. Oh, I'm sorry, Sandra. Oh, you might have told me about it when I asked you. And then it wouldn't have been a real surprise. I did want to surprise Daddy, so... But you have, darling. This is a beautiful pipe. No. The surprise is spoiled. Your birthday isn't until tomorrow. Well, this is much better, darling. It means I'll be able to smoke this pipe tonight. <laughs> oh, now, please stop crying. You go upstairs and wash your face and hands, huh? I'm sorry, Stephen, but I had no idea what she'd done with the money. And she did lie when I asked her about it. Well, if you don't have a little more faith in her, Helen, I know it's difficult to understand her at times, but that's because as a child she looks at things differently. I'm sorry, Stephen, if you think I've failed with her. Oh, but you haven't, Helen. I'm sure that in time she'll come to love you as much as she loves me. I don't know, Stephen. I often wonder about that. As the weeks went by, Helen found herself coming no closer to winning Sandra's confidence. It wasn't that Sandra was unfriendly, but there was an air of reserve about her, which vanished only in her father's presence. Helen felt Stephen watching her anxiously when Sandra was about and sought to reassure him. Her one thought was to preserve their happiness. Hello, Helen. Hello, dear. Oh, what happened to that vase, dear? Sandra broke it. Oh? Well, accidents will happen. Stephen, this is the fourth piece she's broken in two weeks. And each of them were pieces I've treasured and had for years. Well, Helen, you sound as though Sandra deliberately broken those vases because they were yours. Well, why is it that only my things are broken? Oh, Helen, surely you don't believe she's deliberately breaking your things. I don't know what to believe. The first few times I thought it was an accident, but now... But, Helen... Oh, please, Stephen, let's not quarrel... Perhaps I'm wrong. I admit I haven't any proof. It's, it's just all the little things adding up. Helen, what are you talking about? Oh, you wouldn't understand even if I told you. Where's Sandra? In her room, I suppose. Well, I'll go up and see what she's doing. Huh? All right. Sandra, it's Daddy. Are you in your room? Here. Hello, what's this? A note addressed to me. 
Dear Daddy, I'm sorry about the broken vase. Tried my best to be a good girl, but everything I do seems wrong. I make Mother very unhappy, so I'm running away. I love you very much and always will. Your daughter, Sandra. <laughs> After searching vainly for an hour in the dark and cold, Stephen returned and notified the police. All through the long hours of the night, he and Helen sat up, not saying a word, each afraid to speak. The fear of what might be said. As the first rays of dawn showed, the doorbell rang. Stephen rushed to answer it. Mr. Hamilton? Sandra. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. Shh, darling, darling, everything's all right now. I'm the police patron from the 55th Street Station, Mr. Hamilton. One of the officers on the force just found her. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing her home. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Hamilton. It's our job. Goodbye. Goodbye. There, 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 dear. Don't cry. Oh, Daddy, it was so dark out there. And I thought I'd never see you again. What a thing to say. How do you feel, Sandra? <laughs> Do you want me to take her, Stephen, and put her to bed? No, well, I'll do it, Helen. All right, Stephen. Just as you say. Is she all right, Stephen? Mm -hmm. She just fell asleep. I hope her being out all night won't have any after effects. Stephen... You feel I'm to blame for her running away, don't you? Of course not, Helen. It's just that... Well, you, you don't seem to understand her. But, Stephen, I've tried so hard. Oh, it's no use. She doesn't want me here, never has. Helen, how can you talk like that? Why, she was delighted the day I brought you here as my wife. Yes, I thought she was in the beginning. But now I know she was just pretending. Pretending? Yes, Stephen. From the first moment she saw me, she resented me. She feels I've come between you, taken her place in your affection. Oh, Helen, how can you say such it's a thing? It's true, I tell you. She sees me as a rival for your love. You're just imagining all this. I'm not, I tell you. Oh, it's no use, Steve. We can't go on this way. What do you mean? Don't you see? We aren't happy anymore. Instead of things improving, they get worse. Perhaps it would be best if we were to separate. Helen, Helen, I won't hear of it. I love you, darling. I wouldn't want to live without you. Whatever misunderstandings we may have about Sandra, I'm, I'm sure we can straighten them out. I don't know, Stephen. If you love me, Helen, you won't give up so easily. Please, say you won't leave. All right, Stephen. I won't leave. Perhaps we will be able to work this out. I hope so. Sandra? Sandra? You awake, darling? Yes, Daddy. Sandra, Mother and I were very upset when you ran away last night. Mother seems to think you ran away because you, you couldn't get along with her. She felt so badly about it, she wanted to go away. She did? Yes. But I told her how much we both loved and needed her. So she's promised to stay. Oh. I see. Sandra, you will try to be a good girl and do as Mother wants, won't you? It would make Daddy very happy. Oh, Daddy, I'd do anything to make you happy, anything. That's a good girl, darling. Now, you get up and get dressed, huh? I'll wait for you downstairs. All right, Daddy. He just doesn't understand. He should have let her go, but she's still here. And she's going to stay. I won't have it. I won't have it. I hate her. I hate her. A week passed. A week in which Sandra's behavior pleased Helen no end. At last it seemed they were going to be the happy family she had always dreamed they would be. Helen. Yes, dear? Will you bring my coat with you when you come downstairs? Sandra and I are going for a walk. I'll get it and be right down. Daddy, can we walk down to the river? Oh, we won't have enough time for that, Sandra. Stephen? Hmm? I have your coat, but I can't find your scarf. Oh, the scarf's down here, Helen. Just bring the coat. Oh, all right. Stephen, I have... <gasps> Helen! Helen! Helen, are you all right? 
Come on, speak to me. Daddy, is, is she dead? No, Sandra, don't talk like that. Quick, phone Dr. Smith at once. <laughs> I arrived at the Hamilton home to find Helen suffering from shock, but otherwise unhurt. I was somewhat disturbed, however, to find her very nervous and run down. She'll be all right, won't she, Doctor? Yes, of course. I'm going to leave you a prescription, Mrs. Hamilton. It's something that will help quiet your nerves. You ought to take it twice a day. Ah, here's the prescription, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Doctor. I'll have it filled at once. Well, Sandra, how are you? You've been so quiet, I hardly knew you were here. I'm fine, thank you. You're, you're growing up to be quite a young lady. Are you still troubled by nightmares? Yes, she still has them once in a while. No, it's just her nerves. Uh, if she continues to have them, you might give her some of the medicine I've prescribed for your wife. Well, I must be leaving. Goodbye, Mrs. Hamilton, and... Uh, Stay in bed a few days. I and... will, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye, Doctor. Well, darling, you gave us quite a scare. Yes, I... I slipped on something on the top step. Hmm. You must have slipped on the marble, dear. I found seven or eight of them on the top step. Uh, marble? Sandra, were they your marbles? No, Mother. They belong to Margie. She must have left them on the stairs when we were playing here. Oh, I see. It wasn't my fault. Truly, it wasn't. Of course it wasn't, Sandra. Our mother knows you wouldn't leave marbles lying around where she could slip on them. Isn't that so, Ellen? Yes, hey, Stephen. I'm sure Sandra wouldn't want anything to happen to me. Sandra, will you come into Mother's room a moment, please? Yes, Mother. The medicine that Dr. Smith prescribed for me is in the bathroom. Will you get it for me, please? All right, Mother. You'll find it in the medicine chest. It's in a blue bottle. Yes, I know what it looks like. Oh, here it is. That's fine, Sandra. Just bring it to me. Here you are, Mother. Thank you, dear. Oh, Sandra, this isn't the medicine that Dr. Smith prescribed for me. Didn't you read the label? This bottle has poison in it. Poison? Well, yes. It's right here in red letters on the label. Oh, I'm sorry, but this bottle is blue, too. It looks just like the one with your medicine. Yes, it does at that. Now, I'll put this bottle of poison back and get me my medicine. Yes, Mother. I'll have to get rid of that poison. It's too dangerous to keep in the medicine chest. Would have been awful if you took the poison, wouldn't it, Mother? Or you might have died. No, go away. I hate you. Oh, I hate you. He's mine. You shan't have him. He's mine. We don't want darling, you. Darling, we don't darling, want wake you. up, wake up, wake up. You're having a nightmare. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Well, of course oh. I won't, Sandra. Stephen, she's so frightened. Yes, these nightmares leave her nervous for hours. <laughs> darling, there's nothing to cry about now. Oh, Daddy, I was so frightened. Come here, here a moment, will you, please? All right, Ellen. Oh, Daddy, don't leave me. No, 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 I'm not going to leave you. I'm just going to see what Mother wants. <laughs> What is it, Helen? Stephen, hmm? Dr. Smith said that if she had a nightmare, some of the medicine he prescribed for me would help her. Well, Sandra doesn't like taking medicine. But this medicine's very easy to take, and it'll have her asleep in no time. Well, if you think it's best. Yes, I'm sure it is. Now, you go back to Sandra while I get the medicine and a glass. All right, Helen. <laughs> now, Sandra, you must stop your crying. Daddy's here. Don't go away, Daddy. I want you to stay with me. Of course I'll stay with you. What were you dreaming about, dear? I, I don't know. It was all so mixed up. Oh, Daddy, will you always love me more than anybody else in the world? Of course. Now, stop your crying. Daddy. All right, Stephen, I have it. Now, if you just have Sandra sit up. Come on, darling. Sit up now. That's it. What's Mother doing? She's pouring you some medicine. It'll help you sleep, darling. Medicine? Yes. It's the same medicine Mother takes for her own nurse. No! No, I don't want it! Now, please, Sandra. It'll make you feel much better. No, don't come near me. I don't want but it. Sandra, Mother takes it twice a day. There's nothing to no, it. No, I won't take it. I won't! Well, perhaps you'd better let it go, haven't you? Nonsense, Stephen. She'll have us up all night if she doesn't take it. 
Now, Sandra, stop being a baby and take this medicine. No, Daddy, don't let her make me take it. Don't let her. Sandra, <laughs> are you going to let me give you this quietly, or do I have to make you take it? No, no, it'll kill me. I know it will. Here, let me hold your head. That's it. No. Now, Sandra, stop clenching your teeth. Open your mouth. Do you hear? Daddy, don't let her. <laughs> there, you've taken it. All this fuss over nothing. Helen. She's talking. Daddy! Daddy, it burns! Sandra, what's wrong? It's burning me! Daddy, help me! Help me! I can't breathe! Helen, quick! Call Dr. Smith. Tell him it's an emergency. Stephen, here's Dr. Smith. Let me see her. She's been unconscious for ten minutes now. Doctor, you must do something. I'm afraid it's too late, Mr. Hamilton. She's dead. Oh, no. No, she can't be. I'm sorry. But how can she be? We only gave her the medicine you prescribed for Helen. Yes, here it is. Let me see it. But this medicine wouldn't kill her. It's only a nerve tonic. You can see... Doctor, what is it? Why, this is the bottle, all right. But the medicine in it isn't the medicine I prescribed. But it is. I took some of it last night. I assure you, this isn't the medicine I prescribed. Then what is in that bottle? It smells like carbolic acid. Carbolic acid? But that's impossible. Look at the label. You can see it's my medicine. Yes, the label's right, but someone poured out the medicine I prescribed and replaced it with carbolic acid. Oh, no. But why? Why should anyone want to do such a thing? Who could possibly want to kill Sandra? Everyone loved her. Ask Helen. She'll tell you that Sandra... Stephen, why are you looking at me like that? Surely you don't believe I poisoned her. Stephen. No. No. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? Oh, by the way... Do you have a child in your home? If so, I do trust it isn't angry with you. You can't be too careful with children. Why, I recall another child who, after being punished by his parents, took a razor and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week at the same time. You've just heard Chapter 13 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Good Die Young, Betty Jane Tyler played Sandra. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Design for Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. driving along a narrow road through the woods. At a point where a second road, even narrower, crosses the first, the car stops. Here you are, young fella. This is the professor's place. Oh, is it? All I can see is woods. Uh, it's up that road, about 50 yards. Look sharp and you can see the light shining between them two trees. Huh? Oh, yes, I see it now. 
Then I guess I get out here. Uh, Would you hand me my bag, Sheriff Ramsey? All right. Here you are. Thanks. And that's a dollar I owe you, right? Yep. Thank you. You know the professor, do you? Yes. I was Professor Clark's laboratory assistant back in college ten years ago. Oh. Why? I was thinking maybe... Maybe you could drop a hint to him. A hint? What kind of a hint? Well, that there's been some talk in town of running him and that man of his, that Barton, fell out of the county. Running Professor Clark? Oh, you're not serious. Yep. Of course, it's just talk. So far. But, but what has anybody got against Professor Clark? There isn't a milder man in the world. Well, maybe so, but folks has got wind of what happened at the state penitentiary over in Hillvale last year. Sure, if you're talking in riddles. What did happen? The professor went over there when they hanged Richard, that hauled-up killer. Uh Uh-huh. And the warden gave the professor the murderer's brain. That's what happened. What of it? Professor Clark is a great authority on nerve and brain tissues. Maybe he wanted it for research purposes. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just telling you how folks are talking. They think he's keeping that brain in a big glass jar and making it grow. It's perfectly ridiculous. Well, they don't think so. They got the notion that brain is as big as a bull calf by now. And they're afraid someday it'll escape. <laughs> sure, for a minute I was taking you seriously. A brain as big as a calf? Oh, I'm not saying I ever believed it, but it'd be a good idea if the professor would give folks a notion of what he's really doing in that laboratory of his with that Barton fella to help him. Then maybe the talk would die down. I understand. All right, Sheriff, I'll mention it to him. Well, then I'll be getting on. Good night, young fella. Good night, Sheriff. Right up that road, about 50 yards. You can't miss it. A few moments later, Dr. Richard Dale was knocking on the door of an old stone house almost hidden among the trees. A frail, white-haired old man answered the door. An old man who could hardly speak in his joy as he gripped Richard Dale's hand. He led the way down a long hall to a great room where strange equipment took up almost every inch of space. Retorts and electric furnaces, generators, batteries, and great glass vats. Dr. Dale stared around him in intense curiosity as Professor Clark helped him off with his hat and coat. There. Now, sit down, Dick, my boy. Sit down and let me get a good look at you. Ah, so, you got my letter? Oh, yes, yes, of course you did, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, thanks, Professor. Yes, I got your letter. And it made me so curious I took the first train. You promised me a surprise. Well, is this it, this amazing laboratory? <laughs> no, no, my boy. I'll come to that in a moment after you've met Barton, my assistant. Barton? I, I don't seem to know the name. Should I? No, he's not famous yet. But he will be. He's been with me only a few months. But I couldn't get along without him. He certainly sounds interesting. Yeah, you'll like him, I'm sure you will. Oh, uh, Barton... Yes, Professor? And Dr. Dale has arrived. I want you to meet him. Why, of course. How do you do, Dr. Dale? We both of us been looking forward to your visit. Uh, how do you do? Yes, the professor's letter made me so curious I couldn't stay away. I'm still wondering what the great surprise is he promised uh, me. You'll see, Dick, in just a minute. My curiosity's at fever pitch. Well, it's time to satisfy it. Uh, Barton, is Alpha making some coffee? Yes, he started it when we heard the car. Alpha? Who is he? Our general man of all work. Truly amazing fellow. <laughs> ah, here he comes now. Shall Alpha serve coffee? Good heavens. I said you'd be surprised, Dick. He's not human. He's a machine. A robot. Yes, my boy. An artificial man made from metal and synthetic brain tissue. A machine man. Walking and talking. He's not very pretty, but then the professor was mostly interested in making sure he'd work. He must weigh a ton. No, only about 300 pounds. You see, Alpha's mostly aluminum and other light alloys. 
Inside is aluminum plates or some new batteries I devised, together with miles of fine silver wire and a dozen electric motors. And to give you only the highlights... It's a good thing you did keep this for a surprise. If you'd mentioned it in your letter, I, I don't think I would have believed you. Shall Alpha serve coffee now? Yes, Alpha. Put it on this table here and pour a cup for Dr. Dale. Alpha, do so. Still can't make myself believe it. Alpha poured coffee. Go on, Dick. Drink it. Huh? Oh, oh, oh yes, of course. Uh, Al, thank uh, you. Alpha, this is Dr. Dale, our guest. Any orders he gives are to be obeyed. Alpha understands. He looks clumsy, but but he poured the coffee as well as a man could. Yes, my boy, Alpha has capabilities you'd never suspect to look at him. Here, here I'll show you. Alpha. Alpha hears. The fireplace needs more wood. Put on that big log there. Alpha, do it. Alpha has log. Now, break it in half. Alpha, break it. Six inch log, and he's breaking it with his hand. anymore tonight, Alpha. You can go back to your room now. Alpha is going. Be sure to switch off your batteries. They're going to need recharging tomorrow. Alpha understands. That's the most incredible thing I ever saw. You see, Dick, I try to treat Alpha as if he were really a man. So I give him a room of his own. Like any machine, he's completely inactive when his batteries have been switched off. But his brain continues to function. It's an artificial protoplasm that I spend eight years creating. It's the only thing that makes him different from any other machine. But it means Alpha can think. Think like a man. A machine that can walk and talk and think. Ah, but Alpha's not the only surprise I have for you, Dick. He's not? No, I have another one. Even more astonishing. Uh, but you'll have to wait until morning to learn about that. Because now it's time we were both in bed. I suppose you're right. It's after one. I know you must be tired. I'm getting old. So I'm going up to bed now, Dick. Uh, Barton will show you to your room. Of course, Professor. I'll see you in the morning, then. Yes. We'll have a long talk tomorrow. Good night. Good night, Professor Clark. Oh, uh, Dr. Dale. Uh, yes, Barton? Could we talk for a minute before I show you to your room? Oh, yes, of course. It occurs to me the professor forgot to tell you why he asked you here. Oh, yes, that's true. And I've been so interested I forgot to ask. It was his hope that you'd stay indefinitely and help us carry forward the work we've been doing here. Stay indefinitely? Well, I have my own work Don't and I... say no yet. Now, just think, Dr. Dale... Alpha is stronger and more rugged than a man. He needs no rest, no food. Yet he can do the work of three men. He can plow, reap, run machinery. Think how much drudgery a million like him could lift from mankind's shoulders. Yes, 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 that's true. And already Alpha is technically obsolete. Professor Clark has the blueprints for a new machine man. As superior to Alpha as, as an airplane is to a bicycle. We want you to help us build them. Well, I'm certainly tempted. Perhaps I could arrange. Ah, excellent. And uh, now there's only one more thing I want to tell you. Yes? What is it? It's about Alpha. You must help me persuade the professor to... to dismantle him. Dismantle him? Yes. Why? He has become dangerous. Uh, I, I don't understand. Because he was the first successful machine man that the professor built. He is imperfect in many ways. He's not completely reliable. I'm afraid that someday he may escape from the house and so do some damage that would seriously upset our plans. Yes, yes, that could easily happen. The local inhabitants are unfriendly enough as it I, is. I know. Sheriff Ramsey was warning me about that tonight. 
All right, I'll speak to Professor Clark about it tomorrow. Ah, good. Then I'll show you to your room now, if you wish. <laughs> yes. I am sleepy if you'll just come this way. His mind in a whirl of amazement, Dr. Dale retired and finally fell into an uneasy sleep. How long he had slept, he did not know. When abruptly he woke with a scream ringing in his ears. Help! Dick! Help! Rick! The cry came from downstairs. Dr. Dale leaped from his bed and raced down to the lower floor. Dick! Help! Help me! Help! In the lower hall, he found Barton hammering on the heavy door of the laboratory. Professor Clark! Professor Clark, what's wrong? What? What's happened? It's the professor. I heard him call for help. Huh. Yes, so did I. It woke the me up. The door's locked. He must be in there, but there's no sound in there now. Well, we've got to break the door down. Yes. Put your shoulder beside mine. Right. You ready? Ready. And shut. Sure. <coughs> there! Professor Clark, where are you? Professor Clark. He's not here. Yes. Here he is, lying on the floor beside the window. He's been murdered. It was Alpha. It must have been. No one else could have done it. But where is Al? The window. It's open. He went out that day. Well, we've got to go after him. I'm afraid it's hopeless. At night in these woods, we couldn't possibly find him. No, no, you're right. It'll of be course. morning soon. Then I think he'll come back. He knows that he can only go a few more hours before his batteries must be recharged. Then we can capture him and destroy him. But, Barton, why did he kill the man who created him? The professor must have come down to the laboratory for some reason. Occasionally, when he couldn't sleep, he would do that. He may have decided to make some more tests of Alpha. Yes, but that doesn't explain During why... During the test, something must have occurred. When Alpha returns, we can find out. Poor Professor Clark. Well, we'll have to notify the police. There's only the sheriff. In any case, I think we should wait till morning and then report the professor's death as, uh, as an accident. An accident? Yes. If the authorities learn the truth, our research may be stopped. And when Professor Clark has achieved so much, can we let it go for nothing? No, no, of course not. Dr. Dale, we must carry on his work for him. Yes, that's what he would want. Then you will help me continue it? You'll stay? Yes. Yes, I'll stay. Greatly upset by the tragedy, Dr. Dale returned to bed and at last fell into an uneasy sleep haunted by dreams of Alpha, the metal monster Professor Clark had created. When he awoke, the sun was shining, and he could hear Barton moving about downstairs. He dressed and went down to find Barton getting breakfast ready. Oh, good morning, Dr. Dale. Good morning, Barton. Any sign of Alpha? Not yet. Well, we ought to start a search for him. But first, I think you ought to eat breakfast. Everything's ready. Well, all right. Some coffee, anyway. Yes. Sit here. Thank you. I didn't know you were a cook as well as a lab assistant, Barton. I've uh, learned to do a lot of things since I came here. Uh, aren't you going to eat, too? I, I'm not hungry. I seldom am. But I thought that while you ate, I might outline some of the problems facing us. That's a good idea. You see, though Alpha's brain is a synthetic protoplasm... It is not completely artificial. I was wondering about that. Sheriff Ramsey mentioned that the professor had secured a human brain from... From an executed killer, yes. The professor found that to give life to his artificial brain tissue, it was necessary to add a small amount of tissue from a real brain. I see. That the real tissue gave life to the rest. Of course. Yes, but in this instance, it may have tainted Alpha's brain with the murderous impulse of a killer. Yes, that sounds plausible. So our first problem will be to obtain untainted brain tissues to blend with the artificial tissues we will make according to the professor's formula. That should give us no trouble. I can get what we need through the research laboratories where I'm connected. Ah, then that solves our worst problem. The rest will be matters of detail. Fortunately, there's enough equipment here to build a dozen or so robots. Like Alpha, you mean? No. The far more advanced type Professor Clark was perfecting. And now, if you've finished... I have something to show you. Yes, I'm through. I don't feel much like eating after last night. Then come with me to the laboratory, and I'll show you the second surprise that Professor Clark had in store for you. Ah, here we are. Now, 
what I'm going to show you is in this box. Uh, another robot? Yes. A second mechanical man the professor built a few months ago. This one, though, was a failure. You mean it wouldn't work? It worked too well. well I don't follow. It you. was too intelligent. Professor Clark called it Beta. And Beta's brain power was greater than that of any human scientist who ever lived. But Beta was insane. Good Lord. He represented, however, a tremendous technical advance. Look. It looks exactly like a human being. Yes. Professor Clark used me for a model when he built Beta. It's an excellent likeness. Uh, touch the face, Doctor. Oh, all right. It feels smooth and rubbery with a hard surface underneath. The surface is a new plastic Professor Clark developed with which he could imitate exactly the appearance of human skin. Underneath is an aluminum body on which the plastic was baked. I see. Beta's hair, eyes, and teeth are all artificial, too. But he walked and talked and acted so much like a human being that no man alive could have guessed his secret. No, he would have fooled me completely. And you say he was insane? From, from the human viewpoint, yes. He considered himself superior to the human race. With his enormous brain power, he intended to make himself ruler of the world. You were joking. Not in the least. That was why Professor Clark destroyed him just in time. He had made plans to take over this laboratory and construct dozens of mechanical men like himself. And then, with their help, he was going to enslave all mankind. Barton, if that could happen once, it might happen again. I don't believe we should continue Professor Clark's work after all. Oh, there's no danger now, Doctor. You see, Beta also had a brain which contained tissues taken from that of the condemned murderer. But we will select the brain tissues from the highest types that are available. Yes, but even so, then, you... Doctor, we will produce mechanical men, tireless, indestructible, who will be mankind's willing servants, who will solve for man problems he can't solve for himself. I wonder. In any case, we must proceed with the utmost caution. Of course. Doctor, listen. Someone's coming to the house. It's Alpha. He's come back. Alpha. We may need a weapon, Barton. No, I can control him. Alpha. Alpha, come here. Alpha comes. Alpha, you killed Professor Clark. Why did you do it? Professor said he would destroy Alpha. And you killed him because of that? Alpha does not want to be destroyed. But, but you're just a machine. What difference does it make to you? Alpha is machine that lives. Alpha is stronger than you. Alpha is better than you. Alpha, be quiet. We must destroy Alpha at once. You are right, Doctor. Do you hear, Alpha? You are to be punished. Alpha here. But first, we want to know where you've been. Did anyone see you? Men saw Alpha. Men saw you? What do you mean? Two men driving automobiles saw him. And what did they do? They tried to hit Alpha with automobile. And then what happened? Alpha stopped automobile. Alpha killed one man. Killed him? Other man ran off in woods. Alpha could not find him. Alpha came back. We can't keep this a secret. No matter what happens, we must notify the authorities at once. No, wait. Let me think. We can't... The bell. There's someone at the door. I'll see who it is. You stay here. But what about Alpha? I'll switch off his batteries, then he can't move. There. Now I'll see who's at the door. Dr. Dale waited while Barton went to the door. He heard the door open and recognized the excited voice of Sheriff Ramsey speaking. Then a moment later, Barton came back into the laboratory, followed by the sheriff, who held a revolver in his hand. But, Sheriff, if you'd only let me explain... Never mind that. You're coming with me, both of you. Uh, Dr. Dale, perhaps you can reason with the sheriff. He insists that we're under arrest. Yes, and I'm taking you to the lockup. The professor, too. Where is he? Professor Clark is dead, Sheriff. Dead? He was killed last night when an experiment he was engaged in went wrong. An experiment, huh? I suppose it was an experiment that crushed the life out of him. 
You crushed the life out of Jed Thompson an hour ago down the road and scared Fred Jennings so bad, all he can do is jabber about monsters. It's true. The things that killed both the professor and Thompson is an experiment. It's standing there behind Behind? <gasps> a machine. A man made out of machinery. Well, don't be alarmed, Sheriff. It's perfectly harmless now. It is a machine man which Professor Clark built. Unfortunately, it got out of control. I don't believe it. I don't blame you, Sheriff, but that's the truth. I think I can convince you. What are you doing? Stand still. I'm I... simply going to switch Alpha on. There. Now he can move and speak as well as you and me. That thing talk? You're lying. You're up to something. Alpha, will you tell the Sheriff that it was you who killed Mr. Thompson? Alpha <gasps> killed him. He tried to hit Alpha with car. So that's what the professor was up to all this time. Building that thing. Now, Sheriff, surely you realize that we are not murderers. Maybe not, but you'll come to jail just the same. You're partly responsible anyhow. But, Sheriff, we... Anyway, it's for your own protection. There's a mob on its way out here from town. They're going to burn this place down. What? i got to put you in jail for your own safety. They're ready to lynch you right now. Burn the place down? That's what I said. So turn that machine thing off and come along. We ain't got much time. No. All this equipment, machinery, the professor's notes, they must not be destroyed. We must stop them. Yes, Sheriff. The lost of science. Never mind science. You've got your own skins to worry about. That mob means business. Let's get started. I'm afraid we can't do that, Sheriff. You can't. i got a six-shooter here that says different. We have no choice, Martin. Oh, yes, we have. Alpha, take the gun away from this man. What are you doing? Stop him! Stop him, or I... Oh, 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 oh. Too late, Dr. Dale. He's dead. Alpha crushed him? Yes, Dr. Dale. Now, you're a murderer. In a good cause. The life of one man or of a dozen men cannot stand in my way. You don't expect me to keep silent about this, do I you? I think you will. Alpha. Alpha. He doesn't answer. His batteries have gone dead. That last burst of energy must have drained them dry. But it makes no difference. I think it does. A big difference. There, see this? It's Sheriff Ramsey's revolver with three bullets still in it. Now put your hands up. I must explain something to you, Doctor. You can talk, but if you move, I'll shoot. I only want to say that nothing is going to interfere with my plan to build more of the improved form of robots that Professor Clark perfected before his death. Robots who look and act so much like men, no one can detect them. They'll never be built. I intend to destroy all of Professor Clark's notes. They will be built by me. I shall build ten, a hundred, a thousand... Then I shall lead them with a superior intelligence to the mastery of the world. You're mad. Of course I should have... No, Doctor, that's not the answer. I shall tell you the truth. And then you must die. Stand still or I'll shoot. You remember last night when the professor said he had another surprise for you? An even greater surprise than Alpha? Yes. That surprise, Doctor, was Beta, the second robot. So perfect it looked like a man but so intelligent that human beings were as children in comparison. But Beta was destroyed. No, Dr. Beta was not destroyed. But you must be destroyed. Stand back. Stand back, I say. All right, then I'll shoot. And now, Doctor, your bullets are gone. You, you aren't even hurt. Bullets cannot harm me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Beta, the second robot was not destroyed. But I saw him. What you saw was only an initial attempt that failed. The real beta still exists. You see, Dr. Dale, I am beta. You? Yes. I, too, am a mechanical man. And now, you must die. No. No, stay away from me. Stay away! <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. What happened to Dr. Dale? Why, he's still alive, but of course under observation in a hospital. In fact, it was he who told me the story. You see, the mob that was coming to burn down the house arrived just in time to save him. But Barton, or Beta as he called himself, escaped. He could hardly have survived all those bullets if he had been human, could he? 
But I wonder if the story is true. Do you suppose that somewhere, a strange individual who is really a robot is making other mechanical men preparing to carry out Barton's plan to rule the world? Oh, you haven't time to talk about it now you're getting off here. Well, I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard Chapter 19 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's story, Beware of Tomorrow, Will Hare played Dr. Dale and Don Randolph played Barton. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled The Accusing Corpse. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented over WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? We're going to journey to the grave and learn the secrets of the dead in a tale titled... The Accusing Corpse. Some years ago, when I was a county coroner, I was called in on a most interesting case. A case which had begun in the country home of Philip Drake, the wealthy stockbroker. Roger, thank goodness you were able to get here in time. I left town right after I received your call. What's wrong, Philip? You sounded so upset over the phone. It's Vivian. She's upstairs in her room packing. She says she's leaving me. Leaving you? Why? She seems to feel our marriage has been a mistake. Roger, won't you speak to her? Persuade her to stay. After all, she is your sister. I'm afraid, Philip, that Vivian and I have never been as close as sister and brother should be. She's always been wild and spoiled. Perhaps, Philip, it would be better if... If you were to let her go. No, I couldn't do that. I love her, Roger. I wouldn't want to live without her. Won't you please try to persuade her to stay? All right, Philip. I'll do my best. But I must warn you, I haven't much influence well, over her. Philip, I'm all packed and ready to... Why, Roger, darling, what a surprise. What are you doing here? Vivian, Philip has told me. Now, surely you can't be serious... You know how he loves you, everything he's done to make you happy. Now, uh, Roger, you aren't going to start on that, are you? Someday, Vivian, you'll get just what you deserve for walking over people, breaking their hearts. Every time I think of you being my sister, I feel Roger, like I... please. Would you mind waiting in the other room? I'd like to speak to Vivian alone. Oh, all right, Philip. Call me when you want me. <sighs> really, Philip, no matter what you have to say, you're just wasting your time. Oh, Vivian, how can you do this to me? You know I love you, that I'd do anything to make you happy. That's sweet of you, dear. 
Would you mind lending me your car to get to town? If you leave me, Vivian, you won't get a cent. Not the cent, do you hear? Really? Did you ever stop to think, Philip, that there might be another man huh? with more money than you? Another man? Oh, no, there couldn't be. And why not? But we've only been married three months. There, there couldn't be anyone in that time. Oh, but there was. Oh, Vivian, in spite of what you've done, I'm willing to forgive you and start over with you. <laughs> but, darling, I don't want you to forgive me. I want you to forget me. Vivian, you can't do this to me. I love you. I won't let you go. I really must be saying goodbye now. He's waiting for me in town, and I don't want to be late. If I can't have you, no one else will, do you hear? Oh, really, Philip, you're being ridiculous. I must go. No. Philip, what are you doing? A gun. Yes, Vivian, a gun. I told you if I couldn't have you, no one else would. Oh, Philip, you're insane. Put that gun down. If you don't change your mind about leaving, I'll kill you. Even with that gun, you can't keep me, do you hear? I'd sooner die than go on living with you. I'm going, and you're not going to stop <laughs> You... You shot... Vivian. Philip. Philip, Philip, what happened? I, I thought I heard... Vivian. Roger. Is she... dead? Yes. Philip, do you, do you know what this may mean? Life imprisonment, perhaps. E even the electric chair. I know. Nothing seems to matter now. But, but you simply can't throw your life away like that, Philip. Oh, even if Vivian was my sister, I don't mind telling you that I always felt you were far too good for her. She didn't deserve to be your wife. Oh, please, Roger. Now, look, Philip. If, if we were to get rid of the body, who could possibly know that she didn't leave here tonight as she'd planned? Oh, no, it wouldn't work, Roger. You can get away with murder. That's nonsense, Philip. Now, now if we were to bury her in the woods, no one would ever find the body. Bury her in the woods? I couldn't do that. Then I'll do it. You can wait here till I return. But, Roger, what if, Philip, you must let me handle this. You... You'd better give me the gun. All right, Roger. You are. Good. Now, now you wait here while I get rid of the body. Philip watched, spellbound, unable to say a word, as Roger picked up the body and left the room. As Roger, carrying his burden past the gardener's shed, he picked up a shovel. In a few moments, he reached the woods which began at the rear of the house and extended for miles. He carefully made his way through the forest underbrush until he was well out of sight of the house. Then he stopped and looked about. Uh, I, I think this is quite far enough. I think you can put me down now, Roger. I'm tired of being carried like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, let me congratulate you on your performance as a corpse. <laughs> Do you think he suspects anything? <laughs> of course he doesn't. He's positive that he shot and killed you. You've got the gun, haven't you? Well, certainly I've got it. You don't think I was going to let him discover that the bullets had been removed and blank cartridges substituted, do you? Oh, no. Not you, Roger. You always know what you're doing. I always try to, my dear sister. You don't think Philip will give you any trouble, do you? Outside of being in love with me, he isn't an utter fool. <laughs> don't worry, I can handle Philip. Now, uh, here's the key to the apartment I rented in town. You'll find my car a quarter of a mile down the road. All right. I'll be waiting for you at the apartment. I'll be there in a few hours. Hmm, now, now, let me see. Yes. Yes, this seems like a nice place to dig. <laughs> The next morning, Roger called on Philip at his office. With a calculating glance, he noted that Philip's eyes were bloodshot, that his hand trembled as the two shook hands. How are you, Philip? I couldn't sleep at all last night. I kept thinking of Vivian. And what if her disappearance is noticed? People begin asking questions. Now, all you have to do is tell them that Vivian left you and, and you don't know where she is. Or things like that happen every day. You've been very helpful to me, Roger. If ever I get a chance to repay you for it, rest assured, I will. That's very good of you, Philip. Uh, truth of the matter is, you, uh, you could do me a favor, if you would. Of course. What is it? Well, I'm in the midst of a business deal, and I find myself a little short of capital. If you could lend me some money, I'd appreciate it. Oh, certainly, Roger. How much do you need? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand? That's quite a lot. 
Naturally, Philip, if you feel you can't lend it to me, I'll go to a bank and try to borrow it. Oh, it isn't that I can't lend it to you, Roger. It's just that the amount surprised me. Uh, Shall I make the check out to you? Uh, Yes, if you please. All right. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, Philip. As Philip wrote out a check for $20,000, Roger smiled. Things were working out just as he had planned. An hour later, Roger entered an old brownstone house and went to apartment 2C. Roger, did you get it? (laughs) What does this look like? Oh, Roger, that's wonderful. Now we can clear out and... Why, there isn't 100,000 here. (laughs) No, my dear. I only got 20,000 from him. But we were after 100,000. Why didn't you get it all this morning when you saw him? My dear Vivian, it simply isn't done that way. Uh, Blackmail is an art. An art that calls for the use of psychology. Philip will give us many times over the money I hold in my hand. All in due time, of course. You mean I'll have to go on hiding in this miserable apartment until you've finished your little game with him? Never being able to leave it for fear someone will recognize it. Come, come now, Vivian. You've got the radio and books I and won't other... spend weeks in this apartment, I tell you. I won't... My arm! You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. Exactly, do you understand? Roger, my arm, you're hurting it's me. It's nothing to what I'll do if you disobey me. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes! A week passed. A week in which Roger patiently bided his time. For time, he knew, was working on his side against Philip. Then one morning, he called on Philip at his office. Good morning, Philip. How are you? How do you expect me to be? This past week, I've been able to think of nothing but Vivian and what happened that night. Philip, you must stop brooding over it. Whatever happened was her fault, not yours. Yes, you're right. Perhaps what I need is a vacation. Yes, yes, of course. A trip would do you a world of good. And if I could afford it, I'd go along with you. You mean you haven't any money? I'm, I'm afraid not, Philip. That's what I've come to see you about. I must have $40,000 at once. 40000 Yes, I, I know it's a good deal of money, Philip, but without it, I'll be ruined. Well, naturally, I want to help you, Roger, but 40000 If I don't get the 40000 Philip, it may mean prison for me. Now, you wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? Well, of course not, Roger, but... After all, Philip, I I saved you from prison. In fact, I made myself an accomplice to Vivian's murder by not turning you over to the police. Well, yes, I know, but... you, you could hardly expect me to remain loyal to you if you weren't willing to help me, could you? I see. It seems I haven't any choice. Very well, Roger. I'll write you out a check. Roger's eyes gleamed in amusement as he accepted the check from Philip. There was no longer any doubt that Philip understood him perfectly. Things were working out exactly as he had planned. Later that day, Roger went back to the old brownstone house. There was a smile on his lips as he entered apartment 2C. <laughs> Look at this. $40,000 in cash. Oh, Roger. Now, wasn't this worth staying in hiding for, Vivian? And there's plenty more where this came from. Who could that be? You better get behind that screen. No. Oh, all right, Roger. Uh, yes? C.O.D. for Miss Brown. It amounts to $64. Oh, uh, you must be mistaken. There's no Miss Brown here. This is the address she gave. It's in care of Mr. Roger Martinson. Is that your name? Why, why yes, but I don't know uh, any... Those packages are for me, Roger. Uh, how much did you say the COD was? $64, miss. Oh. Here you are. Thank you, miss. Here's your receipt. Goodbye. Goodbye. When did you buy those clothes? This morning. You mean you went out shopping in spite of what I told you? Well, I was sick of being cooped up in this apartment day and night. I had to do something for a change. And what of my plans? You risk everything with so much at stake. Roger, stop looking at me like that. I tell you, I couldn't stand being cooped up in this apartment any longer. But I give you orders to stay here. Well, I won't. I want you to get the rest of the money at once so we can clear out. And if you don't, I'll go shopping whenever I feel like it. You can't make me stay here. (gasps) 
You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. I won't allow anything or anyone to interfere with my plans. I've worked out every step perfectly, and there isn't going to be any slip-up. <laughs> Another week passed, a week in which Roger made no effort to see Philip. Then early one evening, he got into his car and drove out of the city to Philip's home in the country. Oh, it's you, Roger. Come in. Good evening, Philip. Oh, uh, where are the servants? This is their night off. Oh. Uh, you're, uh, you're not looking well at all, Philip. You, you shouldn't remain in this house by yourself. What difference does it make where I am? Wherever I go, the memory of that night follows. It's hard to believe that it was only two weeks ago tonight that I killed her. Two weeks ago tonight? Well, so it was. Oh, well, uh, oh, by the way, Philip, do you think you might possibly lend me $60,000? 60000 huh? $60, You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. But I lent you that much already. Yes, I know, but I must have more. No. I won't give you another cent. You blackmailed me enough. Blackmail is a harsh word. Philip. What else can you call it? Now, you're just as hard and grasping as Vivian was. Yes, but you must remember I'm alive and she isn't. I suppose you're glad she's dead. In life, she was worth nothing to you. In death, you're able to get $60,000 for her. In death? How do I know she is dead? Now, don't be foolish, Philip. You saw her lying on the floor in this very room. Yes, but how do I know she's dead? It was you who examined her and told me so. And you buried the body by yourself. Well, I, I just wanted to spare you, Philip. Just exactly where did you bury Vivian? As a matter of fact, how do I know the whole affair isn't staged for my special benefit? So that you can extort money from me. Oh, surely you don't believe that, Philip. Why, you shot her with your own gun. Yes. And you took the gun away from me immediately after the shooting. Suddenly, that whole affair is becoming very clear to I me. I tell you, she's dead, Philip, and buried out in the woods. Then I want to see the grave and the body you say is in it. But this is ridiculous. I, I won't go searching for a grave in the middle of the night. You shouldn't have to search for it, Roger. Not if you really dug one. Come along. We can pick up a shovel of the tool shed. I won't do it. I won't do it. I it's said come ridiculous. along, Roger. Oh, very well. But I'm not certain I'll be able to find the grave. After all, the woods is fairly large, and it's been two weeks since I buried That's it. That's all right, Roger. We'll stay out there until you do find her. A few minutes later, Philip and Roger picked up the shovel at the tool shed and then continued on their way to the woods that began at the rear of the house. Neither of the men spoke as they entered the woods, Roger leading the way with a flashlight. Several times he stopped trying to get his bearings, then plunged on again, hoping to find a, a familiar landmark. It became apparent that Roger was growing less and less sure of himself. Oh, the grave is someplace around here. I'm certain of it. Perhaps we ought to come back in the daytime. It, it might be easier to find it then. I know, Roger. You shouldn't have any trouble finding it now. If it exists. It does exist, I tell you. It's, it's just that the woods are so confusing at night. Everything looks so, so different. Just keep on searching, Roger. Well, perhaps this is the spot. It, it looks something like it. Well, is it or isn't I, it? I, I don't know. It looks like the place where I buried her, and yet, yet I'm, I, I'm not certain. There's only one way to make certain, and that's to start digging. Here, here's the shovel. But suppose this isn't the spot. Then we'll dig somewhere else. In fact, we'll dig up the entire woods if necessary. After all, you're certain she is buried in the woods, aren't you? Go ahead, Roger. Start digging. Oh, oh, very well. Well, Roger, you've been digging for 20 minutes now, and you haven't uncovered a body. Tell her, Mike. I told you I wasn't sure this was the spot where I buried her. You're a great actor, Roger. But I'm afraid this time you've overplayed your role. Uh, what do you mean? Vivian isn't dead. And there's no use your pretending she is. Everything that's happened was part of a scheme the two of you planned to extort money from me. I tell you she is dead. Then where's the body? I thought this was the spot, but I must be mistaken. I'm sure I didn't bury her any deeper than this, but if I... Philip, turn the flashlight this way. What is it? Look. 
Do you see what I've uncovered? <gasps> a hand? Yes. This is the spot where I buried her, Philip. Just a few more shovelfuls and I'll have her uncovered. Oh. Oh, it can't be. There. Ah, there you are, Philip. Of course, she's been in the ground for two weeks, but I think you can easily recognize that it's Vivian. Yes. It's Vivian. And look, Philip. Here's the bullet hole under her heart. The bullet hole that you made. I don't want to see any more. I've had enough. You should trust me a little more, Philip. Everything I did was for your own good. After all, you you don't want to go to the electric chair, do you? I don't care what happens anymore. I can't stand having her death on my conscience any longer. I'm going to call the police. Don't be a fool, Philip. You know it might well mean the electric chair. I'll take my chances. Anything's better than going on living the way I have these past two weeks. I'm going back to the house and call the police. Philip, Philip, come back. Come back. Philip! Operator. Operator. Philip, Philip, wait. Wait, don't do anything foolish. No, you cut me off. Take your hands off that phone, Roger. What I want you to do, Philip, is to listen to me for a few minutes. At the end of that time, you may, you may do as you please. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Nothing you can say will make me change my mind about calling the now, police. listen to me first. Then if you still want to call the police, you can. Now, please put the receiver down, Philip. Yeah, that's it. Well, what do you want to tell me? Well, uh, do you mind if I mix myself a drink first? It's, it's been a rather difficult evening. Very well. Oh, well, what about one for you, Philip? You look as though you could stand a drink. No, thank you. Oh, nonsense. Do you good. What is it you want to say to me, Roger? Huh? Oh, oh yes, say to you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, here's your drink, Philip. Thank you. Well, now, uh, what shall we drink to? Uh, we'll drink to your good luck. Come what may. Ah, there. I feel a good deal better. All right. Now that we've had our drinks, what have you got to say? Oh, oh yes, yes. I, uh, what I wanted to say was I, I never let anything interfere with my plans, Philip. What do you mean by that? Simply that I can't allow you to go to the police and therefore you shan't. It would spoil my plan. Oh, it would, would it? Well, I'd like to see you stop me. I have, Philip. In a very little while, in fact, in just a few seconds, you'll be dead. Dead? What are you saying? Yes, Philip. The drink I mixed for you was poisoned. Poison? Aren't you finding that it's becoming uh, difficult to breathe? Oh, no, you couldn't have. I... My throat, it burns. Yes, I know, Philip, but... It'll all be over in a matter of seconds. Now, I, I see it all. You, you might... Uh, yes, Philip. Just a week ago tonight, she uh, died according to plan. I'll call the police. I'm afraid, Philip, that you haven't the strength left to reach the telephone. I will... I... Uh-huh. I'm afraid you and Vivian never had a chance, Philip. I had things worked out perfectly, down to the smallest detail. Hello, operator. Uh, operator, please connect me with the police. It was at this point that I was called into the case. Inspector Carlton called me an hour after Roger Martinson had phoned the police. When I arrived at the Drake mansion, I examined the body of Vivian Drake and that of her husband, Philip. When I had finished my examination, I entered the library, where Inspector Carlton was questioning Roger Martinson. Hello, Doc. Oh, Doc, this is Roger Martinson. Mr. Martinson, this is Dr. Smith, the county coroner. How do you do? Hello. I'll be with you in a few minutes, Doc. Just stick around. Now, Mr. Martinson, you were telling me how you came to this house two weeks ago tonight to see your sister and found that she was gone. Uh, yes. Yes, my brother-in-law, Philip, told me that she'd gone on a vacation. Now, I, I thought it strange at the time that she should have gone away without saying goodbye to me, as we were always very close. 
But days have passed, and, and I didn't hear from her. Tell me, was it like your sister to go away and not write? No, no, it wasn't, and, and that's what worried me so. These past two weeks, Philip kept putting me off when I inquired about Vivian's whereabouts. Well, tonight I, tonight I, I couldn't stand it any longer. And I came to this house to have it out with him. What did your brother-in-law say when he saw you? Well, he was quite agitated at my unexpected arrival. When I couldn't get any satisfaction out of him regarding Vivian, I, I threatened to go to the police. Then he broke down and confessed that he murdered Vivian. When did he murder her? He told me that he'd done it two weeks ago tonight. Why, that was the very night I'd come here to see Vivian, and he told me that she'd left for a vacation. Mm, I see. Go on. Well, naturally, when he told me he'd murdered her, I, I was aghast. He led me to the woods and, and showed me the grave. We returned to the house, and before I knew what had happened, Philip had taken poison. Then I called the police. Well, it seems like a plain case of murder and suicide. Outside of a few questions at the inquest, I don't think we'll trouble you anymore, Mr. Oh, Martinson. that's quite all right, Inspector. I shall be at your service any time. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Martinson. Uh, yes? I was very much interested in hearing what you had to say to the inspector regarding the murder of your sister. You say that your brother-in-law confessed to murdering her two weeks ago tonight? Uh, that's right. That would be um, April 2nd, wouldn't it? Um, yes, that's correct. Then you never saw her alive after the night of April 2nd? Why, oh, I know, of course not. What are you getting at, Doc? Please, Inspector. Mr. Martinson, would you mind telling me where you live? I, at uh, 425 West 107th Street. Tell me, were some clothes delivered to that address in your care a week ago today, April 9th? Uh, clothes? Yes. To be exact, a woman's sport suit, which cost $64 and arrived COD. Why... Why, no. You're lying, Mr. Martinson. I have in my hand a slip of paper that not only proves that you're lying, but that will send you to the electric chair. Doc, what are you saying? Yes, Inspector. Mr. Martinson's plan was perfect, but he... he slipped up badly. He forgot to search Vivian Drake's clothing before he buried her. When I examined her body just now, I found in one of her pockets this receipted bill bearing the date April 9th. That proves beyond a doubt that she wasn't murdered by her husband on April 2nd, as Mr. Martinson here no. claims. No, no. Yes, Mr. Martinson, the corpse has accused you from the grave of murder and has given us proof of your guilt. No, no, it can't be. I had everything planned perfectly, perfectly, do you hear? Down to the last detail. I couldn't have failed. I couldn't have failed. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip to the grave? Poor Roger. What a pity. After all that planning and hard work, to be tripped up by a sail slip found on a corpse. It just goes to prove that you have to be more careful when you're burying people you've murdered. Now, I recall another case where a woman drugged her husband and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. I hope you'll join me again soon. But if you do, please remember this. Next Sunday, I shall take a train that leaves at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon at half past three. You've just heard Chapter 20 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Accusing Corpse, Don Randolph played Roger. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Escape by Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday over most of these stations. But beginning next week, the mysterious traveler will be presented at a new time, Sunday afternoons at 3.30. 
Please note the change in time. 3.30 every Sunday afternoon, beginning next Sunday. This is Mutual. This is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy this little trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. But where are we going? We're going to delve into the life of a frightened man. In a tale titled, The Queen of the Cats. Some years ago, when I was practicing medicine, I was called upon by a young girl of 22 or so. As she was shown into my office, I could see that she was having a, a difficult time suppressing her agitation. Her lips trembled as she spoke. Dr. Smith. My name is Jane Elliott. I have an appointment with you. Yes, Miss Elliott. Uh, won't you be seated, please? Thank you. Oh, it seems to be the trouble, Miss Elliott. You're trembling. You don't look well at all. I'm not ill, Doctor. It's Chris. Chris Arnold, my fiancé. Oh, Doctor, you've got to help him. If you don't, something terrible will happen. Well, I'll do everything I can, Miss Elliott. Now, tell me what's wrong. I... Well, I don't know what's wrong. All I know is that Chris is frightened. He's in deadly fear of something. Has he told you uh, what it is that frightens him? No. No, I've questioned him countless times, but he refuses to tell me. I see. Where is your fiancé now? At his home, Brookfield Manor. Oh, doctor, I, I, I know it's late, but won't you come with me and see Chris? He needs help desperately. There, there, Miss Elliot. You mustn't cry. Of course I'll come with mm. you. And I'll do what I can. Jane. Just a minute. Jane, I, I've asked you before not to... Who, who's he? Darling, this is Dr. Smith. Doctor, this is my fiancé, Chris Arnold. How do you do, Mr. Arnold? Why the devil did you bring him? I don't need a doctor. Please, darling, I, I just couldn't stand Forgive to me, see Mr. you. Forgive me, Mr. Arnold, but it's obvious to the most untrained eye you do need a doctor. Please, Chris. Tell the doctor what you're afraid of. I'm not afraid of anything. Oh, darling, please tell him. Please. You can't go on this way. Yes. Yes, you're right. I can't go on this way. If I don't tell someone, I'll go mad. Believe me, Mr. Arnold, you'll feel much better once you've talked your fears out. Now, um, suppose you start from the beginning and tell me everything. All right, doctor. Come on in. I, I suppose it all began... Two years ago, at a party Jane and I were invited to. Oh, Chris, isn't this a wonderful party? The only thing wonderful about it is you. <laughs> oh, Chris, don't. People are watching. Oh, a fine thing when a man can't kiss his best girl in public. What's this generation coming to, anyway? At Miss Tyndall School, we were taught a young lady never kisses a man in public. <laughs> Miss Tyndall is setting romance back 50 years. Who are you looking for, anyway? Rana Farouk, my roommate at, at Miss Tyndall's. Oh, oh yes, yeah. she's, she's the Egyptian girl you were telling me about. Yes, I want you to meet her. Only you better not fall in love with her as every other man does. Mm. Sounds as though she's a second Cleopatra. Men just can't seem to be able to resist her. Hmm. Well, I'm curious to see this siren of the Nile. Oh, there she is, Chris. Come on. So that's Rana. No wonder men can't resist her. Hello, Jane. 
I've missed you. Rana, this is Chris Arnold. Chris, this is Rana Peruk. Hello, Chris. Hello, Rana. Oh, look, there's Miss Tindall waving to me. Excuse me, won't you? Of course, Jane. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> you know, Chris, that Miss Tindall is the first thing I'd see in the morning when I got up. And the last thing before I went to bed was your picture. And I always knew that someday we should meet. And now we have. Why are you staring at me like that? Aren't you going to say anything? I prefer just to look. Even now, Doctor, two years after our first meeting, I find it difficult to describe how beautiful Rana was. She had lustrous black hair that came down to her shoulders and sparkling green eyes that bewitched you. No words can do her beauty justice. I was captivated the moment I saw her. I see. What happened after that first meeting? Rana seemed also attracted to me. And after that night, we saw each other constantly. You did? Nothing seemed to matter to me when I was with her. And it made me indescribably happy to learn she felt the same way. A month after we'd met, we were married. Mm. Please go on, Mr. Arnold. After we were married, we took an apartment in town. In the months that followed, I began to see Rana not as the image I'd been infatuated with, but as she really was, vain, selfish, and possessive. It was a possessiveness verging on madness. She couldn't bear to have me out of her sight, and when I was upon my return, there would be questions, countless questions. I began to dread seeing her. And then, then there were the cats. The cats? Yes. She had an insane passion for them. Yes, when Rana and I were at school together, Doctor, she always had a few cats around. She said that she couldn't live without them. The apartment them. was always full of cats. She'd sit for hours stroking them, whispering to them until I felt I'd go mad. Life became a nightmare for me, a nightmare full of cats. And Rana asking questions, endless questions. One day, I realized I couldn't go on living with her any longer. That our marriage had been a mistake. I decided to tell her about it that very evening. May I come in, Rana? Of course, dear. Rana, there's, there's something important I want to talk to you about. Oh, please, Chris. There's so little time just now. We can talk later after the party. But, Rana, this is important. I think that... Darling, whatever you have to say can wait. Now, please hurry. But, but... Well, well, all right. We'll discuss what I have to say later. Chris. When I called you at the office this afternoon, why didn't you tell me that you had had lunch with Mary Walker? What? How did you know I had lunch with her? Oh, a friend told me. A friend? Who was it? What is it, my beauty? What are you trying to say? Rana, put that cat down and answer me. Who was the friend that told you I had lunch with Mary Walker? You have never met her, darling. How is it that you always know what I've been doing, whom I've been seeing? It's as though you have people spying on me. Chris! What a thing to say. Now, please hurry or we'll be late. There's something strange about the way you always know what I've been doing. Sometimes I suspect... Oh, Chris, look out. You've stepped on Sabina's tail. I'm sorry, but I didn't see it. I asked you before to be more careful. Poor Sabina. Are you all right now, my beauty? If there weren't so many cats underfoot, I wouldn't have stepped on her. Why must you have five cats around? Because I love cats. They're beautiful. Sacred. Thousands of years ago, my ancestors worshipped cats. And the great cat god is Sekonet. On the river Nile, close by the ancient city of Hamadi, where I was born, are the graves of a hundred thousand sacred cats. They have been mummified and buried with reverence. Uh, Rana, I can't go on like this anymore. My darling, what do you mean? I feel our marriage was a mistake. I want a divorce. Chris. You can't be serious. But I am. I love you, Chris, and I won't give you up. You're mine, darling. You always will be. Nothing shall ever separate us. Would you care for a cocktail, sir? Uh, no, no, thank you. 
Well, even if you won't have one, Mr. Arnold, I will. Jane, Jane, it's good to see you again. Just let me look at you. Chris, you're... you're not looking well at all. Are you all right? I am now. But Jane, Jane, can't we go someplace and talk? What about the terrace? All right, Chris. Here, this door opens onto it. Yeah, this is much better. It's been quite some time since we've seen each other, hasn't it? Yes, the last time we saw each other was the night that... The night that I met Rana. Yes. How is Rana, Chris? Oh, she's... She's fine. We... Jane, I've made such a mess out of everything. I was a fool to have married her. Please, Chris. You mustn't talk like that. But I was a fool, Jane. Mistaking infatuation for love. Can you ever forgive me for the way I behaved toward you? There's... There's nothing to forgive, Chris. Well, Jane, this is a surprise. Rana. Hello, Rana. Really, Jane, the way you've avoided calling on us, I half suspect you are still in love with Chris. Rana, you have no right to talk to her like that. Uh, please, Chris, I, I'm i afraid I'll have to be leaving. It's getting quite late. Good night. Good night, Jane. I hope I didn't interrupt anything by coming out here so unexpectedly, Chris. Yes, Rana, you did. I was about to tell Jane that I love her and that I always will. I suppose that's why you asked me for a divorce. You've been secretly seeing her. Secretly seeing her? Is it possible for me to see anyone or do anything secretly without your knowing about it? No, you are quite right. It is not possible. I know everything you do. So I would forget Jane if I were you. Uh, Rana, how can you possibly want me? Knowing how I feel about Jane... You've got to give me a divorce. I'll never give you a divorce. Never. Do you hear? You're mine. You always will be. Yes? Well, what's to prevent me from leaving you? Wherever you go, Chris, I'll follow. If I can't have you, no one else ever will. Remember, Chris, you're mine. You always will be. I can still see her, Doctor. As she stood there screaming at me. Remember, Chris, you're mine, and you always will be. It was a, a shock to suddenly realize that she looked like a cat, an angry cat. Her green eyes, cold and murderous, her long nails digging into my arms, her body tense. For a moment, I, I thought she was going to scratch my eyes out. Yes, Rana did look like that when she was in a rage. Mm. And what happened after that night, Mr. Arnold? I stopped speaking to Rana. We lived in the same apartment, but that was all. Weeks passed, and Rana waited for me to come around as she felt certain I would. Yes. She had all the patience of a cat playing with a mouse. But when a month had passed and I still refused to talk to her, she made an attempt to win me back. It happened one night as we were driving to this house. Why are you slowing down, Rana? I want to talk to you, Chris, and I can't talk to you while I'm driving. There's no point in your stopping. We have nothing to say to each other. Oh, but we do, darling. Chris, we could be so happy together if you wanted to. You know how much I love you. It's a possessive love that smothers me to death. Chris, you know that isn't true. I could make you happy if you don't let me. Oh, please don't turn away from me, Chris. I'll do anything to make you happy. Anything. Anything? And you can give me a divorce. So you're still thinking of her, hoping I'll give you a divorce so you can marry her. Well, I won't. Do you hear? I won't. I think we'd better be moving along. Chris, you haven't any right to treat me like this. I'm your wife. Only in the eyes of the law, not in my eyes. I hate you. I hate you! <laughs> you can't! You almost took out my eyes with those claws of yours. I will scratch your eyes out before I let any other woman have you. You're mine. You always will be. Perhaps this will bring you to your senses. <laughs> Slide over. I'll drive. Very well, Chris. You think you've beaten me, Chris. But you haven't. In the end, you'll come crawling to me. It may take a year, two years, five years. But I can wait. I'll never come crawling to you. Never. But you will, Chris. Jane knows I'll never give you your freedom. In time, she'll marry. And when she does, all the heart will be gone out of you. Then you'll be mine. That'll never happen. But it 
will, Chris. And deep down in your heart, you know I'm right. Jane will never be yours. I'll see to that. You have everything planned perfectly, Rana, don't you? But I have one way of escape from you that you've never thought of. Really? And what way is that? I can escape through death. Death? Yes, Rana. If I should fail to take the curve a hundred yards ahead, we'd plunge off the side of this mountain. Chris, you would. Why not, Rana? You've shown me there's nothing to live for. This at least <gasps> is a clean way out. No! Chris, don't! No! When I drove the car over the side of the mountain, Doctor, I thought Rana and I were going to our deaths. But fate decreed otherwise. When I recovered consciousness 48 hours later in a hospital, I learned it was only Rana who died. Yes, I recall reading about it in the papers. It was a miracle that you survived. Yes. For weeks, they despaired of saving me. But at the end of eight months, I walked out of that hospital. The police believed my story that it was an accident. And I was free to begin a new life. It was just a week after I was discharged from the hospital that I ran into Jane. Chris! Oh, Chris, it's you. Jane, you always seem to pop up just when I need you most. Chris, you... you look so much older. Are you all right? Well, my heart isn't any too good, but otherwise I'm fine. And seeing you again is... Just what I need to put me on my feet. These past months must have been so difficult for you. I, I don't want to look back to the past, Jane. But only to the future. The future I once hoped we'd share. And still do. Two months ago, Doctor... Jane and I became engaged. It was just about that time that I first began to notice that everywhere I went, there always seemed to be a cat following me. Are you sure you weren't imagining it, Mr. Arnold? At first, I thought it was my imagination. But a week after Jane and I became engaged, I was certain I was being followed. Yeah. Uh, tell me, Mr. Arnold, was it always the same cat that followed you? No, no, no. One day it'd be one cat, and another, another day a different one. Oh, I, I know you must think I'm mad, Doctor. And at the time, I felt I was going mad. That is, until that night. What night, Mr. Arnold? The night I saw her. It happened in this very room six weeks ago. I, I, I had great difficulty in falling asleep that night. Suddenly, the silence was broken by the faint crying of a cat. The crying grew louder. And louder. I lay in the darkness listening, realizing that the cat crying was real, living, and in my room. I could feel my heart pounding as I sat up in bed and looked about my darkened room. And then suddenly I saw her. Two burning green eyes in the darkness. There was no mistaking those eyes. They were runners. I stared into those eyes for what seemed like hours. Then, as though listening to a stranger's voice, I heard myself speak. Rana! It is you, Rana, isn't it? Yes. I'd recognize those green eyes anywhere. So you've come back and in the form I've always thought of you. As a cat. I know why you've come back. It's because of Jane. You always said that if you couldn't have me, no one else could. But I was yours. And always would be. Well, you're wrong, you hear? Jane and I are going to be married. You came between us once, but you aren't going to this time. I will marry you, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Ah, this fiend, trying to scratch my eyes out. Well, we'll see about that. Uh, there. Perhaps that'll show you that nothing you can do will stop me from marrying her. I know that all those cats that were following me, spying on me, were doing so under your orders. You, you're the queen of the cats. Uh, yes, I should have known. No wonder you always knew where I'd been, who I'd seen. You had your cat spying on me even then. Well, even if you are the queen of the cats, you can't prevent me from marrying Jane. That's a bullet between those green eyes of yours is what's needed. I 
emptied the gun at her, Doctor, and then turned on the lights. There was no sign of her. She'd vanished. All that I found were those six bullet holes in the wall. Tell me, Mr. Arnold, isn't it possible that you only dreamed all that? That actually you fired the gun in your sleep and the shots themselves wakened you? I tried to tell myself that, Doctor. But during the nights that followed, I, I knew it was not a dream. For night after night, she appeared in my room. I'd lie awake, waiting to hear her footsteps, her voice. And when she would appear, I'd plead with her to leave me alone. But she'd only stare at me with those burning green eyes, waiting, waiting. I knew she'd never leave me alone as long as I intended to marry Jane. Finally, I could stand it no longer, and I went to see Jane. Chris, this is a surprise. Come in, darling. Thank you, Jane. Oh, well, where have you been keeping yourself this past week? I was beginning to believe I was being jilted. Jane, there's something I want to ask you. Yes, Chris, of course. What is it? I know we set our wedding for next week. But couldn't we put it off for a while? J just a little while. Darling, what is it? There's something wrong. I, I, I know there is. Please tell me. I wish I could, but I can't. Oh, please, Jane, just have faith in me. You know, I, I wouldn't postpone our marriage if I could possibly help it. All right, Chris, I, I do have faith in you. We'll consider our marriage postponed for the time being. The night I put off my marriage to Jane, Doctor, was the first night that Rana didn't appear. And the first night in a week that I'd been able to sleep. You think, Mr. Arnold, that she didn't appear again because you would postpone your marriage to Jane? I know it. Weeks went by, weeks in which I was able to sleep soundly without being awakened by her. And I came to think that perhaps it had all been part of a horrible nightmare and that I was over it at last. A week ago, I asked Jane to set the date for our wedding. She did so. And that same day, we took out a marriage license. But that night, she appeared again. Her eyes shining in the dark, cold and murderous. She knew about the license. That's why she returned. And you've seen her again? Yes, yes, every night. She just keeps staring at me with those green eyes, waiting, waiting. She's determined not to give me any rest. I tell myself that I, I mustn't be afraid, but I, I, I keep hearing her voice over and over. If I can't have you, no one else will. You're mine, and you always will be. Oh, Chris, darling, I wish I had known all this before. You feel, Mr. Arnold, that... Somehow she'll prevent you from marrying Jane. Huh? I, I know I sound mad, but I do. I have a feeling something horrible will happen if I attempt to marry her. Do you still have the marriage license? Yes. Why do you ask? Mr. Arnold, you've reached a crisis in your life. You're faced with fears that are threatening to overwhelm your sanity. The only way for you to challenge your fears is to go through with your marriage to Jane now, tonight. Tonight? Yes. It's quite late, but I'm sure a friend of mine who's a judge will marry you. Uh, you get married t tonight? If you hesitate, you're lost. Your only chance is to face your fears. All right, Doctor. All right. Jane, will you marry me tonight? Oh, yes, Chris. Yes. <laughs> Sorry to get you up in the middle of the night, Judge, but for reasons I can't explain, it's important that these two be married tonight. That's quite all right, Doc. Always glad to oblige a friend. Have you got the license and the ring, young man? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Here's, here's the license and the ring. Now, young man, if you'll take her right hand. That's it. Now, shall I give you the long ceremony or the short one? The short one, please. Just as you say, young lady. This is the shortest one I've got. Do you, Jane Elliott, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband, to love, honor, and obey as long as ye both shall live? I do. Do you, Christopher Arnold, 
Take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife to love, honor, and cherish as long as you both shall live. <laughs> it's she. It's Rana. Chris, please, it's only a black cat. You mustn't pay any attention to it. Of course not. Now, it's Rana, I tell you. Look at her eyes. I told you she was trying to prevent my marrying Jane. Well, I'll get rid of her once and for all. Chris, what are you doing with that gun? Put it down. <laughs> ah, she got away. Well, whatever she's got, I'll find her and kill her. Chris! Chris, come back! Where can he be? Now, Jane, he can't be far off. We'll find him. Oh. Listen. Doctor, that must be Chris firing that gun. Come on. Those shots came from close by. Hurry! Hurry! We, we better take it easy now, Doc. It's pretty dark out here. Wait a moment now. Light my cigarette lighter. Doc! Look, a dead cat! Yes. It was shot through the head. So look. Here's another one that's been shot to death. Neither one of them is the, the black cat. Say, Doc, isn't that a body over there? Chris! No, Jane, you stay with the judge while I look. All right, Doctor. There, there, miss. You, you mustn't cry. This never would have happened if, if I hadn't agreed to bury him. He was afraid, so afraid. Doc, is it... Arnold? Yes. Yes, it's he. He's dead, isn't he? I can see it in your face. Yes, Jen. He's dead. But, Doc, what happened to him? He's been clawed to bits, as if by hundreds of cats. <gasps> and most horrible of all, his eyes have been scratched out. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip into the life, or should I say, death of a frightened man? Strangely enough, two days later at Chris Arnold's funeral, just as the coffin was being lowered into the grave, the mourners suddenly noticed a black cat with green eyes sitting on the edge of the grave, quietly licking its paws. Uh, by the way, I, I trust you haven't a cat in your home, uh, particularly a black one. I, uh, I once knew a woman, uh, she's dead now, who had a... Uh, well, you're getting off at the next stop, huh? And I'm sorry. <laughs> Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard Chapter 31 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's story, Queen of the Cats, Stotts Cotsworth played Chris, Sarah Burton played Rana, and Sandra Gould played Jane. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. And original music was played by Doc Whipple. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Listen next week to a tale titled Broadway, Here I Come. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. It is presented over most of these stations every Sunday afternoon at half past three. This is Mutual.
a mysterious traveler. This is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to follow the adventures of a man who thought he could commit murder and escape punishment. I call the story, Death Laughs Last. It was while I was practicing medicine in an eastern city that Edward Harrison brought his wife Mary to me for an examination. I could see at a glance that she was dangerously ill. When I had finished my examination, however, I tried to conceal her true condition from her till I had a chance to speak privately to her husband. It, it isn't anything serious, is it, Dr. Smith? Oh, please tell me that it isn't. Well, I'm afraid it's too soon to say, Mrs. Harrison. Until the x-ray plates are ready, I can't say yes or no. Oh, but... Now your husband is waiting outside. He's probably beginning to worry, so... Uh... Oh, yes, of course. Here's your wife, Mr. Harrison. You must have thought I'd kidnapped her. No, but I was getting a little worried, Doctor. I, uh, I hope you didn't find anything very wrong. Well, I took several x-rays, but uh, I won't be able to tell much until they're developed. Uh... I'd like your wife to come back uh, day after tomorrow, if she can. Of course, Doctor. What time would be the best? Well, any time that's convenient to you. Now, I'll write out a prescription your husband can have filled. Will you uh, step in for a moment, Mr. Harrison? Sure thing. With you in a moment, Mary. Of course, darling. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Harrison? All right. Now, what is it, Doctor? Mr. Harrison, your wife is... Dangerously ill. That's, uh, does that mean she's going to, to die? Her only hope is a brain operation. A very difficult and delicate operation. Without it, well, I could only give her six months, a year at most. No, no, it mustn't be. She's got to have the operation, you hear? I must tell you, Mr. Harrison, that only one man in this country has the necessary skill for the operation your wife needs. He's Dr. Howard Richards. And naturally, he's in great demand. His average fee for an operation is about fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred? Well, of course, if you can't afford that, you might consider the circumstances. And no, no, I can afford it. I can afford anything Mary needs. Well, then I'll get in touch with him at once. Yeah, sure. You make the arrangements right away, and I'll get a hold of the money. I'll get it to you by tomorrow, sure. me off with my coat, will you? Please? Oh, sure, sure, Mary. Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, much better since Dr. Smith gave me that medicine in his office. Oh, he's a swell doctor. Mm-hmm. He'll fix you up in no time. Did he... Did he tell you anything more, Edward? Uh, not a thing, except that the treatment might take a little time. That's all. A little time? Oh, dear, I hope it won't be too expensive. Your business hasn't been good, and we've used up all the money in our savings account, and... Oh, don't you fret about money. Don't you worry about anything. All right, darling, I won't. Oh, but aren't you going to take your coat off? No, I... uh, I've got to get the prescription the doctor gave me filled. You just take it easy till I get back. I might stop in at the shop, too. There's something... uh, something I've got to attend to there. I'm Ed Harrison. Oh, yes, Mr. Harrison. Please sit down. <clears throat> I uh, see that you want to borrow $1,500 from us. That's right. Hmm. Unfortunately, the security you offer, your home... Well, what's wrong with it? It's a swell little house, good section, all in good repair. Yes, yes, that's true. But you already have a first and second mortgage on it, totaling $4,000. And, well, I'm, I'm afraid we can't make any further loans. But I've got to have the money. 
I just got to. I'm sorry to hear that because there's nothing we can do to help you. Nothing we can do. You say you're not employed, Mr. Harrison. No, I own a shop. I'm a locksmith. Mm hmm. Well, that means you're never certain of your income. If you had a job now, a regular income you could depend on. What are you getting at? You mean you're not going to let me have the money? I certainly wish I could, but under the circumstances, well, I'm sorry, very sorry, but there's nothing I can do. I'm afraid the collateral you suggest isn't satisfactory, Mr. Harrison. We'd lend you the money if we could, but we just can't. Sorry. But I've got to have it. I've just got to. Sorry. It's to save Mary's life. She'll die if I Sorry. don't. Sorry. And I won't let her die. I won't. Sorry. I, I... Sorry. Look, Sorry. 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 Listen. Sorry. 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 Edward, you aren't eating. Oh, and you're so quiet. Dear, is there anything wrong? It was... Oh, no, of course not. You're worrying about me, aren't you? Why? Why? No, Mary, I... I was just thinking about making some changes at the shop and... Darling, you don't have to lie to me. I know I'm not well, but I'm going to get better. Really, I am, I promise. Of course you are. Dr. Smith said so. You're going to be well in no time. No, I've got to go out. I, I have an appointment over the other side of the city with Horace Latimer. He wants to see me about something. Uh, something important. <laughs> Edward had no appointment with Horace Latimer, but went to see Horace anyway. For he and Horace had been boyhood friends, and their paths had separated, and Horace had grown wealthy. But in his desperation, Edward Harrison hoped that Horace would remember the past and would lend him the money he'd been trying to raise all day. Horace could spare it easily, but would he? Fifteen hundred? That's rather a lot of money, Ed. I know it is, Horace, but it's for Mary, for an operation. I've got to have it. Uh, yes. Uh, why don't you try the bank? You have a house, a business... I have tried the bank and all the personal loan companies in town. They all turned me down, said the security wasn't good enough. I see. Well, that's too bad. But I don't quite understand why you came to me, Ed. Because we're friends, that's why. Because when we were boys, we agreed that we'd each of us always lend the other a helping hand if we could. Uh, boys don't understand business very well, I'm afraid, Ed. No, I suppose not. They don't understand business. They just understand friendship. You know if I had the money and you needed it, I'd lend it to you in a minute. I don't doubt that at all, Ed. And you can bet I'd lend it to you if I had it. But that's the trouble. I haven't any ready cash. Uh, the income tax, you know, and a couple of shaky investments that I had to bolster up lately. All right, Horace, never mind explaining. I get the idea. You're not going to lend me the money. Oh, really, Ed, I would if I could, but I can't. I, I'm sorry, Save your but sorrow I... for somebody else. I don't need your money, you hear? I'll get it someplace else. Yes, I'll get it. Somehow. <laughs> After he had slammed out of Horace Latimer's expensive home, Edward stood for a moment on the dark street corner, staring back with bitterness in his face. I'm sorry. Yes, you're sorry, and a pig's eye, you're sorry. What a sap I was to think you were a pal of mine. Uh, what's I... that, buddy? Oh, was you talking to me? What? Oh, no, sorry. I, I guess I was thinking out loud. Oh, that's okay. Hey, you got a match? A match? Oh, sure. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Okay, just hold it like that. M make a move and I'll plug you. Gun? Yeah, Why, this you... is a stick-up. Hold your whole hand over your dough and make it fast, see? My dough? <laughs> That's a hot one. I'm out trying to raise money myself. We're both out of luck. I've only got a dollar on me. Take it if you want it anyway. It's more than I could raise. Don't try to kid me. Stand still while I see what you got in your pockets. A wallet. A leather case of some kind. You'll find just one dollar in that wallet. Yeah. A buck. One measly buck. I bet you got a roll hidden in this leather case. 
It's heavy enough. There's nothing in there but my emergency kit. Yeah, well, I'll just see for myself. Say. Oh, this kit is full of skeleton keys and pick locks and stuff. What are you, anyway, second-story worker? I'm a locksmith and a safe repairman, if it's anything to you. Now, how about taking the dollar and letting me go on my way? I'm in a hurry. Ah, not so fast, pal. Not so fast. Uh, were you leveling just now when you said you was trying to raise dough? Yeah, I've got to have $1,500 by tomorrow. What's it to you? Ah, you'd be surprised, pal. <laughs> okay, I'm putting the gun away, but you ain't leaving yet. Me and you, we're going to talk business. Because I got a plan that'll get us both all the dough we need. Two more beers, waiter. Coming up. Well, is it a deal on the proposition? I... I, I don't know, Mike. I sure you do. There's nothing to it. You can open locks and safes. I know where there's a house with plenty of dough in it. You and me together, we'll go get it. We'll make a team. What burglary? I've never stolen anything in my life. Listen, you said you needed the dough bad, didn't you? So do I. Plenty bad. You said you'd do anything to get it, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Ed, then what are you hanging back for? All you got to do is get the back door opened and the safe. In half an hour, you'll have your 1500 and more. How else are you ever going to get it? Answer me that. I don't know. You, you're sure the money's there, Mike? Positive. I was casing the joint. Looked in the window in time to see the old geezer put a whole roll of bills in a safe that's like a bread box. Ah, you could open it with your teeth. All right. I'll do it. I've got to have the money. I'll go on the job with you. <laughs> easy. But I shouldn't be doing this. There must be some other way to get the money straight. Uh, don't be a sucker all your life. you got to take what you want in this world. If you don't, you'll never get it. Everybody's a crook of some kind. Take it from me. Well... Get on. Get that door open. we got to get inside before we're spotted. All right. Let me take a second, I think. Yes. There. It's unlocked. Okay. Get inside. The safe's in the library, down this way. Don't make any noise. You're sure there's only two of them in the house? Yeah, the old guy and his butler. Probably both of them deaf as posts. Here's the library. Come on. The safe's behind the picture on the wall. This picture? Yeah, that's it. I'll lift it down. There you are. That safe is just a kid's toy. Go ahead, get it open. It won't be that easy. I'll have it open inside half an hour. Ah, hurry it up. You've been 40 minutes on that thing. It's coming now. There. It's open. About time, too. Now let's see what's in it. Ah, here's the cash box. Will I open it? Mazuma, what'd I tell you? There must be thousands there. Easy. Come on, we'll count it and divvy it up. No, never mind. Just give me 1500 That's all I want. You can keep the rest. Are you kidding? No, that's all I want. Just the 1500 I need. Okay, it's your funeral. Yeah, here you are. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 1500 dollar bills. $1,500. Yeah, for just an hour's work. Easy money, huh? What do you say? We crack a couple more cribs tonight? No, no, I just want to get out of here now and get... get behind this door. I'll take care of it. Please. Jenkins, please help. Uh, hey, what'd you expect me to do? Shake his hand? Would you kill him? Yes. I'm an accessory to murder. But then, Duffin, let's get out of here. Or do you want to get caught? No, no, of course not. All right, let's get going. Come on, we can stand still, both of you. I have a gun and I have you covered. The butler. If you move, I'll shoot. I can see you perfectly. He's standing on the stairs. He's got a gun. We caught, we caught. No, not yet, we ain't. Not by an old scarecrew with a rusty horse pistol. Put up your hands. 
I'm going to call the police. You've done something to the law. Hey, okay, we'll put up our hands. Fight for me, Will. Oh! Hey, shoot him. We gotta get out of here in a hurry. No shots. <laughs> Okay, here we are. Come on in. But why did you make me come here? Oh, well, can't I go home? You hide me. Come on in. That's better. Now, take off your hat and stay a while. But I can't stay, Mike. My wife, she'll be worrying. Get home to her. You've got other things than your wife to worry about, chum. What do you mean, Mike? I mean the cops. Or have you forgotten you're wanted for murder? No, no, I haven't forgotten. I'll never be able to forget. Why did you kill him? Why? Well, it was either kill them or go to jail. Or would you rather have gone to jail, huh? No, no, but I'm all mixed up. How did I get into this anyway? You needed dough. That's how you got into this. And you got it, so now cut out the sob stuff. Well, why won't you let me go home? Why did you make me come here to your room? You're here so you and me can have a little talk. Kind of a talk. Well, chum, that door and that safe open, you and me got a future together. Oh, I won't do it. I won't. Sure, you can always send a little note to the cops. They'd get you, too. I'd be a long ways out here. You got a sick wife. You can, they say, you You don't think you can pull a job and go on as if nothing had happened? Somebody's always got to bear another. I did it only for a minute now, and you can't get out. Wait. I... Oh, I have a... Get it off my chest. Oh, no, you do. You see, there's a if I talk. Hey, uh, get away, go. You got me into this. You got me into... I'll take that gun away from me. I'll put you out. Oh. Mike. He's dead. Hold I'm going to get away. In the days of horror, he made his way to the street. Thoughts which he could not control round in his head. I mean, they'll hang me. But I had the money. The money to make Mary. Now they'll catch me. They'll hang me. If I've got to. Paid for somehow. But if you can't escape if you're lucky. I need a drink. I've got to have a drink before I go crazy. So Edward Harrison stood the street and struggled and to control his shaking. It's normal. He ordered a double whiskey. And gouted it, senses cleared a little. Uh, he heard the radio at the end of the bar, uh, broadcasting a warning to the city. Attention. The police talk for the following man. They committed in the Buxton Park. Please make a note of the following what? Say, buddy, what's the radio off for? Because I was D. And I got a knife. I want to hear it. So I'm going to turn it back on again. No, no, you mustn't. But I'm going to. If you try a gun right here under the bar, see what that dirty killer looked like. I repeat, be on tight, lean and wiry, and with reddish brown hair, Buxton Park earlier this evening. Man reported once to him. Now turn you back to our regular night owl program of popular dance tunes. Uh, oh, lean and wiry with reddish brown hair, huh? Well, that ain't you. You're heavy set and blackhead. But for a minute there, you had me going. I was positive you was the killer the way you didn't want me to hear the description. I guess you're just jumpy, huh? Well, here, have another drink. On the house. Oh, thanks, thanks. I need some sleep. Yeah, that's what I need. Some sleep. How close he had come to giving himself away. Edward Harrison hurried. Mike, the police were looking for. Not Edward Harrison. And they had. Edward Harrison was safe. His own good luck, Edward was asleep. Quiet. And troubled by nightmare, Mary was already preparing breakfast. Good morning, darling. Who? I I was pretty rude. I stopped at the shop. I I was pretty little little work. I forgot to watch the time. Oh, and this morning you look terrible. I know. You're worrying about me. Really, I am. No, of course you are. I'm going to see to that. What do you think? Doctor Smith called up last night. He wanted to talk to you. Said he had some good news for you. <laughs> Good news. Yes, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. I don't know why. He asked for you to stop in at his office this morning. I think I know what it is. Yes, sure, I'll go right over and see him. Oh, but darling, you're going to eat breakfast first, aren't you? I'll eat when I get back. I want to see the doctor first. Anyway, I'm not very hungry. Well, all right, Edward. But please hurry back. I want to know what the doctor says, too. Yes, yeah, sure, Mary, I'll be right back. But everything's okay now, darling. Everything's okay. <laughs> After he left the house, Edward bought a morning paper. Big headlines told of the murders the night before, but he scarcely saw them. 
His eyes hurried through the story until he found what he was looking for. The news that Mike's body had been found. The butler Mike had shot had given the police Mike's description and then died before he could tell them there was anyone with Mike. So the police had listed Mike's death as a suicide or an accident and closed the case. Edward Harrison was safe. Perfectly safe. Safe? I'm safe. Mike was wrong. Sometimes you can get away with murder and not have to pay anything if you're lucky. And I've been lucky. I've been lucky. When Edward Harrison entered my office, he sat down beside my desk and tossed a folded newspaper into the wastebasket. His expression was that of a man who had just faced disaster and been rescued at the last moment. Good morning, Doctor. Mary said you'd phoned you had good news. Yes, Mr. Harrison, I called you last night after I got in touch with Dr. Richards. I wanted to tell you that he had agreed to operate on your wife. Oh, that's swell, Doctor. And I've got the money right here in my pocket. The money, yes. Yes, I was also going to tell you that uh, Dr. Richards had said not to worry about it. You could take as long as you wanted to pay it. As long as I wanted? Yes. Then, then it wasn't necessary. I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do I, it. I'm I, afraid I don't understand. I, never mind, Doctor. I, I mean, I've got the money. I want to pay it. He's got to take it right away. Well, what's the matter? What are you looking at me like that for? The operation is going to save Mary's life, isn't it? You said it would. You can go back on your word. You can, do you hear? It's not that, Mr. Harrison. Yes, the operation would save your wife's life, but... Unfortunately, Dr. Richards was the only man in this country... Able to perform it. Well, so what? He said he'd do it, didn't he? And I've raised the dough to pay him, so what's the hitch? Mr. Harrison, Dr. Richards can't perform the operation now. But you said... He was tragically murdered last night by a burglar who broke into his home in Buxton Park. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip into the life of a man who thought he could make good come out of evil? Poor Edward Harrison. He didn't believe that crime must always be paid for by someone, did he? Uh, what became of him? Well, after his wife died a few months later, he confessed everything to the police. He didn't have anything to live for, poor fellow. But I hope his experience will teach you that crime really doesn't pay. I always say that if... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week. You have just heard Chapter 42 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's story, Death Laughs Last, Philip Clark played Edward Harrison, Carl Emery played Mike, and Elizabeth Morgan played Mary Harrison. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silvern. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Now, an important message for all of you. This is Jock McGregor speaking. The National War Fund drive begins tomorrow. As you probably know, this fund includes over 22 of the major war relief and service organizations. As the war progresses on all fronts, more and more people will need help. Our armed forces, American prisoners of war, our allies, and people right here at home. And by giving to the National War Fund, you will be helping. Consider just one of the many organizations that the War Fund supports, the USO. More than 3,000 service units are in operation, clubs where our service men and women find recreation, dances, educational activities, reading, writing, and game rooms, and religious council. The USO is responsible for the traveler's aid desks, which help service men make connections and find sleeping accommodations. It operates the lounges in railroad and bus terminals. USO camp shows bring American entertainment to our troops at camps 
and stations throughout this country and in all the combat zones. Groups will play the jungle circuit in the South Pacific, the desert circuit in North Africa, the grass skirt circuit in the Hawaiian Islands, and the foxhole circuit in combat zones just behind the front line. We can't measure in money the good accomplished by the USO, but we can help to continue that good work by giving our money the National War Fund. So when your community war fund or war chest representative calls on you, give and give generously. Listen next time to a tale titled, The Man the Insects Hated. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. Beginning Saturday, October 7th, The Mysterious Traveler will be heard at a new time. It will be presented every Saturday evening at half past ten Eastern wartime over most of these same stations. So remember the new time, 10.30 p.m. Saturdays. This is Mutual. Inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to visit a man who could change the soul of a human being from one body into another. In a story I call... They who sleep. My story begins late one foggy night in a dingy little room in the slum section of a great city. The occupant of the room, a small man, white-haired, his cheeks hollow from hunger, has just admitted a visitor whom he does not know and whom he is trying to send away. An expensively dressed young woman with a heavy veil hiding her face. But, my child, it cannot be me to whom you wish to speak. You have made some mistake. I haven't made any mistake. I've been hunting for you for days. I spent a good deal of money tracing you here. But I do not understand. Why should you wish to find me, Alexander Thomas, a penniless old man You did who... not always use the name Alexander Thomas. Once you called yourself Chadwin the Great, hypnotist beyond compare. Chadwin the Great? Yes, I, I once used that name. But Chadwin the Great no longer exists. I am only Alexander Thomas now. Listen to me, Chadwin. We've met before. Ten years ago, you gave a performance at the Bijou Theater. Oh, there are so many Bijou Theaters. You asked for volunteers to be hypnotized. I came up on the stage. I and my sister Rose. You hypnotized her easily, but you could not hypnotize me. There were so many. I cannot remember. No, but you can remember this newspaper clipping. <laughs> old story from the newspapers. Where did you get it? It says that you, Chadwin the Great, once performed the experiment of exchanging two men's souls. By the use of secret drugs and your great powers of hypnotism, you transferred one man's soul into another man's body. You cannot believe all the newspapers say. But you did this before witnesses. And one of the two men died. You went to prison for five years for manslaughter. Why do you come here to remind an old man of his tragedies? Go, please, leave me alone. No, Chadwin. For years I've kept this clipping, for years. Never knowing what impulse made me tear it out and save it. Until last week I found it again. And then I knew. You speak not like a woman, but like a soul possessed by devils. Perhaps I am. So you can transfer souls from one body to another? No, no, I cannot. How much would you charge to do it again? Do not ask that of me. I am old. I have been in prison. How much, Chadwin? Could you put my soul into another's body? 
for $10,000. $10,000? Dollars. Yes. Then you could live like a man again, not like a starving animal in this hovel. Once before I tampered with the eternal laws, I paid the penalty. And so did one of those I experimented upon. But which one, Chadwin? The which weaker one? one? He died. The other, the strong soul in its new body, lived. Ah, then I am ready. When can you do it? Tomorrow night? But my child, why should you risk your life for that which cannot be? be which was not meant to be. Look, Chadwin, I shall raise my veil. Would you call me beautiful? Even pretty? No, I'm ugly. You are not ugly. Your face is strong, but if it were not twisted by bitterness... Enough it... of talking. How can you know what it means to a woman to be ugly? To lose the man you love to a woman you hate? Because you are plain, and she is so beautiful. Chadwin, will you do as I ask? To help you change with one who is beautiful. To help you to be loved for just a little. My child, perhaps it is not such a great wickedness to do that. Then you'll do it? But it is only for a little while. You must understand that. For ten days, no more. Then the laws which cannot be violated with impunity require that your soul must return to your body. It's enough. It's all I want, Chadwin. Very well. I have here a small bottle. Here. Take it. Guard it carefully. When the moment comes, she, the other, must drink it in water. Yes. It will be easy. She will drift off to sleep. Then you, you must come to me. But not here. It would not be safe. Never mind. I know the place. The safest in the world. Very well. The exchange will be made, and I will see that she, in your body, slumbers dreamlessly. After ten days, she will wake and be herself again, with no memory whatever of what has happened. And uh, now, Miss... Vaughan. Helen Vaughan. Now, Miss Vaughan, who is this beautiful one with whom you would change places? The girl who just married the man I love. My sister. Rose Vaughn. Good morning, Bessie. Good morning, Miss Helen. Where's Miss Rose? She's gone downstairs yet? Mrs. Tabor, you must learn to say now, Miss Helen. Mrs. Tabor, then? Uh, she's in her room, Miss Helen. Is... Uh... Mr. Tabor with her? Yes, he is. All right, Bessie, thank you. Helen, is that you? We thought we heard your voice. Come on in. Leonard's just leaving for the office. Good morning, Helen. How's the best sister-in-law I ever had? Hello, Rose. Leonard? Darling, what's the matter? Uh, I know. Did you hear what time this young lady got in last night? It must have been quite a party. Oh, Leonard, I hope you aren't keeping tabs on Helen. No, but... I did hear the clock strike three just as her door closed. <laughs> well, me for the office. First, a goodbye kiss. Oh, gosh. I sure picked myself a beautiful wife. Oh, run along, you silly. <laughs> Bye, Helen. Got a sisterly kiss for me? Leonard, don't put your arms around me, please. Well, there's sisterly affection for you. You'd think she hated me. Oh, run along, Leonard. They probably need you downtown to polish off a big deal. Yeah, they probably do at that. Okay, I'm on my way. Bye, you two. Bye, darling. Well, Helen, you are in a mood this morning. I just think you two carry this lovey-dovey business to a ridiculous extreme. Helen, it's as if... Well, as if you dislike seeing Leonard kiss me. You don't have to be constantly kissing him in front of... other people, do you? Helen... Oh, my dear, I didn't realize. Didn't realize what? Didn't realize that... Oh, Helen, darling, believe me. Someday the man will come along who will mean just as much to you as... as Leonard does to me. You'll find him. I'll help you find him. Listen, I'll give some parties and invite a lot of new... Stop it, Rose. Let go of me. Huh? Don't go gushing over me, you idiot. Helen, how can you be so cruel? Oh, stop sniveling like that. I'm sorry, Helen, but 
You're always so sharp when anybody tries to be nice to you. And you, you're always so nice to everybody, so soft, so sweet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Rose. <laughs> I always forget how the least quarrel upsets you. Well, here, drink this, Rose. There's a sedative in it. Something quite harmless. It'll soothe your nerves. Oh, all right. Oh, oh nasty stuff. Now lie down in your bed. That's it. Just a few moments now, and you'll be drifting off to slumberland, my beautiful sister. Oh, it is quick, isn't it? Feels drowsy already. You do? And you must give in to the feeling, you hear? Don't fight it. It feels so queer. As if though I were on a boat. A little boat. Rose? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Helen, I hear you. You seem such a long ways away. Such a long way. Rose, you're to come to me when I call you. Do you hear? Yeah. You're to sleep for a while. Then when I call, no matter where I yeah. am, you're to come to me. Yes, I'll come to you. I'll... She's asleep. Chadwin's drug is working. The rain! Come. Well, let it rain. Yes, let the skies open and drench the earth. Let the rain fall like a curtain, like a cloak to hide the rebirth of Helen Vaughn. Leaving your sister Rose in a slumber so deep, it was almost death-like. Helen Vaughn hurried to her room. There she wrote a note addressed to Rose and Leonard, explaining that she had decided suddenly to go off by herself on a trip to Mexico, and that they would probably not hear from her for some time. And she put on her hat and coat and slipped out. All day she waited in a hotel. Then when night came, she picked up Chad with the break in a rented car and drove him through the storm into a spot well outside the city, where she turned into an ancient cemetery. There she brought the car to a stop before a low building of white marble over which ivy and moss had grown for many years. With a heavy key, she opened the massive padlock, and they entered, shutting the door behind them. The air in this old mausoleum is the dank odor of a charnel house. Where else could the living lie asleep, peaceful and undisturbed, as safely as here among the sleeping dead? No, I will not go through with you it. You already have your money. You can not back out now. Then in heaven's name, let us be finished quickly. Quickly, yes. The storm should hide the car from the cemetery guards, but we must take no chances. Now, here's a flashlight I brought. I'll turn it on. Look there, Chadwin, at the tiers of compartments this tiny stone building holds. Each compartment with its iron door, each holding within it a coffin in which lies the dust of a vault. I see them, yes. Twelve of them. This one, here on the bottom, is empty. Meant someday to hold the body of Helen Vaughan. Tonight it shall receive her. No, no, this is madness. I'll open it. There. See that narrow, dark compartment? Small, so quiet, so restful, so safe from disturbance. In it, for the next ten days, shall rest my body, holding the soul of my sister Rose. No, no, there must be some other way. None that is safe. While my body sleeps and I am absent from it, it must be where no one can find it. And here, no one ever will. I do not like it. Hold the light. I'll slide into it. Quite roomy enough. The stone is chilly, but what matters that to one who is asleep? Go in. Go on. Rose Vaughan, hear me. 
Enter the body that awaits you here. Enter quickly and wait. I must have been dreaming. Rose, Rose, what's happened to you? Why, your voice sounds just like Helen's. Really, Leonard? That's odd. Perhaps I'm catching a cold. No, no. Now you, you sound like yourself again. But for a moment, I'd, I'd have sworn it was Helen speaking. Uh, I guess I've been so worried, I'm, I'm just imagining things. Oh, Leonard, hold me close. Close, darling, close. Always, Rose, always. Always, yes, always. She'll never have you back. Never. What What are you saying, Rose? I was just thinking of how much I love you. So much that I'll never let anything take you away from me. Never. In the days that followed, Leonard found his beautiful wife, Rose, is strangely changed. You... You've been different somehow these last ten days. In fact, ever since Helen went away so unexpectedly. Have I, Leonard? How? Well, you've been gayer. More headstrong, too. It's almost as if you'd acquired a whole new character. Well, perhaps I have. And how do you like this new wife of yours? Well, I do, and I... Don't? Oh, please, I, I don't mean it. It's just that... Well, I was so in love with the old Rose, it's a little hard to get used to the new... And all these bills that you're running up. Why, that's not like the rose you used to be. Oh, Leonard. I do hope you're not too mad at me because... Well, what is it this time? Another fur coat? <laughs> Worse than that. We're going to give a party. Another? Why, there's three in ten days. Rose, I forbid it. You can't, Leonard. Because I've invited everybody already. Rose, it's so unlike you. You used... Why, you act more like Helen than like yourself these days. Never mind, darling. You'll get used to the change in me, in time. Ignoring her husband's displeasure, Rose, or should I say, Helen, went ahead with her plans for a party that night. And when early in the evening, a small gray-haired man presented himself at the door and asked for a... He sent word by Bessie that she would not see him. I'm sorry, Mr. Chadwin. Uh, Mrs. Tabor says she cannot see you. Um, she says she does not know anyone named Chadwin. But she does. Uh, ten days ago I was here. I gave you an envelope for her. It had a key in it. Oh, surely you remember? Yes, but just the same, she says she doesn't know you. Now, please go, or I'll have to call an officer. Did you tell her what I said? This was the tenth day? Yes, and she said she had no idea what you were talking about. All right, I'm going. I must do what I can by myself. And while the 
gay party went on. Miles away in the old cemetery, Chadwin the Great worked frantically with a hammer and chisel to force the padlock on the door of the mausoleum in which, unknown to the world, a sleeping girl lay hidden. Look! Got to get it open! Won't let me into our house! Don't even talk to me! Won't let me warn her! She wa- What is that? Dog's coming this way! Hey, yeah. Somebody's trying to break into the barn, Marshal Beard. The guards. I must run for it. Look out, he's getting away. Hey, you great brother. Here, <laughs> They missed me. Got to get back to town. I must warn her. She's got to know. <laughs> Miss Vaughan. Thank heaven this time you heeded my message. I won't have you coming around to my house this way, do you hear? You must never come here again. But you do not understand. The ten days is up tonight, now. Your time is over. Are you trying to scare me, Chadwin? To get more money from me? Money? No, I'm just trying to tell you. It was understood ten days only. More is not allowed. You fool! Do you think I ever intended to give up Rose's body once I had it? In that narrow crypt in the tightly locked mausoleum... My body has long since died from lack of air. And Rose has died with it. But I remain alive. So, that is what you planned. I should have guessed. But it is not so. Your body is not dead. It is in a sleep so deep that it scarcely breathes. Needs no food, no water. But sometime tonight the dog will wear off and your sister Rose will claim her body again while you, you, Helen Vaughan, will wake to find yourself locked within a burial crypt. No. No, it's not true. It is true. And you will not be asleep. You will be awake, needing air. And there will be no air. You're just trying to frighten me. Tonight I tried to open the tomb to save you. I was driven away by guards with dogs. But what can I do? Only if we can reach the tomb in time to open it, can you be saved? We must go now. I'll get the key, and we must hurry. Hurry! There's the most lame, Miss Vaughan. Pray heaven the guards are not waiting. They won't be. We fool them by leaving the car outside and walking up this back path. Now hurry, Chip. What is it, Miss Vaughan? I, I don't know. For a moment, I... I'm so dizzy. So weak. It's Rose trying to return to her body. We cannot waste an instant. Hold me up. Something is pulling at me, tugging at me. Darling, where are you? She is speaking through her own lips. No. No, not yet. Go back, you hear me, Rose? Go back. Here's the mausoleum. The key. Give me the key. Here it is. Quickly. She's pushing at me so hard. No. Oh, Helen, help me. Everything is so dark. Oh, Where are you? Go back. Go back, I say. Chadwin, have you got the lock on? Okay? It won't unlock. It must. They put a new padlock on. Oh, dear heavens, they've changed the lock. Helen, help no. Me. No. It's getting dark. Dark. It's hopeless. We cannot enter. Helen, where are you? No. We can't both be in the same body. Go back. Helen, I'm frightened. Don't force me out. Help me. Go back Helen. where you were. Help me. Wait, Rose, wait. Help me. Helen. Helen. No. No, don't. Rose, you mustn't. You mustn't. The guards, they're coming back. Helen, where am I? What happened to me? Sleep, child. Sleep a little longer. And wake without memory. For her with it, I can do nothing now. And the guards, they must not catch me. They must not catch me. Here he is. We've got him this time. A holy catch. It's a girl. It's Mrs. Taylor. Asleep on the steps of her own family mausoleum. Say, we got to get her out of here. Help me lift her yeah. out. Hey, wait. Did you hear something then? Like somebody calling a long ways off? Listen. <laughs> Anything? No, I can't hear anything. Just the wind. Come on, we got to phone Miss Tabor's husband. She may be sick. 
Come on now, no time to lose. About a man named Chadwin? Chadwin? No, I don't, Leonard. Well, Bessie says he called several times last week to see you. The last time was the night of the party. You're sure you don't remember him? Uh, no, Leonard. I, I'm sorry, oh, but... Oh, it's all right, darling. I just thought maybe you might have begun to remember some of the things that, that happened during those ten days when you, well, weren't yourself. It's so strange. As if my mind had been asleep the whole time. Is there something about Chadwin in the paper? He committed suicide last night. Oh. His body was found near the old family mausoleum. He left a mysterious note saying he was paying for some transgression. How strange. I wondered if he could have given us any clue as to... as to how you came to leave the party so suddenly that night and drive to the cemetery. Oh, but... It's all over now and not worth worrying about. I I'd remember if I could, but when I try, I, I become suddenly frightened and, and feel as if I were locked in in some dark, tiny space where I can't breathe. All right now, darling, all right. Let's forget the whole thing. Now, let's see what came in the morning mail. Maybe there's a letter from Helen. You know, it's high time we were hearing from her. She's really not acting much like a sister being lost along without even writing a letter just know where she is. the mysterious traveler again. I'm afraid Leonard and Rose are going to have to wait a long time for a letter from Helen. In fact, I'll be very much surprised if they ever get one. I suppose it'll never occur to them to look in the old mausoleum. In fact, uh, since they both feel a distinct aversion to going near it, it may never be opened again. But I don't suppose that'll make much difference to Helen. <laughs> uh, now. Now, if you were wishing uh, you could step into somebody else's shoes, maybe what happened to Helen will make you change your mind. You know, I knew a man once who... He, he stole somebody else's body. Only to discover when it was too late that he... Oh, you're getting off here? Well, perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard Chapter 55 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's story, They Who Sleep, Philip Clark played Chadwin, Gertrude Warner played Helen, and Helen Clare played Rose. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Original music is played by Henry Silverne, and the entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Listen next week to a tale titled... Escape through time. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. Mysterious Traveler.
This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Are we going to join Charles Foster as he takes an excursion into crime? I call the story The Case of Charles Foster. Late one evening several years ago, when I was practicing medicine in a large eastern city, I visited Charles Foster, a friend and patient of mine. I took with me Flush, a cocker spaniel he had entrusted to me. Hello, Doctor. Glad you were able to come. I see you brought Flush. Hello, Flush, old boy. He's missed you, Charles. I've missed him too, Doctor. Been quite lonesome without him these past few months. Ah, down, boy. It's a good dog. How do you feel, Charles? Oh, I'm all right, Doctor. You needn't worry about me. I'm glad to hear that. I suppose you've been quite puzzled about everything that's happened these past months. Frankly, Charles, I have. Even now, I find it difficult to believe that you... Could... Doctor, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anyone. I thought I'd go to the grave with my secret, but... You know, we've always been friends, and I'd like you to know the truth. As you wish, Charles. It's strange how little people know of one another. For ten years, Agatha and I were married, and to the outside world, we were a happily married couple. But in the privacy of our home, I found life with Agatha a nightmare. I never would have guessed that. For ten years, I stood her sharp tongue and constant nagging. I might have gone on taking it the rest of my life. Fate hadn't decreed otherwise. It was three years ago on a beautiful spring evening that fate stepped in to change the entire course of my life. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Did you remember to buy me some more of my cough medicine? Yes, here it is. Supper ready? Some men would be more interested in their wives' health than their own suppers. I'm sorry, Agatha, but you really don't look sick to me. That's because you don't care. I'm not well, and you know it. I work myself to death day in and day out keeping this house clean. And little thanks do I get for I've it. I told you before, Agatha, if the house is too much for you, hire a maid. And how exactly can we afford a maid on your miserable bookkeeper's salary? Well, if you can't manage it out of my salary, there's always the $50,000 your father left you. That money is mine, and I'm not spending a single cent of it. It's up to you to provide a maid. All right, Agatha. Please, let's not quarrel. Oh, hello, Flush. How are you, old boy? Oh, you care more about that dog than you do me. You know that isn't true. It is. Sometimes I think the only reason you come home is because of that dirty old dog. Quiet, Get away from me. All he does is eat and put his filthy paws on my furniture. I want you to get rid of that dog, Charles. Get rid of him? Yes. Buy some poison at the drugstore and dispose of him. You can't stand to see me have anything that makes me happy, can you? Well, I'm not getting rid of him. Charles, this is my house, not yours. And I don't want him here. Come on, Flush. No, oh, don't think that by walking away that ends the matter, Charles Foster. You'd better get rid of that dog, do you hear? Glad to get out of the house, eh, old boy? Yeah, so am I. Oh, it's a beautiful evening, isn't it? Come on, boy, we're going to take a long walk. Want to turn around and go home now, Flush? <coughs> no, neither do I. Pardon me, but aren't you Charles? Julia! Julia Sanders! Uh, Charles, I thought it was you. Oh, let me look at you. Oh, Julia, you haven't changed a bit. You're as lovely as... How long has it been since we last saw each other? Ten years, almost eleven. Has it really been that long? Julia... Have you ever forgiven me for what happened? Oh, of course, Charles. I was so insanely in love with you, Julia, that I couldn't bear to have other men look at you. You, you know that I didn't I mean... I know, to... Charles. I've thought of that night constantly. It's been like a nightmare ever since. Please, Charles, it's all past and forgotten now. You were perfectly justified in breaking our engagement. After what I'd done, there was nothing else you could do. I understand you married Agatha Winthrop a year after I'd gone abroad. 
Yes, Julia. After you left for Europe, people kept telling me what a wonderful wife Agatha would make me. I allowed myself to be convinced and married her. Well, I'm sure everything turned out for the best. Oh, but it didn't, Julia. Almost from the beginning, our marriage was a failure. For these past five years, Agatha and I have merely been living together under the same roof. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles, that it didn't turn out well. Nothing turned out well, Junior, after I lost you. I hope things have been better with you these past 11 years. Oh, I can't complain. I spent a number of years in Paris studying art and working at dress designing. Oh. I only came back a few months ago. You've uh, never married? No. I'm working now for Morgan's Department Store as their art director. Oh, really? Well, my, my office is only a few blocks from there. Look, Julia, why don't we have lunch together tomorrow? There are so many things I'd like to know. Well, I'd like to, Charles, but I think it would be much better that we don't. Oh, now, surely, Julia, there's no harm in two old friends having lunch together, is there? No, I suppose not. I won't take no for an answer. Do you know where Drake's restaurant is? Yes. Will one o'clock tomorrow be all right? Yes, that's my usual lunch hour. Good, then it's a date. Strange, isn't it, Doctor? The way after 11 years, Julia and I bumped into each other. If we hadn't, what followed would never have happened. It's such small things as an accidental meeting that often change the course of one's life. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't then. I met Junior for lunch the next day, and soon we were having lunch together every day. Mm. And for the first time in years, life began to mean something. Merely seeing Julia for one hour a day made life worth living. I understand, sir. We'd have lunch together, and then we'd go for a walk in the park. I sensed at the time that Julia, too, was lonely and in the need of friendship. The summer passed swiftly and happily. I should have realized that things couldn't go on that way, but I didn't. You mean you fell in love with Julia? Fell in love with her? I don't think I'd ever really stopped loving her. I became aware of how much I really cared for her one warm autumn day as we were walking through the park together. Julia? Yes, Charles? What about going to the theater with me tonight? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked me, Charles. Why? Because it means we can't go on seeing each other anymore. But why shouldn't we go on seeing each other? Because you aren't satisfied any longer just to see me at lunch. and It isn't right for us to go out together at night. But surely there's no harm in our going to the theater together. You're married, Charles. That's reason enough. All right, Julia. Forget I ever asked you. But at least we can go on having lunch together, can't we? No, Charles. Oh, but... Can't you see? Things can never be the way they were. We've become dependent upon each other, and we have no right to be... We can't go on seeing each other any longer. It isn't fair to Agatha. But you know that Agatha and I mean nothing to each other. We haven't for years. Nevertheless, she's your wife. Julia, you, you know I love you. I've always loved you, and I can't do without you. Charles, you're just making it difficult for both of us. Julia, you do love me, don't you? Yes. But can't you see? It's no use. I remember Agatha only too well. She'd never give you a divorce. I know she won't. I've asked her a dozen times in the past five years, but she said she'll never give me one. I want to part now, Charles. Right here. Must we? Yes. Goodbye, Charles. My life seemed to end that day, Doctor, with our parting. I went through the motions of living, but nothing seemed to matter any longer. I can well understand that. Uh, months went by. Every day after work, I stayed in town, unable to face an evening at home with Agatha. When I did arrive home late at night, she'd be waiting for me. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. I'm sorry if I woke you. Now, lock you care. Coming in night after night at all hours, leaving me alone in this big house. Oh, don't think I don't know what you're up to. I know your kind, Charles Foster. You better go to sleep, Agatha. A fine chance I have to sleep with you putting on the bathroom light. You know I can't sleep when that light's on. Take me a minute to brush my teeth, then I'll turn off the light. Agatha. 
Well, what is it now? What's this bottle of prussic acid doing in the medicine chest? That's a deadly poison. I know that. I got it from Mrs. Smedley, the druggist's wife. She used it to get rid of an old cat they had. When I told her about flush, she said it What's was a thing... What's that about flush? I said Mrs. Smedley gave me that bottle of prussic acid so I could get rid of flush. I'm going to put him out of his misery tomorrow. You'll do no such thing, you hear? If you so much as lay a hand on flush, I'll kill you. I'll kill you, do you understand? Yes. Yes, Charles. You get rid of that poison tomorrow. Let's have no more talk of putting flush out of his misery. I lay awake for hours, Doctor, unable to fall asleep. Julia's breaking off with me and my wife's refusal to give me a divorce. And the prussic acid she meant to poison flush with had left me all worked up. Then Agatha began coughing. That cough she'd cultivated for years to give people the impression that she was an invalid. Well, after she'd coughed her usual five minutes or so, she got out of bed and started for the bathroom where she kept her cough medicine. Oh, slap that chair. Why don't you turn on the light so you can see where you're going? I can see perfectly well where I'm going. Besides, on your salary, we can't afford to waste electricity. I knew there wasn't any use in saying anything more. For years, Agatha had gotten up every night and groped her way to the medicine chest where her cough medicine was. Nothing could make her change her habits. I lay in bed listening as she opened the medicine chest and fumbled in the corner where she always kept the bottle. As I heard her groping for her medicine, I suddenly thought of the bottle that was standing next to it. The bottle of prussic acid. Without thinking, it came to mind. If only she'd take the prussic acid instead of the cough medicine. If she did, I would be free. Free of her constant nagging and whining. Free to see Julia. Then I knew it was useless to hope for such a mistake to happen. Agatha's cough medicine always stood in the same corner of the medicine chest. Even in the dark, she'd never take the bottle of prussic acid. And then, then it came to me. What if the bottles were to be switched? What if the following night the prussic acid were placed in the customary spot of the cough medicine? Suddenly it was all very clear to me what I was going to do. Agatha? <laughs> well? Agatha, I've been thinking over what you said about flush. What? I suppose you're right. Flush should be disposed of. He certainly should. He's old and he's smelly. It'll be a blessing for him to be put out of his misery. Yes. Of course. I, I'm sorry I shouted at you before, Agatha, but, well, I see now that you're right. Hmm. When are you going to do it? Oh, we'll wait until Saturday. And none too soon, either. Uh, you're sure the prussic acid won't make him suffer? Nonsense. Of course it won't. Mrs. Smedley said nothing worked faster than prussic acid. Oh, you told her what it was for. Uh, that's fine. Very well, Agatha. Just leave everything to me. <laughs> Next night, Doctor, after Agatha was in bed, I quietly stole into the bathroom and opened the medicine chest. I compared the bottle of cough medicine with that of the prussic acid. They were both small bottles, almost identical in size. I removed the cough medicine from where it stood in the corner of the chest and replaced it with the poison. Then I went to bed and waited impatiently for Agatha to start coughing. <laughs> Can I get you a glass of water or something, Agatha? <coughs> water won't do any good. What I need is my cough medicine. <coughs> oh, that's that chair. Why don't you turn on the light? <laughs> because I can see perfectly in the dark. Besides, someone's got to economize on the electricity in this house. I lay there in the darkness, <coughs> listening to her grumble as she opened the door of the medicine chest. The blow pounded in my ears as I heard her fumbling into the bottle. Would she feel the slight difference in the bottle when she picked it up? <coughs> Scarcely able to breathe, I waited. Listened. And she fell to the floor. I quickly got out of bed, turned on the lights, and went into the bathroom. She was lying on the floor, quite dead. There was an agonized look on her face. I returned the bottle of cough medicine to its proper place, and then I phoned the police. <laughs> Now, you say, Mr. Foster, that your wife was in the habit of going every night to the medicine chest for a few drops of her cough medicine. Yes, that's right. And she never turned on the lights when she went to the medicine chest. Oh, no, sir. 
Wasn't that a bit unusual? Well, I always used to tell her to turn on the lights, but she said it was a waste of electricity. I see. And you say your wife... It was her who placed the bottle of prussic acid in the medicine chest next to her cough medicine, eh? Yes, sir. I I'd never touched the bottle of prussic acid. You see, it was my wife who procured it, and she... Yes, yes, Mr. Smedley, the druggist has testified that his wife gave it to your wife. Mr. Foster, are you familiar with the contents of your wife's will dated ten years ago? I, uh, yes, I am. Then you know, of course, that your wife left her entire estate to the home for the aged. Home for the aged? Oh, yes, yes. I fought to keep my face expressionless to prevent him from learning that I hadn't known. All the years we'd been married, Agatha had given me to understand that all her money would go to me. Now I knew that she'd been lying. Her will had been made out in favor of the home for the aged for years. I began to feel angry at the way she'd cheated me. But a moment later, I was grateful that she had. Frankly, Mr. Foster, your wife's death occurred under very suspicious circumstances, to say the least. For years, she'd gone to the medicine chest every night without mishap. And yet, on the second night that there was a bottle of prussic acid in the chest, she met her death. Were it not for the fact that your wife had left her entire estate to the home for the aged, I might be inclined to go further with this investigation. As it is, I'll instruct the coroner's jury to bring in a verdict of death through accident. That's all, Mr. Foster. I walked out of the district attorney's office a free man. A few days later, I moved out of the house which had been Agatha's and took up quarters elsewhere. Six long and uneventful months passed. I made no effort to contact Julia for fear that the police might still have their suspicions. And then I could stand it no longer. I... I called on her. Charles, Charles, when I told you were waiting to see me, I could hardly believe it. I'm so glad to see you again. Thank you, Julia. It's good to see you again, too. Charles, you don't look well at all. Well, these past few months have been something of a strain, Julia, but I'm all right now. I was tempted so many times to get in touch with you. Then I thought perhaps you didn't want to see anyone. Well, I did want to see you, Julia. But I was afraid it wouldn't look right. I understand, Charles. Now, let's not say anything more of the past. Only the present and the future. Julia, do you think we might try to pick up where we left off last autumn? We can try, Charles. Julia and I, Doctor, began to see each other night after night. Life for me became exciting and wonderful the way it had been 11 years ago before Julia and I had broken our engagement. Didn't you ever stop to think of what you'd done? You mean Agatha? Yes. No, Doctor. They say that a murderer is ever haunted by his crime. But that isn't true. Hmm. At least it wasn't in my case. To me, Agatha was part of another life in the dim past. I rarely thought of the past, only the present and the future. Now, if I had any fears at all, it was the fear that something would spoil the happiness that Julia and I had found together. But nothing did. And a few months later, we were married with you as my best man. Yes, I remember. And my second marriage was everything that my first hadn't been. For the first time in my life, I knew what true happiness meant. Julia and I were poor, but that didn't matter. For we had each other. The months swiftly passed. And as our first anniversary approached, it was hard to believe that we'd been married almost a year. Charles, before you leave for work, will you sign a check for me? Oh, who's it for, dear? Never you mind, Mr. Foster. You just leave a signed check. I'll fill in the amount and the party it's meant for. Mrs. Foster, you're acting very mysterious. Well, wife has a right to act mysterious once a year. <laughs> Darling, I suspect you're going to use this check to buy me an anniversary present. Well, whatever you get me, please don't make it neckties. Well, I'll have you know I have very good taste in neckties. I know you do, dear, but I have to wear them. You're an ungrateful <laughs> wretch. Very well, I won't get you tied. Good, then I'll sign the check for you. And please bear in mind that you can't make this check out for more than $312.50. That's all we have in the bank. Oh, I'll leave you at least the 50 cents. You'd better leave a good deal more. Uh, we won't be going up to Lake Ellis. Charles, are we going up to Lake Ellis? Oh, it slipped out. 
And I meant it as an anniversary surprise. Oh, Job, that's wonderful. When are we going? This Friday afternoon. I've rented a cabin and a small motorboat on Lake Ellis for the weekend. Oh, darling, what an exciting surprise. Charles, you're sure it won't be too expensive? Why, nothing can be too expensive for our first anniversary. Oh, <laughs> darling, I've never been so happy. <laughs> This looks like a nice place to fish. Oh, gee, where'd I put that bait? Here it is, dear. Thanks, darling. Uh-huh. Ah, here's a nice, fat, dimpled worm. <laughs> well, if you can't stand to see me bait, I'm just turn the other way. That's it. only take me a minute. Charles, look. Yes, where'd I get this? There's smoke coming out of the engine hatch. What's that? Yes, you're right. It's on fire. There are flames shooting out. Fire extinguishers at the other end of the boat. Charles, you'd never make it. You'd be burned. Yes, you're right. Besides, even the extinguisher wouldn't do much good now. The fire's too big. What are we going to do? Oh, the heat, it's becoming unbearable. There's only one thing we can do, Julia. That's go over the side. We're almost in the center of the lake. I can't swim. But I can, dear. I'll manage to keep us above water somehow. Well, all right, darling. I'll do whatever you say. You'll come through this, Julia. Now, don't be afraid. Now, I'll slip over the side of the boat first, and you follow. All right. Now, hurry, Julia. Let yourself down into the water. I'll keep you afloat. Yes, Charles. Ah, that's it. Now, let go of the side of the boat. I have you. Yes, Charles. Now, don't be afraid, darling. You see? It's no trouble keeping you above water. Now, now just relax, dear, while I swim with you a bit. We've got to get a good distance from the boat. It may explode. Yes, Charles. Do you see any boats, Rob? No, but someone's bound to see the fire and come to our rescue. Until they do, we must have courage. Aren't you, Charles? No. Now, don't worry, dear. I can keep us afloat for a long time yet. Oh, why doesn't someone come to our rescue? They will. Someone must surely have seen that boat burning. But, Charles, we've been in the water so long. Oh, it just seems long, darling. It can't be more than ten minutes. Ten minutes? It feels more like... Charles! I've got you, Jimmy. Just for a moment, you, you slipped away from me. Oh, darling, it's no use. I'm just a millstone around your neck. What, what are you saying? Why should we both drown? Charles, save yourself. Save myself? Yes. I want you to let go of me. Let go of you? No. No, never. Yes, you must. You're too tired to keep going. No. no, darling. Either we're both saved... Oh, we're both drowned. Oh, I won't have you throw your life away. Let go of me. Julia, Julia, stop trying to break loose. Julia, darling, don't. I can't live without you. Julia, stop struggling. Julia! Help! Help my wife! My wife! She... Yeah, yeah, we saw it all. Hey, Mike, he's passed out. Get him before he goes under. Yeah. Uh, I got him. Hey, help me get him aboard, Skipper. All right, all right. Uh, Any sign of his wife? Uh, she's gone, Skipper. Yeah, too bad. Well, if it's the last thing I do, I aim to see justice done to this fella. She never had a chance. Did you see him shove her under? It was murder, that's what it was. Mr. Foster, both of the men who rescued you claim that as they approached you and your late wife in their boat, they saw you struggling with her. You admit this? Yes. Yes, but I tell you, I was trying to save her, not drown her. No, you were trying to save her. But both the witnesses testified they saw you push her head under. They're wrong. I wasn't pushing her under. I was trying to bring her to the surface. You must believe me. Oh, Mr. Foster. You maintain that you were rescuing your wife. Not drowning her. Yes. Is it true, Mr. Foster, that you were engaged to your wife 11 years ago and that she broke the engagement? Yes, that's true. Would you mind telling the jury why she broke the engagement? 
We... We had a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding? Do you call shooting the woman you're engaged to just a misunderstanding? Oh, no. You must let me explain. It's true that 11 years ago I did shoot Julia, but I've been drinking. I didn't know what Mr. I was doing. Mr. Foster, you do admit shooting and wounding her. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen this before? Why, yes. That's the insurance policy I took out for Julia and myself. Exactly. And when was this policy taken out? Well, about a month ago. June 15th, to be exact. And what's the value of this policy, Mr. Forster? Well, if either my wife or myself died, it provided $10,000 for the survivor. Yes, Mr. Forster. If either you or your wife died a natural death, it provided $10,000 to the survivor. But there's also a double indemnity clause in this policy, isn't there? Yes, but I... One that provides you with $20,000 if your wife died an accidental death. Such as drowning. Yes, that's true, but I swear I didn't drown my wife. I tell you, I was trying to save her. Save her, not drown her. You must believe me. You must... And that, Doctor, is exactly the way everything happened. Strange, isn't it? The way justice works itself out. I committed murder and escaped punishment. Now I'm paying with my life for the death of the one person I really loved. It's time to go, Foster. All right, Warden. Goodbye, Doctor. And take good care of Flush, will you? Of course, Charles. Goodbye. All right, Warden. I'm ready. Let's go. Traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? Too bad about Charles Foster, wasn't it? As he was strapped into the electric chair, there was an ironic smile on his lips. For he was being executed for something he had not done. But as Charles himself said, justice has a strange way of working itself out. I knew another man once who thought it would be a simple thing to dispose of his wife. Uh, unfortunately, he... Uh... Oh, you're getting off here? I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard Chapter 64 of The Mysterious Traveler a series of dramas of the strange and the terrifying. In tonight's story, the case of Charles Foster, Humphrey Davis played Charles Foster, Nancy Sheridan played Julia, and Joan Shea played Agatha. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silverne. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled Blood Money. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. <laughs>
We're going down into the dark and fearsome depths of the sea to watch fate settle her account with the arch enemy of mankind. In a story I call Death Comes for Adolf Hitler. My story begins in the radio room of the American destroyer Spindrift on patrol duty somewhere in the Atlantic. It is late at night. Chief radio man Mike Williams, headphones over his ears, is checking on the dozens of messages whispering through the ether. Beside Mike is relief man Joe Norman, sitting back with his feet up, working a crossword puzzle and mournfully hugging to himself. Cut it, Joe, cut it. I'm getting something. You can just barely hear it. Something for us, Joe? Shh, wait. I'm getting it stronger now. There, it's clearer. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, hey, what is it? It's a German sub. On the bottom and calling for help. Uh-uh. Ain't that something? Shall I notify the skipper? No, oh, no, nothing we can do. Must be hundreds of miles away. Get a pencil on. Put on those headphones. We'll take down the message, whatever it is. Okay, I got a pencil here. Oh, that's the phone, is that it? Are you kidding me? I can't hear a thing. Of course I'm not kidding. I tell you, I had it just now, then I trade it out. Wait a minute. It's coming back in again. Hello? Hello? This is our Lieutenant Reiner, the undersea board wolf. Listen to me. Anybody who may be picking up this message, please listen to me. There's nothing anybody can do to help us, but please listen anyway. Makes it easier if I can talk. Easier to face what is coming. Because we are we are doomed. And we know it. Only yesterday afternoon as we were cruising on the surface, recharging our batteries, we thought our mission was as good as accomplished. I was up on the conning tower with Captain Metz. Metz was our passenger. Our very special passenger who called himself Herr Schmidt. Of course, that was not his name, and we all know who he was. A beautiful day, Herr Captain. Particularly gratifying after our long submersion. Yes, Your Excellency. Uh, pardon me, Herr Schmidt. But we could take no chances on surfacing until we were safely past the area of Allied patrols. Of course not, Captain Metz. You must not take the slightest risk. As long as I am aboard. I am aware of that. Do not worry. You will reach your destination safely. I estimate that tomorrow midnight we will take our contact with the South American coast. And our journey will be over. Good. Understand, Herr Captain? No word of this trip must ever be breathed to the world, or yourself, or any other member of your crew. It is understood. You may rest assured. My crew is well trained. The world must not know or guess. The pack of the fatherland, this is a double who rules. We have lost. But I shall yet win. It would be disloyal of me to believe anything else, Herr Schmidt. In South America, he will make my plan. The world will think me dead. Suicide. And the day Germany falls. But instead, I will be safely hidden. So I can direct our rebirth. Quite so. Our enemies will yet feel the might of my vengeance. I will return to lead my people to victory. However long it may take. Of course, Herr Schmidt. I suppose three points off the start of battle. Lifeboat, three points to start it. Pitching and tossing on the waves ahead of us was a lifeboat. It was crowded with gaunt faced, bearded men who watched us pull alongside with hostile eyes. A dozen yards from them, Captain Metz ordered the engine to stop. And then, as our passenger looked on, his cloak pulled up to conceal his face, Captain Metz questioned the men in the lifeboat. You're on the lifeboat. Who is in charge? I am blessed to us. What is your name? What ship? What cargo did you carry? What port were you cleared for? Captain Peter Jensen of the Mountain. Now that you sir. We were a relief ship carrying food and medical supplies to Greece when one of your murdering undersea dogs torpedoed us. That is all, Captain Jensen. You may pull away now. The nearest land is 300 miles due west of you. I will pull away. Pull, men. 
Let's get where we can breathe air not contaminated by this scum. And then, just as the light boat started to pull away, the wind unexpectedly whipped aside the cloak that our passenger was using to conceal his face. And in the light boat, Captain Peter Jensen, a burly giant of a man, recognized him. Man! Stop! Stop! You see that slinking rat in the ship of a man trying to hide his face? You know who that is? Take a good look at him so you can tell your children you've seen the murderer of mankind himself. The arch devil who really gave the orders that sent our comrades to the bottom. I fear you have been recognized, Herr Schmidt. Stop them! Turn your guns on them! The spy they will take evidence! No one must leave the report having seen me! Very well, Herr Schmidt. Four guns, a pistol fire! Four guns, ready to fire! Give them two arms! Four guns! Hey, oh, my God. Hey, oh. You filthy murdering dog! So you're going to murder us too? You, you that on the bridge, listen to me! Every one of us will be waiting for you when your time comes! All of us think you hounds and jackals of murders! We'll be waiting for you, every one of us! We'll be waiting for you, and someday we'll get you! Remember that? Someday we'll catch you. Ah. They are gone? Yes, we have finished them. There will be no eyewitnesses for fellows seeing you aboard a submarine in these waters, Herr Schmidt. That's good. Well, let's never know that I have left Germany. Let's never guess the whole future, the fatherland. What is that sound? Bomber. Patrol bomber coming this way. Get the north run. We are going to the mud. We made a crash dive into the depths of the ocean. A few bombs exploded, but far away. Patrol planes were too late. Kept the men gave the necessary orders while our illustrious passenger looked on. His face pale. Drops of sweat on his brow. What is our death now, Muller? 75 feet, sir. Good. Then we should. The bombs! They're coming closer! No, oh, they have lost us. They are bombing at random now. Yes, yeah, they are safe now. Death, Muller. 90 feet, sir. 90 is good enough. Level her. Level her, sir. We will take course 180 and... No, I said. We are still making a five-degree drive. The leveling planes do not respond, sir. We are damaged. The bombs have damaged them. Impossible. Not one of those bombs was close enough to break an egg. Well, uh, our depth. A hundred feet, sir. Leuton Rider, order half speed ahead. Half speed ahead? The ship's the hand operation of the diving plane. Hand operation of the diving plane, sir. Now level her. Uh, level her, sir. Uh, uh, well? What's the matter? It's uh, the operating wheel. You're a turn. They're not turning. Diving plates must be jammed, sir. Uh, they will not move. Not at all. Captain, I'm I demand that you hide to the surface. Something is wrong. Am I safe? I am. I am captain of this vessel, and I am giving the orders. Hey, well, the leveling planes are jammed. We will surface and clear them. Miller, step. 120 feet, sir. Stop, Major. Load the forward ballast tanks. Load the forward ballast tanks, sir. Now our bow is coming up. They are leveling off, sir. Hold on, she is. Hold on, she is, sir. Muller. Yo, Muller. How fast are we going up? We, we are not rising at all, sir. Not rising? No. <laughs> With the motors off, we must be. We should be. But we are still descending at about 20 feet a minute, Captain. Captain, I demand to know what's wrong. I order you, take me to the surface. I am just as interested in reaching the surface as you are here, Schmidt. Blow the main ballast tank until we start to rise. Blow the main ballast tank until we start to rise. For one hour, it struggles to reach the surface, but without success. It still continued settling to the bottom. It was unreal. Unbelievable, it became possible. We 
Destroyer, two of them. I just picked them up on the phone. They seem to be circling us. There is the motor. Stop all pumps. Destroyer, eh? Lightman Reiner. Yes, sir. What depth does the chart show? Depth? Fifty fathoms with the gravel bottom, sir. But there's a fault in the ocean bed just east of our position. A credit. One thousand feet deep, sir. We are safely beyond that. Mother, our depth. Two hundred feet, sir. Our rate of descent. Ten feet a minute, sir. But our main tanks are empty, sir. We should be going up, not down. Nevertheless, we are going down. And as long as we are, we will bottom and lie quiet until the destroyers leave. And we will surface for repairs. Mother. Yes. What are the destroyers doing? They seem to be still circling, sir. Perhaps they are trying to pick us up when they are detectors. We must see that they fail. Our depth? 220 feet, sir. It, it's almost as if... As if what? Uh, nothing, sir. Go on. As if what? Excuse me, sir. I was going to say as if something was pulling us down. Ah, but you thought better of saying it. Yeah. See that you continue to think better of such remarks. The same applies to everyone on board. Lieutenant Reiner. Yes, sir. We will bottom in exactly seven minutes. Prepare to make an inspection of the ship when we do. <laughs> I have finished the inspection, sir. And your report? Everything is in perfect order, sir. There are no leaks. The batteries are fully charged. All motors in working order. All pumps operating. And obviously, there's no reason why, when we choose to surface, we should not do so. No, sir. Miller, yes, what about the bloodhounds who are trying to sniff us out on the surface? Those destroyers. I have heard no propeller sound for 20 minutes, sir. Then we will surface. Load your zero tanks. Load your zero tanks, sir. Tanks are empty, sir. All tanks empty? Uh, Captain, your pardon, do you hear? They have blown all our tanks and they have not risen at all. I am well aware of it, Lieutenant Reiner. You take me for an imbecile? No, sir. Of course not, sir. It is so that it is. It, it is impossible, sir. Since it is so, it must be possible. Obviously, we are stuck in a mud bottom. But the bottom here is gravel, sir. The chart? Yes, so. The chart is wrong. I say it is mud, do you hear? Yes, sir. Mud, sir. And so we shall have to use our motors to pull ourselves free. Signal full speed ahead. Yes, sir. Full speed ahead. They are not moving, sir. Now, what is it? Why have the fools cut the motors? Uh, excuse me, sir. Engine room reporting. Yes. What is it? Ah. Ah. Well, what have the idiots to say for themselves? They say the propeller is fouled. Fouled? How could it be foul? It is impossible for it to become foul on this bottom. Yes, sir. They say it is not entirely foul. It, it will turn, but only very slowly. As, as if... As if what? Well, sir, they say it turns as if, as if something were holding it, trying to keep it from revolving. The fools. When we get back to our base, I shall court martial every man aboard. Perhaps the propeller is tangled with some seaweed. That is all. In that case, we may be able to avert some sweep. Full speed of sun. Full speed of sun. Well, now what? Your pardon. The engine room reports propeller is still foul, sir. It behaves as it did before. It, it turns, but as if something is holding it back. And to think that I, Hans Ludwig von Metz, thought I had the finest submarine crew in the world. A brainless pack of idiots who become stuck in the mud on the bottom, and they go to pieces like old women. Now listen to me, all of you. The next man who shows... Captain Mitch. Ah, Herr Schmidt. I trust you have not been lying. Everything is quite under control. In my captain, 
I've been hearing sounds from outside the submarine. Sounds? What kind of sound? Scratching sounds. Tappings on the metal. It sounded as if, as if someone is trying to get into the submarine. My dear Herr Schmidt, you had nothing except the noises made, perhaps by pebbles being swept against our side by the car. That is all. But I tell you, it sounds like, like hands rapping and tapping, scraping at the hole, trying to get in. Why are we staying down here on the bottom? Surf at once, you hear me? I order you surf at once. That, Your Excellency, is what I am about to do. Now, all respect, may I suggest that you return to your cabin. Your presence here may uh, impede our efforts. I... Very well, Captain. But see that you take me to the surface at once. You have no fear. Lieutenant Reiner, perhaps you will assist Herr Schmidt to his cabin. Yes, sir. Certainly. If I may open the door for you, sir. Captain, Captain Well, what is it? Captain, we hear them too. Sounds. Sounds coming from outside our hull. I hear no sounds. Uh, Captain, I can hear them now. Quite plainly. On my detector phone. It's not possible to identify them, but they... They sound as if many people were climbing up our sides and... <coughs> there. Perhaps that will bring you to your senses. <coughs> Listen to me, all of you. Temporarily, we are stuck in the mud. The current is sweeping debris or pebbles against us. You are all acting like children who think they see a ghost in a graveyard. In an hour, we shall be on the surface. You have my word for it. To get free from the mud, I shall fill the bow tanks, then blow them and fill the stern tanks. We shall seesaw ourselves loose. Do you all understand my scheme? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Let the forward ballast tank. Let the forward ballast tank, sir. Captain, Captain Nitz. Yes, Lieutenant Rainer. The main pumps are again operating, sir. The failure was caused by Hans Jäger. Jäger? How? He went crazy, committed suicide by grabbing the poles of the main switch. The short circuit electrocuted him. Blow out the fuses. Nah, Jaeger was always a fool. How the other reacted to his death? Very badly, sir. They are very nervous. Nervous, are they? Yes, sir. That scraping and scratching outside of our house it has affected them, sir. It has stopped for now, but the crew says that it's just because they are planning something else. They? Who do you mean by they? The crew says, sir, uh, that there are hundreds of men in the water outside trying to get in at us. Dead men, sir. Lieutenant Reiner, do you wish me to place you under arrest? No, sir. I'm just trying to explain the state of the mind of the crew, sir. In spite of all our efforts, we are still on the bottom, and the men... The men are getting very jumpy, sir. I shall have to teach them a lesson they will not forget. They are taking their cue from our illustrious passenger, of course. If he had not come out here with his ranting and raving... Never mind that. He's quiet now. They gave him whiskey with a sedative in it. Your pardon, Captain. If I may make a suggestion... Well, what is it? There is one thing they have not tried. Huh? They have to try it, sir. Discharge our torpedoes. Discharge our torpedoes? A submarine without torpedoes, Lieutenant, is, is no more use than an airplane without wings. But we must, sir. They have ten torpedoes aboard. Twenty-five thousand pounds of dead weight. Get rid of that, and we have to rise. We have to. I see you are beginning to share the hysteria of the crew. When we return to our base, I shall not fail to include that fact in my report. However, I accept your suggestion. Order the discharge of our torpedoes to begin at once. Yes, sir. At once. <laughs> Down, yeah. What's going on here? Your man mumbling about 
I do not discharge the last of the torpedo. You know what is going on here, Harold Lloyd we have fired six torpedoes to lighten ship, and what has happened? We are sinking deeper. He is right. Yes, we are going deeper. Our plates will not stand it. We shall be crushed. Down like that for the trap. Oh, Christ! We are not going deeper. We have come to a stop already. And even if we should slide a little further, we still have a margin of safety of at least 100 feet. The fact we have moved through, we are breaking free from the mud. No, it is not true. We are not stuck in the mud. We are not. That man? No more of that. No more, Jack. Why should I? Be quiet. We all know we are not in any much. We all know our tanks are empty and we should have been on the surface long ago. We all know why our propellers will not turn and we all know why we cannot rise through. That's yes, Because we are being held down. We are being held down by a thousand dead men who are crawling all over us, scratching in our plates trying to get in. They have come from all over the seven seas just to hold us down, just to see we do not get away. Listen to them. Listen. You can hear them now. Listen. Ah, oh, what nonsense. What can come to your senses? There's only our plate burning on the pressure. That is not true. You know better. We all know better. Who dragged us down here to the bottom? Whose hands are keeping our propellers from turning? Whose body jammed our diving plane? Whose weight is keeping us on the bottom? The dead. Ross, man, I order you to be quiet. It is too late for order. There is only one way we can escape. That is to give the ones outside the man they want. They want our passenger. The one who calls himself Herr Schmidt. We all know who he is, and so do they. And they have come to get him. Batman, you are under arrest. Listen, listen, all of you. Let us get this Herr Schmidt with his funny mustache. Put him in a torpedo tube and send him out to the deck outside. Let them have him. Then they will let us go free. It is our only hope. Hey, Batman, get the next. I heard your interesting little speech just now. And this is my answer. <laughs> Does anyone else want the same medicine to bring him to his senses? Then to your stations. Leutnant Reiner, continue to discharge our torpedoes. <laughs> Yet, 
with a with a rock. Oh, you, you may say it was the submarine sliding over rocks on the bottom. But listen to me. And listen carefully. This is the truth. That tapping was in the international code. It was a message. A message from someone outside our submarine at a depth of 400 feet. What does it say? I was... Uh, another letter. Now we are thinking fast. In a moment, our, our hull will decay in like an eggshell. But first, I must tell you the message. I, I do not ask you to believe me, but the message was this. We are waiting for your Adolf Hitler. We are waiting... <laughs> enemy Adolf Hitler? I do not know, so I cannot tell you. The man who told it to me, uh, perhaps he was joking, you can say, you must make up your own mind. But it is interesting to uh, think about, isn't it? Yes, very interesting. It reminds me of another strange story I heard recently. Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard Chapter 66 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying... In tonight's story, Death Comes for Adolf Hitler, Tony Barrett played Lieutenant Reiner, Philip Clark played Captain Metz, and Lon Clark played Adolf Hitler. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silvern. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled Murder Goes Free. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual. This is Mutual. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Golden Radio Hour. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? Here's the sanitarium, Harvey. Is he still unconscious? Yes. Here comes the attendant. We're all ready for him, Mrs. Jackson. Take his feet, Harold. Oh, had to tie him, eh? Yes, I had to give him a good one on the chin. You'll have to watch him. He may try to get away when he comes to. Don't worry, we've got a lot of tough cases here. Don't let him know who brought him here. And don't let him know I had anything to do with it. Leave everything to us. It's a two-hour drive back to the city, Donna. Yes, sir. Well, I'll I'll phone you tomorrow. Good. If anything happens, we'll call you. Thank you. Uh, Good night. (laughs) 
Saturday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales. I know many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the mysterious tale of death as a thirst. The long black car with a handsome man at the wheel and the woman beside him returns to the highway and speeds on through the night. The man and woman sit staring ahead, lost in thought. The man is Harvey Davis. The woman, Mrs. Victor Jackson, wife of the unconscious man recently deposited at the sanitarium. I'm sorry I dragged you into this, Harvey. But I had to have some help and I knew I could depend on you. It's all right, Donna. I only hope it'll do some good. Victor never drank a drop while we were in school. He didn't drink when we were first married. But after his father died and Victor took over the business, he started. It's a huge concern, and I guess he just couldn't take it. He's always had an inferiority complex. But the thing that hurts me most is that the drinking has completely changed him. Why, he's suspicious of every move I make. He accuses me of the most disgraceful things. Accuses me of lying to him about everything and of being in love with, with other men. Countless things. Other men? <laughs> what men? Any man I speak to. <laughs> Even you, Harvey. Me? Well, after all, if he's going to be suspicious of any man, it would logically be me. Why? You've brought most of your troubles to me. He knows that. I'm as good a victim as any. He knows I'm terribly fond of you. Are you, Harvey? From the first day I met you, I said, here's a woman, a strong woman. Maybe she'll develop some backbone in my willy-nilly friend, Victor. That's very nicely put, Harvey. Let's hope the sanitarium does him some good. If it doesn't, I don't know what I'll do. Don't worry, Donna. Just remember, I'll do anything for you. Thank you, Harvey. About midnight, the black sedan arrives at the Jackson mansion. The butler greets Harvey and Donna at the door. Evening, Mrs. Jackson. Evening, Mr. Davis. Evening. Uh, Dr. Saunders is in the library, ma'am. He's waiting for you. Dr. Saunders at this hour? What on earth does he want? You'd better see him, Donna. Maybe he knows. How could he? Come with me, Harvey. Of course. Oh, good evening, Dr. Saunders. Good evening, Donna. Evening, Harvey. Hello, Doctor. This is quite a surprise. I can imagine. I, um... Um, Harvey and I... uh, We've just been for a little drive. I felt I needed some air. All right, so? Um, did you come to see Victor? Uh, Victor isn't here. Really? But I know where he is. You do? He's in a cheap dive of a rooming house downtown. What? But that's impossible. That's where he always goes. Well, you're wrong this time, Doctor. I took him by force to a sanitarium tonight. Harvey, help me. Maybe they can do something for him. You told the sanitarium that I was his physician, didn't you? Yes. Well, they called me an hour ago. He's escaped. What? They said he came to and broke away from them. I know where he usually goes, and I can find him. If you want me to find him. What are you inferring, Doctor? Donna, I know what you've been through with Victor. I know what a trial it's been. I've tried, and you've tried. We've all tried everything we could do to make him stop. Not many women would have put up with what you have. We've dragged him through before. We probably can do it again. I just thought, well, maybe you'd had enough. You do know where he is? Yes, I'm pretty sure I know. Well, then find him. I'm I'm determined to cure him if I have to take him to a desert island. That's an idea. A long ocean trip might be the answer. Just have to hog time. I could do that, too. Very well, I'll have a talk with him. I'll phone you in the morning. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Oh, Harvey. No, no, no. You've done your best, Donna. Oh, but I feel so hopeless. I don't know what to do. (laughs) Try the desert island. Why not? Harvey, it might work, mightn't it? You can help. Your yacht, Dr. Saunders, may be right. Oh, at least it's worth a try. I wonder. Please, Harvey, it may be the answer. I can't get away just now, but if you're determined, you're welcome to the yacht. Oh, please, I... I'd feel better if you came along. All right, Donna. 
I'll go. I'll arrange it. But he won't want to come. We'll take him aboard by force. Shanghai? Well, all right. Just let me know when you find him, and I'll arrange everything. He sure was plastered. Well, I'll leave you alone with him, Doctor. Thanks. That hypo will bring him out of this. Victor. Victor. What? What? What's going on here? Who are you? Get away. Quiet, quiet. Take it easy, Victor. Huh? Who are you? Doc Saunders. Doc? What do you want? I want to talk to you, Victor. It's very important. Important? Come on, Victor. Snap out of it. Hey, hey. What's the idea? What'd you slap me for? To wake you up. I've got to talk to you. Oh. Oh, hello, Doc. What are you after? Is your head clear? Uh, I guess so. Well, then listen to me. You know where you are? Yeah. Yeah, my old haunt. You know how you got here? No. Let me see. I... No, I, I can't seem to remember. Well, I'll tell you where you're going if you don't pull yourself together. Where? To the insane asylum. Did you say asylum? I did. I haven't told you this, but your great-grandfather died insane. What? And that was your father's greatest fear, that he would be a victim. Oh. And there's nothing that hastens final mental breakdown more than alcohol. Insanity? Are you just telling me that? No, I can prove it. Good Lord. Do you want that to happen to you? Oh, no, no. Oh, but I... Well, I, I just can't seem to quit. You're going away, Vic. Away? Where? I'm sending you on a long voyage with no liquor. Oh, no. No, you're not. No, now, no, I'll get hold of myself. You said that before. I can take it or leave it alone if I want to. But you haven't so far. You've gone from bad to worse. Now you're going where you can't get it. But, Doc, I, I can't. I'd die. I, I couldn't stand it. You'll stand it and like it. I have to kill you. No. No, I won't be pushed around by anyone. I know who's back of this, Donna. She wants to get rid of me. Asylum, yeah. Yeah, that'd suit her fine. She'd like that. So she can cavort around with Harvey and all the others. Shut up, Vic. You're all planning to get rid of me. You don't like me. You're taking a trip. Get rid of me and you all share in the estate. Well, you'll see how much good it'll do. But you are taking a trip, Victor. Here you are, Victor, several hundred miles at sea. And worried, too, aren't you, Victor? That talk about insanity really upsets you. You believe it, too, don't you? (laughs) Uh, What's this? Where am I? Donna. Do you feel better? What is this? It's moving. I, I feel dizzy. I don't think you're dizzy. We're on a boat, darling. What boat? We're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. A boat? Doc Saunders. That's what he said. A a voyage. It's his idea. Oh, now, Victor. Everything's going to be all right. I know what you're planning to do. You're planning to kill me. You want to get rid of me. Want me to die. You won't die. Whose boat is this? Harvey's yacht. Harvey. Now I know it's a plot. Now I know what it's all about. You and Harvey, that's it. Don't be ridiculous, Victor. Harvey consented to let me have the yacht. Is he on board? Yes. Of course. You and Harvey and me a prisoner. What a perfect setup. You don't mean that, Victor. I've been suspicious of you two all along. Who else is on board? Nobody but the captain and the crew of four. And Harvey and the doctor. Where are you taking me? We're just cruising. Just cruising. Will you find the right spot? Right spot for what? To dump me overboard. No one will ever know, will they? And you'll say I jumped over. I was washed over the side. Oh, Victor, what has happened to you? You're like a stranger to me. I I just don't know you. It doesn't seem possible that you're the man I married. My darling, what's happened to you? Don't you know? If I only did. Why, I'm crazy. Insane. Surely you knew that. My great-grandfather was insane, and my grandfather, and undoubtedly my father, so why not me? You're talking nonsense. No! Hasn't Doc Saunders told you what he knows? I know. Oh, come now. You three are closer than that. Stop talking such nonsense. I won't listen. Uh, I'm getting out of this cabin. 
I can't stand to be cooped up like this. Oh, no, this. please stay here for a while, Victor. Please. Here, I... I brought you some milk. Please drink it. Milk? Ah. Oh, got a funny color to it. And it smells strange. What's in it? Arsenic? It's just plain milk, Victor. Now drink it. Do you like milk, Donna? Yes, I love milk. Then drink it yourself. Victor! Oh, all over my dress. You're trying to poison me, that's it. Now get out of here. Get out! Oh, Victor, please, darling. Get out! you want, Doc? How do you feel, Victor? They're trying to kill me. They plan to kill me. Who? Donna and Harvey. She just brought me some milk and it had poison in it. I could tell by the color. I think you're imagining things, Victor. No, no, I'm not. They want me out of the way. I can tell. What made you think the milk was poison? It, it was a purplish color. Here, here's the glass. Smell it. Maybe I'm not so crazy after all. I didn't all. say you were crazy. I only want you to stop drinking. Drink may bring it on. Doc, where would they get poison? Oh, come now, forget it. Do you know where they'd get poison, Doc? I'll see you later, Victor. Maybe. Did you send for me, Doctor? Yes. Did you take some milk to Victor? Yes, I did. What did you put in it? Why should I put anything in it? Victor thinks you did. You should know me better than that, Doctor. You did put something in it? Oh, yes, I did. Some of that red liquid to make him quiet. Oh, yes, of course, that's what it was. And he threw it all over me. Oh, I... I'm thoroughly disgusted, Doctor. I... I can't go on with him this way. He isn't drinking, but there's something wrong. I decided to give it up as a bad job. I, I'm going to get a divorce. Divorce? I'm afraid it's too late for that, Donna. Too late? Why, what do you mean? Well, there's something I haven't told you. I've been hoping it wouldn't be necessary. But after today, I've given up all hope. Why can't I get a divorce? You can't get a divorce from an insane person. Insane? Good heavens. It's been a secret in Victor's family for several generations. Not even Victor knew it. It touched his father ever so lightly, but Victor has all the symptoms. And the liquor has hastened the crack up. I couldn't be certain as long as he was drinking. But today, I realized the truth. Well, I'm bewildered. I've never been so shocked in my life. I wish you hadn't told me. I'm sorry, Donna. I wanted you to be on your guard. He has some strange hallucination about you and Harvey. He thinks you're planning to do away with him. Do away with him? Oh, but that's ridiculous. I, I've i never had such a thought. Never. Oh, but now I am frightened. Doctor, what about Alice? Your daughter's only eight years old. There are no symptoms, and it may miss her entirely. But think what this will mean if, if this gets out about Victor. Why, it may ruin her whole life. I understand that. That must never happen. It must remain a secret. That'll be difficult. It's going to be hard to handle when that craving returns. Yes, he will. I'll think of something. I'll find a way. Doctor, come quickly. It's Harvey Davis. What's wrong, Captain? Found him in his bunk with a cord around his neck. Good it heavens. Was... Quiet, Donna. Come along. <laughs> Dead. No, he's breathing. Found him just in time. He'll be all right in a few minutes. Thank heaven. Harvey, Harvey. Harvey. Uh, Donna, what, what's wrong? What, what's happened? Nothing much, Harvey. Just a little accident. You'll be all right. Oh, my throat. What's going on? You don't remember? No, I was just taking a little nap. I, I feel as though I'd been choked. Better tell him, Donna. Come along, Captain. Be any liquor aboard, Captain? Yes, Doctor. Several bottles in the locker in my cabin. Let's have a look. I keep it locked because, uh... Hey, it's been jimmied. Well, what do you know? It's all gone. I expected that. I'll skin those men alive. Don't, don't blame the men, Captain. What do you mean? What the devil is that? We did something. Come on. What 
is it, man? What's wrong with you? The boilers blew up. We must have hit a reef. All three of the men of the crew were down there. We've got to abandon. I, I'm, I'm hurt bad, Captain. He's dead. See to the lifeboat. Round up the others. I'll go below. Yes, Captain. Murphy! John! Murphy! Are you there? Good Lord, what a mess. I can't imagine the... Oh. days pass. The sun beats down relentlessly on the five survivors in the open boat. The doctor watches anxiously over the still unconscious captain. And Donna and Harvey keep a constant eye on Victor, who sits alone in the end of the boat, staring at the horizon. How's the captain, doctor? Still holding his own. Must have had a bad fall down that companionway. I don't think he fell. Good thing you went down after him. We're running low on water. I hope we sight some land today. How much water have you left in your canteen, Donna? Half full. Hey, look over there. What's that? Why, it's a ship. No, it's land. An island. Grab an oar, Victor. Come on, Doc. Well, I've looked all around. The place is as barren of food and water as the Sahara Desert. I'm afraid if we do locate any water, it won't be fit to drink. There must be water. What do you care about water? You've got a canteen full of whiskey. How much water is left? I have some, and Dr. Saunders has some. So I'd better get busy. Although my experiences on these islands uh, haven't been so good. Here's a chance to put your chemistry to use, Harvey. You know the test for lead and zinc? Yes. I'll give you two vials, some sodium sulfide tablets and some potassium chromate. You know the test, one tablet of each and ten cc's of water. Mm -hmm. A dark precipitate means poison. Yes, I know. Thanks, Doc. Well, I'll start off and keep a direct line to the other side. Wherever that is. Wait a minute, Harvey. I think I'll go with you. Oh, why? Oh, maybe I can help. I'd go with you, Harvey, but I'd better keep my eye on the captain. He's the only one who knows where we are. I've got to pull him through. That's all right, Doc. I don't need any help. I think I'll go anyway. All right. If you insist, come on. Harvey, wait. I'm going too. Why? Because I want to. We don't need you. But I'm coming just the same. <laughs> Please, Harvey, I, I'd like to come. All right. Let's go. Certainly hot. How do you feel, Donna? All right. How far have we come? Oh, ten miles, I should say. This is a pretty big island at that. And nothing but desert. Are you sure those last two water holes were poisoned? Certainly. Look good to me. I'm getting mighty thirsty. Better quit drinking that whiskey. It'll only make you thirstier. Harvey, can I have a little water? I'm sorry, Donna, but you'll have to suffer it as long as you can. Please wait. You suppose we'll ever get out of here? I don't know. Oh, it's all my fault. What a shame to get you into such a mess. Please forgive me, Harvey. There's nothing to forgive, Donna. I'd do it again a hundred times over. For you. Would you, Harvey? Yes. Poor Victor, what a sad thing. No one must ever know, Harvey. Promise me, if we get out of this, promise me you'll never let anyone know. No one will ever learn from me. I got him. I got what him. What on earth? Harvey, he's got a gun. Where'd he get it? Come on. I got him. Look. Look. A lizard. A big one. I knew we'd find something. Put that down. You can't eat that. There must be water around here. There must be. Where'd you get that gun? Out of the captain's locker. Better take it easy with those shells. We may need them. Yeah. Maybe I will. Have a drink? No. Uh, all right. <coughs> I'd sure like some water. How about it? There's just enough for one of us to get back. And if only one goes back, it'll be Donna. Donna? How chivalrous. Who's got the water? I have. Come on. Let's keep moving. There's water around here. There must be. And I'm going to find it. Donna, if we don't find water, he's going to start pleading for what you have. No matter how much he raves or pleads, don't give it to him. He would be, even if he threatens us with a gun, tell him you drank it all. I want you to have the best break out of this. Thanks, Harvey. I appreciate that. I found it. Water. I found water. Hurry, Donna. Hurry. <laughs> Well, what about it? What's the test show? Just like all the rest. It's full of lead and zinc and heaven knows what else. Poison, huh? Worse, Jen. How about some of that water? 
What water? In Donner's canteen. There isn't any more. Who drank it? I did. You both did. You left none for me. You've got your whiskey. I can't drink whiskey all the time. You've done pretty well on it for several years. I've got to have some water. Harvey warned you. Harvey, Harvey, Harvey. Is that all you think about, Harvey? You should have married Harvey. Perhaps you're right about that. Are you sure that water's poison? I'm not drinking it, and I'm thirsty too. Maybe you're just waiting. For what? I don't know. But I can imagine a few things. We'd better stop here for the night. Are you very tired, Donna? Awfully. Better try and get some sleep. Where are you going, Victor? Just going to look around. May find something. I'm hungry. I'm going to build a fire with this brush. Don't get too far away. I'll be around. Don't worry. Keep a close watch on your canteen, Donna. I have an idea what he's up to. I'll try not to sleep, but I'm dead tired. I'll do my best, Harvey. If he goes to sleep, I'll try to get that gun away from him. (laughs) Good night, Donna. Good night, Harvey. Night comes on. The fire burns low. And only a red glow remains. Donna, in spite of herself, drops off into a sound sleep. Victor stirs from his place 20 feet away, looks about him, and crawls silently toward the sleeping Donna. Put it down, Victor. I want some water. There isn't any more. I think there is. You heard what I said. You're lying. You have got some. Victor, what is it? You've got some water and you won't give me any. Harvey. I'm wise to you. You don't want me to have any. You want me to die. You're in love with each other. You're drunk. What if I am in love with Harvey? What of it? Donna. You want me out of the way. Neither of you is very thirsty. No. Because you had some water. And you got it out of that pool. You're lying to me. It's good water. You're crazy. You sneaked it out of there while I was asleep. You you tried to make me think it was poison. I ought to shoot you both. All right, Victor, if you're so positive. Go on down and drink out of the pool. Oh. That gives me an idea. I'll just find out if that water's poisoned. Go drink some of it, Harvey. Certainly not. I'll give you 30 seconds. It's poison, Victor. Go ahead, drink, or I'll shoot. No, don't do it, Harvey. Then supposing you drink some, Donna. Very well, I will. Victor, it'll kill her. Donna, wait. I'll drink it. You're a fool, Victor. But come along. Uh, uh, this is going to be very interesting. Not as much as you think. Get, get off of me, I'll kill you! Uh, Maybe that'll hold you, Harvey. Oh, Harvey. I'm all right, Donna. I adjusted my shoulder. I hope you're satisfied now that it is poison, Victor. Maybe. But you two are getting water from someplace. All right. Hand over that canteen, Donna. Please, Victor. That's what Donna. I'll take care of it for all of us. And if either of you make a move toward me, I'll shoot both of you. Good night. And sleep tight. Both of you. The night slowly fades. And the chill of dawn creeps in. Then as the sun comes over the horizon, Harvey stirs fretfully, opens his eyes and looks for Donna. She sits beyond the dead embers of the campfire, her hands folded before her, staring blankly into space. Harvey raises up with a start and moves quickly to her side... Victor is sprawled on his back, the hilt of a hunting knife protruding from his breast. Donna. Donna. Good. What's happened to Victor? He's dead, Harvey. Dead? That knife. That's yours, Donna. Yes, it's mine. Now no one will ever know. Will they, Harvey? No. (laughs) I had to. Harvey, hello there. It's Dr. Saunders. Uh, Here we are. Thank heavens we found you. Sighted a ship, built a signal fire. They're waiting for us. Well, what's this? Well, Victor must have, uh, must have gone crazy in the night and stabbed himself. Let me see. He's dead, Harvey. How'd this happen? I told you, he, he must have, uh, stabbed himself. No, he, no, he didn't. I stabbed him. It's my knife. I I got to thinking, and I did it. I crept over, and I stabbed him. Oh, I see. When did you do this, Donna? It was, it was not more than an hour ago. I couldn't help it, Doctor. I, I couldn't help it. Please, Donna, please. There's nothing to fear. 
I didn't want anybody to know. Because of Alice. They won't know, Donna. You didn't kill him. What? He's been dead for at least three hours. Oh, what do you mean? Look at his eyes. Look at his lips and his tongue. The swelling of his stomach. Did you test the pool, Harley? Yes. Every pool we've come to has been heavy in mineral content. I warned him, but he thought we were lying to him. Last night, he pulled a gun and took down his canteen. There wasn't much in it, but it was all we had. He's been drinking whiskey, so a little water wouldn't satisfy him. So he drank from the pool. Ah, poor Victor. I guess it's just as well. Don't worry, Donna. No one will ever know. We'll lay, Doctor. There's nothing to tell. Except Victor Jackson poisoned himself in a fit of extreme thirst. No, Donna. No one will ever know. You did your best. You tried hard to make things work out. But somehow fate seemed to take things right out of your hands. (laughs) But you know better, don't you, Harvey? You know what happened. Tell us, Harley. Tell us. After Victor took the canteen from Donna and drank the few swallows in it, he fell off to sleep. Then I took the canteen and filled it from the poison pool. I knew he'd wake up with a greater thirst, and he did. But I'm not sorry. He's better off. And I found I do love Donna. And I'll take care of her for the rest of her days. There you are. From drama to tragedy... From tragedy to a beautiful love story wherein they will live happily ever after. (laughs) I know. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler stories are written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originate from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time, I, The Whistler, return to tell you the in- Incredible tale of the Secret Seven. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. Gentlemen... We seven scientists have banded together because the government of Austria is in deadly peril. We have evidence that Austria is being dangerously undermined by the Nazis, and that nothing is being done from the standpoint of the law to prevent it. We have therefore resolved to take measures into our own hands and prevent this chaos. At our next meeting, we shall present the names of those in high places who attempt to divide and conquer, and shall decide then as to what action shall be taken against them. And such was the organization in which Hans Minkler, the young, mild-mannered biologist of Vienna, suddenly found himself a member. Hans Minkler, whose whole life was dedicated to the preservation and the saving of human life. Hans Minkler, referred to by his classmates as the man who couldn't kill a fly. Saturday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. 
I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the incredible tale of the letter. Hans Minkler, the young biologist, only half heard the speech of the leader of the seven scientists. For Hans was dreaming of his beloved experiments. His experiments and the pretty niece of Monsieur Gallet, the lovely Vielle, who had been living in Vienna these past four years. Kindly Monsieur Gallet was interested in Hans Minkler's theories, and Hans was hoping Gallet might finance them. Well, Dr. Minkler, I've studied the outline of your proposed experiments, and I've come to the conclusion that you can accomplish great things. Oh. Well, that makes me very happy, Monsieur Gallet. How much do you think you'll need to carry on? I feel quite sure that I could get along for a couple of years on 5,000. If my cell experiments prove successful, human life may be prolonged considerably. I have all the faith in the world in Hans, Uncle. <laughs> my niece is certainly sold on your ability, Dr. Minglin. So are you, Uncle. You may as well admit it. Young men with your principles are all too scarce today. Europe seems to be saturated with men who claim they want to save mankind... They all seem to want to arrive at it through a destructive method. Well, it's only a temporary condition. Who do you plan to have assist you? Kurt Lassner? Kurt? Um, well, I haven't decided yet. Kurt is a fine young man. Yes, he was a good student, but he's drifted away from his studies. He's become absorbed in politics. Very well, Hans. I'll start you out with 5,000. Is that the way you want it, Biel? Yes, Uncle, you're a darling. Uh, <laughs> I hope that someday I, I may be able to repay you. See who that is, Viel. Come into the library, Hans. I'll give you a check. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Oh, good evening, Kurt. Hello, Viel. Well, how are you? Mm, very well, Kurt. Mm, you're very lovely this evening. Thank you. Yes, indeed. The prettiest girl in Vienna. Uh, is Hans here? I said I'd pick him up on my way downtown. Uh, yes, he's talking to Uncle. We're talking business. Oh, my, I've had a busy day. Not enough hours to go around. Sit down, Kurt. Thanks. Kurt, why have you given up your career? Biology? No, oh, I don't know. But you could do so much good. You were so well equipped to carry on in science. Think of the things yet to be done. I'm going to do things. Great things. I mean things that will really benefit mankind. Well, that's what I mean, too. <laughs> you know, you sound like Hans. Hans is very sad about your dropping your work. He counted on your helping him in his experiments. Oh, well, he'll get over it. Besides, those experiments can wait a while. No, Hans is going ahead. Who's going to help him? I am, if no one else. You? Well, how can you help him? I can learn biology. But it'll take a lot of money to do what he planned. He has the money. It's all arranged. My uncle has financed him. Your uncle? Yes. Well, I wish Hans luck. And I'm going to marry Hans. What? You and Hans? Well, what a surprise. Yes, I've made up my mind. I see. Well, I guess... Ah, good evening, Kurt. Glad to see you. Good evening. Uh, hello, Kurt. Oh, have you heard the good news? Oh, yes, Viel just told me. And I wish you both good luck. I hope you'll be very happy. And when's the wedding? Uh, wedding? What wedding? Oh, yes. <laughs> Me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Typical absent-minded professor. See, look, I have the money for my experiments. Well, Hans, it's quarter to eight. We better run along. We have an appointment at eight. Hmm? Oh, yes, the meeting. I'd forgotten. Yes, I'll be right with you. Goodbye, monsieur. Bye. Good night, Pierre. Uh, darling. Good night, Hans, dear. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> So Hans Minkler reluctantly attends his second meeting and with Kurt Lassner joins the five scientists in the darkened room. The single low lamp on the table casts their shadows on the wall. The leader is speaking so, again. Gentlemen, we have learned who these fifth columnists are. So it is our duty as loyal citizens to take action against these men. We have learned who the leader is and naturally he must be the first one to go. In this envelope I have his name. We will now draw lots to select the one among us to carry out instructions which will be read later. Are you ready with the straws, Kurt Lassner? Ready, sir. This is an old and simple method, but since there are only seven of us, it will suffice. Proceed, Kurt. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All of us have drawn, sir. Good. Here is the envelope containing the name of our victim. Who has the short straw? Well, I, I guess I have. Hans Minkler. Here's the envelope. But before you open it, we must tell you what the committee has decided to do about this man. He is to die. 
Die? And that task has fallen to you. You mean this man is to be murdered? Exactly. What? You don't know me, gentlemen. I'm a saver of life. I I wouldn't consider such a thing for a moment. Herr Minkler, you are a member of this group. You know our secrets. It will be best for us and for you if you completely forget your scruples. Oh, but uh, I can't belong to a society with such diabolical purposes. Why, I didn't realize what this was all about. Oh, no, I withdraw. It's too late to think about withdrawing. Do you mean that you actually expect me to kill someone? You have been selected. You are fools. I couldn't kill a fly. I couldn't harm a living thing if the whole country went up in smoke. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. You're not scientists. You're a band of madmen. Fiends. Sit down, Hans Minkler. We're not a band of madmen and we are not fiends. We are loyal patriots of Austria who are determined to save our country. Any one of us might have drawn that straw. Well, I don't want to be a party to such a plan. I'll not commit murder. Unfortunately, you know too much about us now to pull out. And suppose I refuse? Then you will accomplish nothing. Not only will we eradicate our selected victim, but we'll see to it that you are eradicated with him. Who is this victim? Open the envelope. Very well. What? Why, you are insane. The whole lot of you. You see, a galet is the soul of honor. You see, a galet is one of the most honest men I've ever met. Monsieur Gallet is the leader of the Nazi party. I don't believe it. Why, I'm to marry his niece. Did you say, Monsieur Gallet? Yes, you know that's ridiculous, Court. He'd never do such a thing. Gallet is the leader. We have proof. He also has a very lovely niece. And I'm sure you'd want nothing to happen to her. Would you, Herr Minkler? No. No, I wouldn't. But you, you must give me time. Time to think. There is nothing to think about. It has been decided. Galay must be exterminated within 12 hours. Very well. And there's nothing else for me to do. Good night, Jim. Good night, Herr Minkler. And remember, if you don't accomplish this task within 12 hours, we will be forced to take care of you. And if we can't find you, we will find the girl. Yes, I understand. Good night. Well, Hans, what are you going to do about it? You've sat in your apartment for two hours now. Which shall it be? Three lives are at stake. The uncle's and yours and VL's. (laughs) <laughs> Hans gets his car and drives to Monsieur Gallet's home. Well, hello, Hans. What on earth are you doing here? I didn't expect you back this evening. Where is Vielle? Why, she went to some friends. She probably won't be back till after midnight. What on earth's wrong with you? Get your hat and coat, Monsieur Gallet. What? Have you been drinking, Hans? Get your hat and coat. Now, wait a minute. Suppose you explain... There's no time for explanations. Get your things. What for? You're coming with me. (laughs) I'm just ready to turn in. You better run along, Hans. You'll feel better in the morning. Put up your hands, Monsieur Gillet. What? (laughs) This is the funniest thing I've ever encountered. Have you really got a gun in your pocket? I have. I hope you don't force me to prove it. This is certainly a surprise. The meaning of all this... I've just discovered that you're the leader of the Nazis... We're trying to undermine the Austrian government. (laughs) Are you serious? Yes. Who told you such a thing? There is an organization which is determined to eradicate all Nazis one by one. And you are the leader. Read this. It says, Leader Paul Gallet. Death. This is the maddest thing I've ever heard of. I've been highly active in anti-Nazi work. Ah, They say that's merely a cover-up. Are you a member of this secret organization? Yes. You've been selected to kill me? Yes. Unbelievable that you, Hans Minkler, could be mixed up in such a thing. I think you're being hoodwinked. I am an anti-Nazi. If you plan to kill me, you must belong to the Nazi organization. Get your things and come along. What do you intend to do with me? That's all planned. Come along. Very well. Kill you. Give me that gun. You fool. No, 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 no. You. Monsieur. Monsieur. Good Lord. Ah, 
Antoine stands staring at the body of Monsieur Gallet for a few moments. Then in a daze, he turns out the lights, closes the library door, and returns to his apartment. (laughs) For the remainder of the night, he sits at his desk staring into the darkness, lost in thought. And then morning comes, and Vielle at her home opens the library door and... Well, he's been dead about eight hours, Fräulein. Who on earth would do such a thing? He had no enemies. He was quite active in anti-Nazi work. Yes. There's something we found on the library floor. The, the pipe? Yes. The bowl is hand-carved, has initials on it. As you see, the stem is broken. Have you ever seen this pipe before? Well, I don't remember. There's something else we found, a note, which reads, Leader Paul Gallet, death. Do you recognize the handwriting? No. Do you know anyone whose initials are H.M., the initials carved on the pipe bowl? Yes, the, the pipe belongs to my fiancé, Hans Minkler. Your fiancé. What time did you return home last night? I attended a party and got here about one o'clock. I supposed Uncle was in bed. I didn't look in the library. I went straight to my room. What is Hans Minkler's address? I'm sure Hans had nothing to do with this. Are you? He lives at 13 Cronhead Street. I'll run over there. Please don't touch anything in the library. I won't. Good morning. Court. Court, something terrible has happened. Uncle was murdered last night. The police have just left. They, they found Hans's pipe on the library floor. It, it was broken. They've gone to his apartment. Please come over right away. <laughs> Hans, this is Kurt. The police found your pipe in Galais' library. They're on their way to your place. You've got to get out of the country immediately. Don't wait a moment. Oh, Kurt. Kurt is terrible. Oh, no, now control yourself, Ian. Oh, Kurt, I can't imagine why anyone would do such a thing. Kurt, do you know where Hans is? Well, I suppose he's at his apartment. Hasn't he called you this morning? He usually does, but he hasn't. They found Hans's broken pipe near Uncle's body. Could I must warn Hans. I must let him know what's happened. Oh, it's pipe, huh? Well, that's bad. By all means, phone him at once. Oh, you call him. Of course. It's chronic start 4347. Right. Ringing. He must be there. He would have answered by now. Where could he be? I haven't the slightest idea. But he always calls me before this. Could it? It isn't possible. It can't be. Oh, now, now, just try to control yourself, Yale. Oh, see who it is, Kurt. Special delivery. Sign here, please. Well, thank you. Who's it for? For you. Kurt. It's from Hans. Good heavens, read it. Leaving Vienna on important business. Contact me at 16 Rue de Roche, Paris, under the name of Pierre Cabot, H.M. Well, I don't understand it. What does he mean? What important business? Why should he disappear like this? Oh, I have no idea, but it does look strange. Your uncle is murdered and Hans disappears. Oh, but what motive could he have had? But they found his pipe near Uncle's body. Oh, you know Hans had nothing to do with it. I'll admit he's always been rather peculiar, never seemed to let loose, always seemed to be on his guard, but well, I can think of no reason for this. But what could this important business be? He never told me of it. And why on earth should he go to Paris under an assumed name? Well, that is strange. Could that officer said something. What? Well, you know the knuckle was active in anti-Nazi work. Do you suppose it could be a Nazi? Well, why not? But who? Who do we know that's a Nazi? I, I certainly Wait don't... a minute. You just said that you felt Hans was always on his guard. Do you mean you felt he was concealing something? Well, there have been times when I've felt that, but on the whole, I've thought of him as a slow-thinking, absent-minded professor. But it does seem strange that the moment Uncle gave him the check, that this should happen and he should disappear. 
Maybe he went to visit our old pal, Jean Renault. You remember, Jean? He was one of our classmates. I have a strange feeling that Hans wouldn't go away like this without telling me beforehand, unless something were wrong. Do you... Do you suppose that Hans has been deceiving us all along? What makes you ask that? Well, it suddenly occurred to me that he spoke French without the trace of an accent. And I remember Jean Renault said once that he spoke English without an accent. So what? Well, if he did, where did he learn to do that? Certainly not by living in Vienna all his life. I see what you mean. Why didn't he tell me beforehand that he was leaving? But he wrote you this letter. Yes, but it wasn't written by the Hans, I know. Oh, I I think you'd better forget about it. Could... I didn't tell you this. The police found a note on the floor. It said, Leader Paul Gallet, death. It must have meant that Uncle was an anti-Nazi leader and he was sentenced to die. And if this ties in with Hans' disappearance, then Hans must have been connected with the Nazis. Oh, darling, you're getting yourself all worked up. You don't think Hans was a Nazi? Well, I'll admit, the way you've got it all worked out, it sounds plausible. But if he was a Nazi and he's left the country, what can we do about it? He won't come back. But why should he go to Paris? Well, Jean Renault was a good friend of ours. I'm sure Jean knows nothing about Hans being a Nazi. Jean would never suspect him. Maybe Paris is his next assignment. Nazis are just as busy in France as they are here. Let's see that letter from Hans. He says here, contact me, 16 Rue de Roche, Paris. That's Renault's address, 16 Rue de Roche. Oh, good, good. I just can't believe it. How could I have been such a fool? I'll see who it is, darling. I'm Captain Gruber from police headquarters. Oh, come in, Captain. Sorry to trouble you again, Furlan. But we went to Herr Mickley's apartment. He wasn't there. He wasn't. His car has not been in the garage all night. That's strange. We found this writing on the notepad on his desk. Is it his handwriting? Yes. He's written the same two words over and over again. Gallet and Lié. As though he tried to make up his mind about something. But what's become of his car? The car's been found. Where? In the public garage. From all indications, Minkler's left the country. Probably for France. Oh, why France? We've discovered that Hans Minkler is a French citizen. A French citizen? He always led us to believe that he was a native Austrian. Now, uh, we'll want to check things over a little further. We'll be back this afternoon. Please don't disturb anything. No, no, we won't. By the way, what is your name, sir? Hmm? Oh, oh, my name is Kurt Lasner. Good day. Kurt, what did you see? What were you looking at just then? Well, what do you mean? What startled you on Uncle's desk? Well... Well, nothing, nothing at all. Here, let me see. Good heavens, I see it. Here on the desk blotter, it's Uncle's handwriting. It says, find Hans Minkler. And it was Hans. It was. Uncle was trying to tell us who did it. Oh, maybe. Oh, to think that he could be so low as to take Uncle's money and then kill him. Oh, please be ill. I just can't believe it. I won't believe it. I must. Well, I'm sorry to say that all the evidence is certainly against him. Oh, come, Viel, try to get this off your mind. Try to get some rest. The police will take care of everything. Oh, yes, Kurt. I guess you're right. If Hans did do it, he'll pay. He's the one who'll do the suffering. Believe me. <laughs> During the night, the Nazi hordes rolled swiftly into Austria and, without firing a shot, took over the reins of government. A few weeks later, France declared war. Then one night, Hans Minkler makes his way through the maze of Paris traffic and knocks at the door of number 16, Rue de Roche. Oh. Yes? Oh, good evening. Good evening. Is Jean Renault in? Who shall I say is calling? Why, um... Pierre Cabot. Won't you come in, Monsieur Cabot? Major Renault has just stepped out. He'll be back shortly. Was he expecting you? Uh, no. Did you say Major Renault? Yes. Since war has been declared, he's gone on the active service list. Oh, I see. I've been phoning for a week, but no one answered. You haven't seen the Major in some time? No, no, I haven't. I've been in Austria for several years. Renault and I went to school together in Vienna. Oh. Are you by any chance... Hans Minkler. How did you know that? Why are you traveling incognito? Well, I am... Well, yes. Where is Renault? 
I regret to inform you that Renault has been in Africa for some time. He's due back in a few weeks, however. Did you know Monsieur Gallet in Vienna? I... Yes. Who are you? I'm Monsieur Duvaux of the French Sauté. Oh. oh, police. Yes. Did you ever accept any money from Monsieur Gallet? Why, I... Why are you asking me these questions? You never accepted money from Gallet? No. Search him, Henri. No, Very just well. a moment. Sorry, Minkler. I'll take the bill for Larry. Yes, sir. I don't understand all this. You understand, all right. Well, so you never received money from Gallet. What's this check for? Well, uh, that's to help carry on my experiments. Undoubtedly. Monsieur Gallet was helping you and quite a number of others to carry on experiments. Others? I suppose you say you're new at this game. Game? I don't know what you mean. I had nothing to do with his death. Nothing. Yes, I believe that. Why should you kill one of your own? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. If you were intending to carry on experiments in Vienna, why is this check drawn on the Bank of Paris? Well, maybe he had a surplus of funds here. <laughs> Indeed he did. How did you know I was coming here? We knew. Just what were your plans? Oh, this is ridiculous. I'm not a spy. I was engaged to Mary Gallet's niece. Really? Some way I got mixed up with an organization which planned to rid Austria of all Nazis. <laughs> They claimed that Monsieur Gallet was the leader in Vienna. I denied it. But nevertheless, I, I was selected to, to murder him. Oh, I see. And told that if I refused, it, it'd also kill me and my fiancée as well. I decided to get them out of the country. I went to Gallet's home. I, my fiancée was not there. I knew there was no time to lose. So I tried to take him away by force. He was suspicious of me. We suddenly got into a scuffle. And, and then, then someone behind me... Fired a gun. I don't know who it was. And Galay fell dead. I see. I went to my home. Next morning learned that they were looking for me. I got out of the country and in a roundabout way I, I came to Paris. A good story. But it doesn't hold water. Galay was a Nazi leader and there's too much evidence against you, Minkler. Come on. Let's go now to headquarters. <laughs> Two weeks later, Jean Renault returns to Paris. Then, six weeks after Austria surrenders, Kurt and Viel escape from the Nazis and make their way to Paris. Jean Renault meets Kurt on the street and asks him to bring Viel to visit him at 16 Rue de Roche. Come in, Kurt. Well, well, Viel. It's been a long time. How are you? Excellent, thank you. So you two are married. Oh, my congratulations. Though I didn't expect it to work out quite this way. No? Why not? Well, I always had an idea that you might marry Hans Minkler. Well, one never knows. <laughs> no, Kurt. One never does. By the way, uh, have you seen Hans? He's in Paris. Been here for several weeks. Has he? Yes. Don't tell me you haven't seen him. Well, he told us he was coming to visit you. Oh, yes. He's in Paris. I wasn't here when he arrived left several notes. I found them when I returned. But do you know where he is now? Yes. Would you like to see him? Yes, I would. Hans is dead. Dead? What? Dead? Yes. He was executed as a Nazi spy. A Nazi spy? Yes. I got here too late to help him. They had conclusive evidence against him. Why, that's ridiculous. Hans is dead, nevertheless. But what happened? Well, it seems Hans got into some trouble in Vienna. He came to Paris to see me. In some way, the Sûreté here was informed that he was a Nazi, was coming here to carry on. But who on earth would accuse Hans of such a thing? I wonder. But they received a letter from Vienna accusing Hans. The Sûreté found a check on him from a high Nazi official. There was nothing that could save him. A check from a high Nazi official? Who was the official? Paul Gallet. The heir's uncle. What? Didn't you know about your uncle? I don't believe it. Whether you do or not, he was a Nazi. The Secret Service has known it for years. He may or may not have given the check to Hans for Nazi purposes. But the evidence was against Hans. Then the letter came to the Surete saying Hans was a Nazi agent. They found him here, arrested him. That's all there was to it. But who would write such a letter? Hans had no enemies. Would you like to read the letter? Yes. 
Here it is. Hans Minkler, under alias of Pierre Capot, has given evidence of being a Nazi spy. Locate him at 16 Rue de Roche, Paris. And that's all that was necessary. Oh, how awful. I, I can't imagine such a thing. Notice the handwriting, Kurt. What? Ah, oh, yes. Viel, this is your handwriting. It is not. I'm positive. You wrote this. No. Don't lie to me. I know your writing. You wrote this letter. All right. All right, I did. I was convinced that he deceived me. I was convinced he killed Uncle. Yes, I wrote it. How could you? I never dreamed Uncle was a Nazi. I thought Hans was a Nazi. I was determined to make him suffer. You believe me, don't you? Yes, Viel. I believe you. But I'm awfully, awfully sorry for you. Oh, poor Hans. Poor Hans. Oh, I'll never forgive myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Viel. What a terrible injustice you have done. But someday, perhaps you'll learn what really happened to your uncle. It wasn't Hans who killed him. Hans didn't even have a gun, just a pipe. But Hans wanted to get him safely out of the country. And Kurt knew that Hans would never go through with the order of the Secret Seven. So he followed Hans. And when he saw what was happening, he shot Galay and disappeared and let you think Hans did it. Because Kurt was in love with you, too, Viel. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time, I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the strange tale of Out of the Fog. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler... Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you the amazing story of House of Greed. A taxi cab rolls through the night and comes to a stop before a brownstone mansion on West 52nd Street. The driver opens the door, and a handsome, well-dressed man steps out, pays the driver, slips quickly up the stairs, fumbles with a bunch of keys, but the door opens. Oh, Hello, Jackson. Mr. Talbot, welcome home, sir. Where's Mrs. Talbot? Oh, uh, she left three days ago. Uh, went to the place in the Catskills. There's a note on your desk, sir. Oh, good. Your brother, Frank, is waiting in the library. Oh. Hello, Frank. What do you want? John. Now, look, Frank, I told you the last time I'd give you no more money. Oh, but it isn't gambling debts this time. I'm reforming. I'm going to settle down and work. Hmm. Work? Hmm. I met a big cattleman from South America. He has a very lovely daughter. And she talked her father into letting me buy an interest in the business. How much? Ten thousand. 
Oh, I'm sure I'll make good, John. Oh, very well. I don't mind doing something like that for you. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I've had a plane reservation for four days. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the check, John. You're a swell guy. Uh, tell Mary goodbye for me. Yeah, she's up in the Catskills. Yeah, so Jackson told me. Yeah, the... Good Lord. What's wrong? She hasn't gone to the Catskills. I... I can't understand this. What on earth does she mean? Well, what is it? Well, read it. John, this life is too lonely. I can't go on like this, so I'm leaving you. I found someone else who is more considerate of me. But I... First, I'm going home, and from there, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but things just didn't work out for us. Mary. Someone who's more considerate of her? Why, I have given Mary everything her heart desired. She must be out of her mind. Uh, of course, you have been gone a lot, and women get crazy ideas. I had... It's knocked the pins right out from under me. Yes, I can see that. You better take it easy for a while. Yes, I feel, I don't know, kind of sick. All of a sudden, nothing seems to matter. Oh, maybe she'll wake up before she gets too far. Perhaps I'd better cancel my trip for a few weeks until you get straightened out. No, 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 never mind. I'll, I'll pull myself together. I wouldn't have you sidetrack your plans for the world. I think you better go now, Frank. I'd rather be alone. All right. But uh, don't do anything foolish. What do you mean? Well, if you brood about it, you're liable to get some crazy ideas and end up really holding the sack. Good luck, Frank. Lots of luck. Thanks. Goodbye, John. John sits for the remainder of the night staring over the top of his desk. The next morning he closes the house and starts on Mary's trail, which takes him to London, Paris, Berlin, all over Europe, but to no avail. Finally, he drops his active interest in his business and goes to live in his country estate. Then one day, 14 years later, he finds himself on a honeymoon. He has married a widow named Helga. Well, John, dear, we got away without too much trouble. Well, it does seem a bit silly, rice and honeymoons at our age. Our age? Well, you sound as though we're a couple of old grannies. I'm 36 and you're 45, and I certainly don't feel old. Why, of course you're not, Helga. <laughs> oh, dear. John, now that the wedding's over, there's something I haven't told you. Oh, I... now I... I... Well, I, I haven't said anything because I was afraid it, it might make a difference. Well, I know what it is. You have a son. How did you know? <laughs> I wondered when you were going to mention it. Oh, well, he finishes school this year. It's been quite a struggle putting him through college. But he's very bright. Paul has studied hard and managed to cram two years into one. Could he spend the summer with us? Why, of course. Oh, John, you're a darling. I should be able to find a place for him in the business. Oh, ask him to come down to our place in the country. Oh, thanks, John. You're wonderful. <laughs> so Helga's son, Paul, came to spend the summer at the country place... And he stayed the next winter and the following summer and the next winter. Now it is summer again. And Paul is still visiting his mother and stepfather. The first year he worked in the office every day until noon. He found business very boring. So finally he quit going to the city at all. But mother, I've looked the whole thing over and there's nothing there that interests me. Well, you can learn about the business. You seem to be able to learn anything else you want to. But I don't care for business. Oh, you're a fool. I worked my knuckles to the bone to give you an education. I married John Talbot to give you a chance, a chance to do something. John has no children. It's a huge business. And one day you could control the whole thing. I'm disappointed in you, Paul. You're letting me down. Well, it seems to run very well without too much attention from him. If we were to uh, inherit it, why wouldn't it continue to run just as well? You either get down to that office or you pack your things and get out. Why should I? I'm perfectly satisfied. I'll tell John to make you go. And suppose I tell him what you just said? That you married him just to give me a chance? Married him for his money? You wouldn't dare. And uh, suppose I tell him that you were never divorced from father? That he's still down in South America... Still wandering around trying to find a gold mine. If you dare open your mouth, I'll... Oh, hello there. How are you, Helga? 
What's this I heard about South America? Oh, why, why, nothing, darling. Paul was just talking about someone he met from down there. Who do you know from South America, Paul? Oh, uh, oh fellow, I met him today. Were you in the city today? Uh, no, uh, it was down the village. I didn't suppose you'd been out of the house today. What's his name? Why, uh, I don't remember. I didn't think you would. You haven't been out of this house for three days. Paul, I think you're the laziest man I've ever met. All right, all right. I'll start back to the office Monday. If that's what you and Mother want me to do, I'll do it. Why, I'm sorry I wasn't here for dinner, Helga. I was detained in town. Well, I have quite a bit of work to do. I'll be here in the library for two or three hours. Very well, John. I, I won't bother you. I'll go on upstairs. Besides, I want to have a little talk with Paul. Good night, dear. Good night, Helga. <clears throat> what on earth? Who's out there? Why? What do you want out there? May I come in? I want to talk with you. Well, why do you come to the library windows? Why didn't you ring the bell? I, I didn't want to cause a disturbance. Disturbance? What do you mean? May I come in? Yes, yes, come ahead. Don't you know me, John? Good Lord. Mary. I'm sorry, John. I had to talk with you. I saw the light in the library. What do you want? I... I need your help. Where have you been all these years? Oh, every place. Are you still filled with resentment? It's been too long ago. At first I was. I followed you all over Europe, but never quite caught up with you. Now I'm glad I didn't. No telling what I might have done. I'm sorry, John. I was a fool. And I know that now. <coughs> May I sit down? Why, of course. <laughs> Are you a cold? Yes, I can't seem to shake it. I've had it for weeks. You see, I, I hate to mention it, but you look a bit shabby, Mary. Aren't you doing well? Oh, well, yes. Yes, I'm doing all right. Are you? You've uh, married again. Yes. And your wife is here? Yes. Then I'll be as brief as possible. I, I wouldn't want her to know that I was here. You want me to help your husband? No, not that. I have no husband. What about the man you said was more considerate of you? He left me four years after the baby was born. Baby? You have a child. Yes, John. She's 17 now. And where's the man? I don't know and I don't care. Oh, John, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I should have known better. But he practically carried me off my feet. And I learned later, to my sorrow, that he was not worth shooting. Where's your daughter? She's in a school in Vermont. I've worked hard to give her an education. I've done everything I could do to give her a chance. I've not seen her very often. But now, well, I... I'm sort of cracking up. I've been ill a lot, and I seem to have trouble getting a job. Job? What kind of a job? Why, any kind of a job. What have you been working at, Mary? Oh, John, I made such a miserable mess of it. I was never able to face things. I always took the line of least resistance. What a shame. And now I've come to the end of my rope. Joan has finished school. She's a lovely girl, John. I can't let her know. I can't take her with me. Why not? She deserves so much more. She deserves a chance in life. I want you to do something for her. Well, why should I? Because she's your daughter, John. Yeah. My daughter? Yes, yours and mine. She was born seven months after I left. Here's the birth certificate. Please, John, do something for her. She shouldn't be made to suffer for my mistake. She's innocent. Well, does she know I'm her father? <laughs> no. And she doesn't remember the other man. Here, I'll give you her address. Fernwood College. And, and I'll write a letter to her explaining all about you. Well, I, I... Oh, John, you could do so much for her. She's a young lady now. And so lovely. Please see her. I know you'll fall in love with her. All right, Mary, I'll, I'll see her. I'll have her come down here. Oh, John, John, I'm so sorry. So sorry for everything I've done. Please forgive me. 
I've forgotten everything, Mary. Oh, wait a moment. Take this check and do something about that cough. No, thanks, John. I won't need it. You'd better take it. Thanks. I'll be all right in a few days. The cough will be gone. Good night, John. Good night, Mary. If he brings this girl here, do you realize what it means, Mother? Yes. It's his own daughter. If he falls for her, if he, if he likes her, he'll change his will and split the estate. She's entitled to it, isn't she? Now, why should she be? Strange girl he didn't even know existed. Popped up out of nowhere and cheats us out of half the estate. Hmm. I know what you mean. We've been here for several years. You're his wife. It isn't fair. What would you do about it, Paul? I'd see that she didn't get anything. How would that be possible? Suppose she, uh, she didn't like it here. Supposing that before John got attached to her, the things happened that would make her dislike everything here. If she runs away soon enough, he won't change his will. Perhaps you're right. And if she doesn't? Then maybe something could happen to John. Later, something could happen to the girl. But in any event, the will must not be changed. Where do you get such ideas? <laughs> that, Joan, dear, is the story of your mother. I trailed them all over Europe, but never quite caught up with them. You mean you planned to kill them? Kill them? I was filled with revenge, but I finally gave up the chase and returned here to wait. I knew that sooner or later she'd show up. But it's been so long ago... Surely you've lost the desire for revenge by this time. Time heals many wounds, my dear. If you had caught up with them and satisfied your revenge, what good would it have done? Quite right, my dear, quite right. Tell me, have you no recollection of this man? You can recall nothing about him? Absolutely nothing. Remember, I was only four when he went away. And you do believe that I'm your father? What else am I to believe? Mother proved that with the birth certificate. Proved that I'm Joan Talbot, not Joan Evans, as I've always believed. Of course. And would you like to remain here? Why, yes, I, I think I would, well, but There seems I... to be a doubt. Why do you hesitate? I don't know. From all the evidence, I, I belong here. I, I have a legal right, but... Well, I can't seem to find words to express it. Express what? From the moment I stepped in the door of this house, I've had a, a strange feeling... A cold, chilly sensation of of fear. Well, is it something you feel about me? Yes. You're afraid of me. No, I, I don't think so. Is it Helga? Well... Is it Paul? Oh, please, please don't ask me anymore. I don't know what it is. Well, what has Paul said to you? Nothing. No one said anything. It, it's just a premonition of... of evil. There's something wrong. Oh. Something horribly wrong in this house. Oh, you're imagining things, Joan. It's all in your mind. It will pass as suddenly as it came. You're young, Joan, impressionable, and you suddenly found your life turned upside down. A new environment to which you've never become accustomed, but you'll get used to it. You're my daughter. I want you to have what you deserve, what is rightfully yours. I understand. And I'll try to overcome this feeling. Yeah, that's better. You're a lovely girl, Joan. An intelligent girl. I know I'm going to be very proud of you. Thank you. I think I'll go to bed now. Well, it is rather late. Good night, dear. See you in the morning. Hello. Paul, what are you doing here on the stairs in the dark? I wanted to tell you something. What? You're very, very beautiful. Your eyes, your hair, just like gold. Gold moonbeams and soft. Oh! And your throat. Your throat is slender and soft. Like. Take your hands off my neck. Paul! I don't know many girls. Girls don't like me. Let me by. You don't like me either, do you? Well, I. I know. I can tell. Elsie didn't like me either. She was afraid of me. Who's Elsie? She was a girl in the village. 
She worked here in the summertime. No one knows what became of her. What? I don't remember what happened to her. But her throat was slender and white. Like yours. Let me by. Joan. Oh. Joan. What? Who's here? Who's in this room? Don't turn on the light. Helga. What do you want? I must talk to you. What about? You're not safe here. No one is safe in this house. You must leave at once. What do you mean? What's wrong? The house is wrong. It's filled with evil and hate. I know. Why do you stay? I can't leave. It's too late. But you must go at once. Do you mean that Paul... That's part of it. Then what else? John. John? What about him? I can't tell you. But you must believe me. What about my father? He doesn't believe he is your father. And he's planning to get revenge on your mother through you. I don't believe you. I won't. Get away while you have a chance. No. I won't run from it. I'll face it, whatever it is. Very well. Good night, Joan. Now it is nearly midnight. John still works at his desk in the library. But outside, a man steps softly through the trees upon the terrace, quietly opens the library doors, and steps in. Hello, John. Frank. Good Lord. Yes, Brother Frank. <laughs> well, why don't you say something? Come in, or get out, or something? Why, why, come in, Frank. You fairly knocked me off my feet. I didn't know whether you were alive or dead. It's been a long time, John. Why haven't you written me? Well, I was hoping I could make a go of that ranch and pay you back, but... Ah, I guess I was just born unlucky. Oh. They had a revolution and cleaned Senor Gonzalez out and me with him. That's too bad, Frank. But you're still the same steady, reliable John. Yes, sir, I've tried my darndest to be like you, but... Well, it just isn't in me. I don't have what it takes. The last two years, I've... Had a pretty tough time. I caught some sort of a malarial fever down there, and it's impossible to get rid of it. it keeps recurring. You certainly don't look well. You've aged quite a bit. You better have Dr. Richards look you over tomorrow. Huh. She's still kicking around. I thought he'd be gone long ago. How's your new marriage turned out? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. Good. Ever hear from Mary? Yes. She came to see me. I knew she would eventually. She was broke and quite ill. She'd had a tough time of it. And you helped her out. <laughs> you would. You couldn't turn anyone down. Well, she was mainly interested in my helping the girl. She had her in a school in Vermont. And so now you're taking care of both of them. What else could I do? Good old Joe. I sent for the girl and brought her down here. She's a lovely child. Sweet as can be. And you'll give her everything her heart desires, I suppose. And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. Oh? Well, I've decided that. <laughs> really? I'd like to send her to Wellesley. Good. Isn't every man who can have... Just a minute, Frank. I'll be right back. Well, what are you doing out here in the hall this time of night for? Oh, well, uh, 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 Mother sent me down to see why you hadn't come up to your room. Oh. Well, tell her I'll be up in a few minutes. Yes, uh, yes, I'll tell her. My stepson, Paul. His mother thought I was staying up unusually late. Oh, well, I'll run along. Good heavens, it's after 12. Now, when's the last train back to the city? 12 o'clock. You've missed it. Well, when's the next one? 5 a.m. Oh. Well, I, I suppose I'll have to wait for that. Can you put me up? Yes, of course, Frank. Oh, thanks. Well, wait a moment, Frank. I probably won't be up when you leave, so I'll give you this now. Oh, now, John, I, uh, I didn't come here for that. Hmm? I... Well, that is not exactly. <laughs> no, you never have. Here you are, Frank. A thousand. And see Doc Richards first thing in the morning. And drop in at the office and let me know what he says. Thanks, John. I, I'm i sorry that I have to take this. I, I only wish that... Oh, forget it. We're not kids any longer. 
You're too old to learn new tricks now. Run along to bed, Frank. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, uh, take the guest room at the head of the stairs. Good night, John. See you in town at noon. Night, Frank. The clock strikes three as two figures slip down the darkened hall and quietly enter John's bedroom. Then a few minutes later, the same two figures make their way in the moonlight through the trees to the back of the estate, carrying a long, gruesome bundle wrapped in a sheet. Now it is three nights later, and Joan, Helga, and Paul are in the library as Joan paces back and forth anxiously. But where could Father have gone? He didn't say a word about going out of town. Well, maybe he doesn't want to come back. Why not? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't like it here. You should have listened to me. But you didn't say anything about... Well, well, you just mentioned me. Could it be a mistake? I just had a weird feeling of impending disaster. Something is wrong, I know. If I didn't belong here, if I could leave, I'd not stay another moment. Who knows what will happen next? I know. What do you know? I know what will happen next. They always happen in twos. Many people have come here, stayed a while, and then suddenly disappeared. What time is it? 11.30. There's a train at 12. I'm leaving here. Hello? Yes, this is Joan Talbot. What? Good heavens, who? Where? Yes. Yes, I understand. Yes, I... I'll be here. Yes. Who was it? I, I don't know. I've never heard anything like it. What do you mean? It was a man, and he... What man? He said he had a message for us. And he'll be here at 12 o'clock, and... to wait for him in the library. The police? I don't know. He said he'll come to the garden windows, to the library window. Who could it be? I don't know. But we'll wait. I'm going to see this through. <laughs> Through the garden. Who, who is it, Mother? I, I don't know. The lights. Why did you turn out the lights? I turned them out so we could see outside. Who is he? I don't know. He, he, he's up on the terrace. Who, who are you? What do you want? I came to talk to you. What about? About what happened here at three o'clock in the morning several days ago. Nothing happened. Nothing. But something did happen. Turn on the lights. No, don't turn them on. You couldn't see me if you turned on the lights. Paul, good Lord. Was it you who phoned me? I spoke to you, but I didn't phone you. Mother. What happened in this house at three o'clock several days ago? A man was murdered. What? Paul. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Joan Talbot, open the top drawer of that desk. Now take out the paper. It says, on the night of August 5th, we, the undersigned, murdered John Talbot in his bedroom and buried his body on the estate. We didn't. We didn't. It's John. It's John. Sign it. Sign the paper and I'll go. Sign it, Paul. Sign it. You did it. You killed him. Sign it. You help me. You sign it. I can't. I can't. Turn on the lights, Joan. John. It's, it's him. It's him. He isn't dead. No, Paul. No, we didn't. Paul, what happened? I'll tell you. You killed my brother Frank instead. Come on in, Sergeant. You heard it all. Yes, we heard it all. Father, what on earth happened? When you phoned a while ago, I almost fainted. I was sure you were dead. I knew from the moment you told me you were frightened in this house that something was wrong. I put two and two together and realized what it was. They didn't want you to share in the estate. I knew they were planning something on that night. And then my brother came. He... Accidentally got into my room by mistake, and they killed him instead of me. I saw them carrying his body through the trees. So I 
disappeared for a few days and evolved this plan. You've nothing to worry about any longer, Joan. Nothing. No. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But the truth would certainly amaze you. All that Helga said about Paul and John was true. And John was planning revenge, but not through Joan. That night your brother Frank came back. You discovered something, John. What was it Frank said? And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. It was then, John, that you knew the truth. The only way that Frank could have possibly known that the girl's name was Joan and that she was 17 was to have been with Mary. So John knew then that it was Frank who ran away with Mary and deserted her when Joan was four years old. And then, John, knowing that Helga and Paul planned to kill him, deliberately let Frank occupy his room on that fateful night. John's revenge was satisfied, and he didn't have to turn a hand. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. And now an important announcement regarding a change of time. Beginning one week from tomorrow night, on Sunday, September 13th, The Whistler will come to you at 9.15 p.m. Remember, Sunday, September 13th, at 9.15 p.m. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. There's something wrong. Terribly wrong. I'm going to wait a few more days, and when I'm sure, I'm going to take care of you, Joe. Well, what do you mean? I'm going to kill you. Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so tonight I tell you the bewildering story of Mirage. Fred Adams is an attorney, a promising young attorney. Fred is a specialist for his practice has been limited to nightclubs and bars. In other words, Fred is what is called a mouthpiece. He steps gaily down the street tonight, unaware of the two men leaning against the black sedan parked in the shadows between the lampposts. Hi, Fred. What's your hurry? Huh? Oh, hello, Joe. What are you and Mike doing in this end of town? We're waiting for you, Fred. Thought you might like to take a little ride. Ride? Yeah, the boss wants to have a little talk with you, Fred. Well, not tonight. I'm busy. Got an appointment. The boss would like to talk with you, Fred. Get in. I told you I'm busy. I'll drop around tomorrow. What are you so busy about, Fred? <laughs> How'd you like a poke in the nose? Yeah. Get in the car, Fred. Let go of me, your hood. We ain't kidding. Get in. 
What'd you two guys do without a gun? Get in. Okay, okay. Fifteen minutes later, Fred makes his way through the crowded tables of the swank Tripoli Cafe toward a door marked manager. He hesitates a moment, glances at the two men beside him, and knocks. Across the room, a beautiful woman sits behind the desk, toying with a long cigarette holder. Come in, Freddy. Come in. Well, we got him, boss. And uh, where do you think he was? <laughs> Over on Park Avenue. <laughs> How fancy. Wait outside, Joe. I want to talk to Freddy. Alone. <laughs> yeah. Sit down, Fred. Well, what's wrong? You in trouble again, Gloria? Would it matter to you if I were in trouble? Of course it would. Where have you been the past week? Has it been a week since I saw you last? You know it has. And a week is too long to suit me, Freddy. Well, you know my phone number. If anything had happened, you'd have found me. Doesn't make me very happy to think I have to go out looking for you. Kind of lets me down. Oh, for the love of Pete, what happened? Nothing's happened here at the cafe. Well, what's the matter, then? It's you, Fred. It's what you've done. I haven't done anything. Why do you think I paid your way through law school? Well, because you wanted to. <laughs> and because you needed a lawyer around. Is that all? I don't know. I thought we were together in this thing for keeps. Well, yeah. I'm still your attorney. What else do you expect of me? You have the nerve to sit there and say that. You know how I feel about you. You've always known. We've always been pals, good friends. Pals? Friends? Oh, Freddy. Now, what are you trying to say? I knew for the past three weeks that you had changed. Couldn't figure it out. But I found out this afternoon. Here it is in the paper. District Attorney's Daughter to Wed Young Lawyer. Well, what about it? Are you really in love with her, Fred? Certainly. Why shouldn't I be? I don't think you are. I knew you were campaigning for the DA in this last election. I know you're ambitious. I think you've got your eyes on a job in the DA's office more than you have on the girl. I tell you, I love Brenda Gibson, and you can think whatever you like. Is uh, she pretty? Very pretty. Young. I don't like the way you said that, Fred. I'm not so old. I didn't mean it that way. You're a very beautiful woman, Gloria. Am I? But, well, I don't know what it is. You've done everything in the world for me. No one could ask for more. And I've always cared more for you than any woman I've ever known. Until now. But there's something about Brenda. That, well, she's so different. Go on. I hate to say this to you, but I've got to make you understand. Brenda's intelligent. She comes from a fine family. She has... Well, she has culture. And I came up from the chorus. Now, Gloria, I didn't expect you to take it this way. Well, how did you expect me to take it? I didn't think you were really in love with me. It never occurred to me that you had any ideas about... about marriage. What do you think I am, a totem pole? I looked at our association more as... well, as a business arrangement. You financed me through school, and when I got up in the money, I'd... I'd pay you back. Oh, Fred, don't say any more. I know I've been blunt, but how else can I tell you? What else can I say? There's nothing you can say, but I'll tell you something. You're getting out of your element. You don't belong there. You belong here with me. And if you marry her, you'll live to regret the day you met her. Now, look, don't be like that. Don't be a hard loser. You'd be better off dead. You don't mean that, Gloria? No. No, Fred, I, I didn't mean that. Oh, darling, please go. Before I say any more, I, I know I haven't a chance, but I... Please go. I'm sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. Goodbye, Fred. I'll be seeing you. Goodbye, Gloria. <laughs> later, the papers are filled with stories and pictures of Fred and Brenda and the district attorney, and parties and dinners and teas. Read them, Gloria. Pour over them. Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams this, and Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams that. 
Read them, Gloria. Read them and weep. But meanwhile, on a train to Miami... And Fred, darling, after we spend a few days in Miami, we can fly over to Nassau. Father has a place there, and I know some wonderful people. We can have a great time. Fred? Hmm? Oh, what did you say? <laughs> Snap out of it, darling. We're on our honeymoon. <laughs> Yes, Brenda, I'm sorry. I know we're going to have a swell time. My sister Nella's spending the summer at Nassau. Why didn't Nella come home for the wedding? She was to be your bridesmaid. I told you, dear, you can't always get transportation just when you want it these days. After all, Nella's your only sister. She could have made an extra effort. Hmm? What are you thinking about? Oh, business. Business? <laughs> what business? I was thinking about my new job. Uh, how did your father have to make a place for me in the DA's office? I suppose he thinks you're a capable young attorney. Did, uh, did you ask him to appoint me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I may have had something to do with it. Uh, oh, I wanted you to start out right. You don't mind, do you? Certainly not. With swell of it. I only hope I can make good. You will. And who knows, maybe you'll be the district attorney yourself someday. I hope so. At least I'll break my neck trying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's forget about everything for the next two weeks, but I... Oh, I love you so very much, Brenda. Darling, I'll spend all my waking moments trying to make you happy. Thanks, dear. You'll never regret the day you met me. What did you say? I said you'd never regret the day you met me. Oh. I should say I won't. Not a chance in a million. <laughs> the happy honeymoon is over, and Fred and Brenda are back home. Fred is in the district attorney's office and progressing nicely. But Gloria, poor Gloria, still sits in her office at the Tripoli and broods over her fate. She scans every item in the society columns, searching for news about Fred and Brenda. And every item, every picture nurtures her resentment. <laughs> and her resentment slowly turns to hate. And finally something snaps in her mind and she begins to harbor thoughts of revenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> revenge. Joe! Joe! Yeah? What are you yelling about, Gloria? I wasn't yelling. Close the door. That sure sounded like yelling to me. I said I wasn't yelling. Okay, okay. I apologize. No, sit down. Oh, look, Gloria, what's eating you? Why don't you get out of this office? Go out and visit with the customers the way you used to. Why should I? Well, they all miss you. They're all asking, where's Gloria? I run out of excuses. I didn't call you in here to talk about the business. Well, maybe not, but I thought it was time I said something. Where's the evening paper? I uh, didn't get it. Why not? Oh, look, Gloria, snap out of it, will you? Why don't you quit hunting for news about Fred? You're only driving yourself nutty. Fred was a nice guy, but he's gone. He's married. Forget him. I can't. Well, you could try... Not as easy as that. After all, he ain't the only man walking around. There's one or two others, you know. Yeah? Well, <clears throat> there's one guy in particular who might get your mind off Fred, uh, if you'd give him a chance. Yeah? Who? Well, uh, oh, I know I'm not as good looking as Fred, and I ain't got his fancy manners. But I like you just as much as he did, and probably a lot more. Sorry, Joe. At least I wouldn't walk out on you for any other dame. If you did, I wouldn't blame you. No? No. I'd blame the other woman. She had no right to take him away from me. He belonged to me. Oh, Gloria, please, please forget it. No, I won't. I can't. I've made up my mind. Huh? What are you thinking? Where's your car? Outside. Where's your gun? In my pocket. Some people are giving a party at their country place tonight for Fred and his wife. But Gloria... But Fred was called out of town on business. They're giving the party anyway. And she'll be there. Brenda will be there. So what? We'll wait for her. And follow her when she leaves. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nothing doing. I ain't bumping off no woman. Sit down and shut up. You're crazy. You're going absolutely nutty. I'm getting out of here. You're driving me to that house. I won't. No? I wonder if the police will be interested in knowing who killed Lefty Hammond. Gloria, you, you wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't I? Well... Okay, okay, you win. Better. Go get in your car. I'll go out the back way and meet you in the alley. Gloria and Joe sit in the car in the deep shadows of a spreading tree. The hours drag on, and 
Then about 1.30 in the morning, the party breaks up and the cars begin to leave. Finally, Brenda comes through the gate, driving her own coupe. There she is. That's Brenda. Get going, Joe. Is she alone? Yes, she's alone. I sure wish you'd change your mind. Don't get too close to her. Oh, I ain't got nothing against her or Freddy either. What good's this gonna do you? You wouldn't understand. I think you've gone off your beam. Maybe you're cracked. Shut up. I'm not crazy if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. Drop back a little. They say crazy people never think they're baddie. You might feel different about this in the morning, Gloria. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. Oh. Cut it out. Cut it out. Where do you get off slapping people? Move along. You're losing her. Well, lay off that rough stuff. Or I might decide to change my mind about the whole thing. Ah, you won't change your mind. It'd be funny if something happened to you. If anything happens to me, there's a letter in my safe that tells all about you. So you better see that I get back to the Tripoli. Okay, okay. I was only kidding. Yeah. We're coming along to that long stretch now. No cars behind us and none coming. Step on it now. Run her off the road. Now. Run her off in that ditch. <laughs> trying to wreck me? Get out of that car. What is this, a holder? Get out and shut up. I haven't anything but a couple of rings. Take a rings, Joe. Well, this is a new one, a woman bandit. Any money in your purse? A few dollars. Take the money and scatter the rest of the things around. Yeah, yeah. Now, ruffle up her hair, Joe. Muss her up. You take your hands off me. Oh, have a heart, Gloria. Okay, okay, I muss her up, but good. Look, <laughs> are you? Stick your hands. What's the meaning of this? You've got what you want. Why don't you let me alone? I'll let you alone, Mrs. Adams. Who are you? Start walking. What? Start walking off through those trees. I won't. Oh, stop. Stop Get it. moving. What are you going to do? See to it that you don't do any more chiseling in, Mrs. Fred Adams. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. What? Let her have it, Joe. Joe, what are you stolen for? You missed her. Give me that gun. Well, and that's the last of Mrs. Adams. She's... She's dead. Yeah. There's a gun. Now, let's get out of here. Oh. Well, what's the matter? What are you waiting for? I... I'm kind of dizzy. Kind of sick. I can't drive, Gloria. You better drive. <laughs> and I thought you were experienced at this business. If I hadn't seen you do it, Gloria, nobody in the world could have made me believe it. Nobody. <laughs> Anything about it in this morning's paper, Joe? No. No, not a thing about it. And it was the night before last, too. I, I can't understand it. Are you... Are you sure she was dead? Of course I'm sure. Well, what do you suppose could have happened? She couldn't have walked away. Say, maybe they haven't found her or the, or the car yet, huh? Uh, it's impossible. At the main highway, hundreds of cars passed there in the course of a few hours. Well, maybe they've seen the car but just thought it was a wreck. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Hey, you better lay off that stuff, Joe. You've been drinking for two days now. Yeah, but I need it. I'm jittery. I got the willies like I never had before. Say, maybe I ought to drive by that place and see if the car's gone, Okay, huh? okay. Get back as soon as possible. Yeah, 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 sure. I can't get it off my mind. I, I don't mind telling you. I, I'm scared. Go on, go on. And quit talking so much. <laughs> Gloria, I went out there. Yeah, well, I know, I know. What did you see? Nothing. Nothing. The car was gone. I looked all around for the spot. There wasn't a sign of anything. No trinkets, no blood marks, no nothing. Well, then, then they must have found her. Uh, but why don't they say something in the papers about it? If they just said something, I, I could stand it. It's driving me nuts. Are you going to lay off that stuff? No, no, I ain't. I, I need it. I don't need it. Yeah? I don't know what you're made of, but whatever it is, it's sure tough. I never knew a woman could be as tough. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Ah, you're a jellyfish. I can understand one guy rubbing out another one for doing something against the gang, but I never thought I'd see a woman do a thing like that. And for no good reason. There was a reason. And shut up. I couldn't have done a thing like that. You could have turned me in first. There she was. Laying there covered with... Shut up. It's funny, this stuff. It don't seem to have any effect on me. It's just like some water. Get hold of yourself. Poor kid. <laughs> 
never felt so miserable in all my life. Did you get the late papers? Yeah. Here you are. Well, anything in it? No. No? Not a word. Hey, maybe. Maybe we didn't do it, Gloria. Maybe it was just a nightmare. No, we did it all right. And proper. If I don't hear something soon, I'll go crazy. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What, is, what is it? Did they find her? No. Well, what do you know about that? Well, what is it? What is it? Look at this picture. Holy smoke. It's her. It's her. Her and Fred. Mr. and Mrs. Fred Adams attend the races. When? When? Yesterday. It isn't possible. But it's her. I know it's her, Gloria. How could she? She's dead. Hey. Hey. What's the matter? Maybe. Maybe it's her. Her ghost? Don't be silly. I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving town. Look. You're in the other paper. Huh? Day before yesterday. Fred Adams and wife attend tennis match. And another picture. What could this mean? What did they say something about it? You see? You see, Gloria, it's getting you down, too. Oh, please, please, Gloria, let's pull out. It's not canny. I can't believe it. If it's in the papers, you've got to believe it. Did you double-cross me, Joe? What do you mean? Did you have blanks in that gun? Blanks? I'd certainly hate to get hit with what I had in that gun. She's dead, I tell you. But she better be. What do we do? We'll wait. That's all. Just wait. Okay. But I don't think I can stand it, Gloria. I'm going to pieces. <laughs> But they did wait. They waited for two more days, and Joe, fortified with his bottle, was able to hang on. <laughs> then Gloria began to crack under the strain of waiting. Joe, I, I can't stand it any longer. I've got to do it. Do what? I'm going to call Fred's apartment to see if she's there. I wouldn't. Hello? Is this the Adams apartment? Is Mrs. Adams there? Uh, an old friend from out of town. Yeah, thank you. She's there. Holy gee. She, she answered. Oh. I heard her. You lied to me, Joe. I didn't lie. I didn't. I had bullets in that gun. I saw her and she was dead. There's something wrong. Terribly wrong. I'm going to wait a few more days. I'll check again. And when I'm sure... I'm going to take care of you, Joe. What do you mean? I'm going to kill you. That's crazy. I don't think it would be safe to have you walking around and talking. But Gloria, listen, listen. Come on, we're going to my apartment and wait. The story's bound to break sooner or later. I, I'd rather get out of town. You're coming with me to my apartment. Get moving. Then three more days of sleepless waiting. The tenseness grows and grows... Suspense is almost stifling. Poor Joe can neither sleep nor eat, and Gloria becomes pale and drawn. Then Joe finally emerges and goes on a little scouting tour about town to see what he can learn. Then on the next night, a knock at Gloria's apartment door. Who? Who is it? It's me, Fred. Fred? Wait a minute. Hello, Gloria. What do you want, Fred? May I come in? I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, of course. Come in. Rather late, but, well, I had to talk to you. What about? <laughs> I never expected to see you around here again. Well, I was lonely. I had to talk to someone. Lonely? Well, sit down, Fred. Thanks. You look kind of tired, Gloria. What's wrong? Well... Since you mentioned it, you, you look a bit weary yourself. What's wrong with you? Oh, nothing much. I sent you a check clearing up what I owed you. Did you get it? Yeah. There's something wrong, Fred. What is it? Your whole little trouble, that's all. A sort of trouble. Domestic? Domestic? What, what do you mean? I, well, that isn't... Is it possible? Is that what you're going to say? Yes, I I thought you were quite happy with your wife. Well, things can develop suddenly. I certainly found that out. Well, what happened? Or do you want to tell me? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. 
Guess that's why I came here. You're always so darn understanding. You always knew the answers to things. But what happened? Well, I guess I really didn't belong in the upper crust. You had it figured out about right. Everything was all right until Brenda started to shape my career. Shape your career? Yes. She had everything all planned out for me. She and her father had it all figured out. I wanted to go into the DA's office and move up on my own initiative. They didn't want it that way. They wanted me to start out as a big shot. Did she leave you? Well, yes, yes. We just agreed to disagree. Oh. Well, where is she now? Her father's place, I suppose. Well, when did she leave? Yesterday. Yesterday. Are you sure it was yesterday? Of course. Why do you ask that? Well, no reason, I suppose. I, I just can't believe it. it. Seems a shame. Well, I'm very sorry for you, Fred. Believe me. I know how you feel. I was let down with a dull thud once. Were you? You should know. Oh, Gloria, I was such a fool. You were right. I should have listened to you. You could see what was coming, and I was too dumb to realize it. Have you forgiven me? Yeah. Yeah, Fred. I'd have to forgive you. I love you so much. I've never been able to forget you for one single moment. I'm sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. Fred, I... I've got a strange feeling. I don't know what it is, but... I've got a feeling you're not telling me the truth. What? You mean you don't believe me? There is something you haven't told me. What is it? Why, why, nothing. I've told you everything. I don't believe you, Fred. All right. Gloria, I, I'm... Well, I'm in a tough spot. Brenda hasn't gone away. She, She's dead. Dead? What on earth do you mean? Yeah, she was found dead beside a car a number of days ago. The day after we had a nasty argument, but I didn't do it. There have been many threats against the district attorney and member of his family. It, it may have been any one of a number of persons. Nothing's been said about it in the papers. I know that, I know it. They purposely kept it quiet, hoping the real killer would show his hand. <laughs> That's silly. Why should he? I don't know. Oh, darling, it's all a mess. I'm completely worn out over it. I know they suspect me. I don't know what to do about it. Gloria, Gloria. I've seen her. I've seen her. Who? Uh, she was standing under the lamppost at the corner. She spoke to me. She said, hello, Joe. How's, how's Gloria? Shut up, you're drunk. No, 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 it was her. It was Brenda. I ran for the elevator, and as the doors closed, she was coming into the lobby. She was terrible. Oh, pale and awful looking. You're simple, and you got the snakes. No, no, it was her. And she's coming up here. It's her. It's her. I, I don't want to see her. I can't look at her. I, I can't stand it. Joe, turn on the lights. I won't. I won't. Turn on those lights. Never mind the lights. I can see you. All three of you. Brenda. What, what do you want? So you, Gloria. Yes. Yes, I met you for the first time not many nights ago on a deserted highway. Joe, it is her. <laughs> Come out of the corner, Joe. I can see you. <laughs> Joe, the man who pulled the trigger. I didn't. I didn't. What do you want? So, Fred, you were in on the plan, too. You wanted me out of the way because of Gloria. You were back of the whole thing. No, Brenda, no, no. I had nothing to do with it. You decided you'd made a mistake, that you wanted Gloria. I didn't. I swear I didn't. Tell him, Joe. Tell him how you shot me down. You had the gun. Tell him or I'll... No, no, no. Get away from me. Don't touch me. I'll tell. I'll tell. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. She did it. Gloria did it. I couldn't. I didn't have the nerve. He's lying. I didn't do it. Go ahead, Joe. Spill it. I ain't going to take the rap for this. Gloria went off her beam when you married Brenda. She went crazy with jealousy. She knew about that party. And she made me drive her out there. We followed Brenda and then ran her off the road. She tried to make me do it, but I, I couldn't. I fired wild and Gloria grabbed the gun from me and, and let her have it. He's lying. How could she make you do it? She threatened me. She's got something Shut up, me. shut up! I don't care. She can tell what she knows about me, but I can prove that she killed Brenda. How can you prove it, Joe? I wore gloves. I still have the gun and the only fingerprints on her. The glorious. You dirty little... I figured she might try to double-cross me. What about it, Gloria? All right. All right, I did it. I did it. I shot her. I couldn't stand it any longer. Turn on the lights, Joe. <laughs> she ain't dead. It's her. It's her. Brenda ain't dead. Good Lord. Oh, yes. Brenda's dead, all right. Quite dead. And what is she? You'll find out, Gloria. What a strange quirk of fate. It was your money that caused all this. It was you who put me through law school so that I could defend you. 
But now, I'm sorry to say I'll be forced to be your prosecutor. Sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. <laughs> well, Gloria, you've come to the end of your rope. Things didn't work out as you planned. You really killed Brenda that night. But Fred got a brilliant idea. He had Nella, Brenda's twin sister, come up from Nassau and pose as his wife. That's how all the pictures appeared in the papers. And it was Nella who just walked in on you and got a confession. And how did Fred know you were the one? Well, there were several suspects. But you, Gloria, made the mistake of phoning for Brenda too many times. And the police traced your calls. <laughs> too bad, Gloria. Jealousy is a terrible thing. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production is composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, Sunday at 9.15... I, the Whistler, will return to tell you the strange story out of the fog. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I was with Danny when it happened, but I couldn't hang on to him. He ran off and left me, and I, I've been looking for him ever since. That was Captain Fowler. Something had happened to his friend Danny. I ain't going to no doctor at this time of the night. Tomorrow, maybe, but I'm not going tonight. That was Danny. Danny knew something had happened to him, but he didn't know what it was. But, Danny, you couldn't have done a thing like that. I know... Don't worry, Danny. That was Faye, Danny's girlfriend. And this is Joe Rodriguez, a fisherman. It's much better that I leave town, Danny. If I stay, I might forget I am your friend. Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the strange story of fog. Well, Danny, my boy, this is the thickest fog I've seen in this harbor in many a year. Mm-hmm. I've been a sailor man for a long time. Yeah, that's right, Captain. Can't see a single light along the entire waterfront. But we don't need light for where we're going. I know the way to the anchor pool room. Yeah. Yeah, I know too. Hey, uh, Danny. You didn't bring your gun, did you? Sure I did. Why? No, wait a minute. I, I'm not going to let you talk to Duke Moran with a gun in your pocket. Why not, Captain? Well, you... You might lose your temper and do something you'd regret. Oh, uh, what's the matter with your cap? I ain't gonna shoot anybody. I just want it in case Duke Moran gets tough. Oh, sure, I know, I know, but if he gets tough, you can handle him with your fist. Sure. Unless he tried to slip a knife through my ribs. Well, I... Ah, don't worry about the gun, Captain. I won't lose my head. 
<laughs> so Danny and Captain Fowler continue on their way toward the anchor pool room, Duke Moran's usual hangout, where Danny intends to have a showdown with Moran. But the captain is worried about Danny's gun, for he knows that Danny hates Moran to the core of his being. Now, look, son, I, I hate to keep bringing this up, but, you know, I wouldn't go storming up to the Duke and start raising the death. He borrowed money from me, and he ain't kept his word about paying it back. Oh, I know, I know, my boy, but he'll pay it back. Oh, no, he won't. He's planning to skip town and leave me holding the sack. Now, look, you're working for me, Danny, and you're my best friend. And I... Well, I'm going along to back up your claims because I was a witness when the loan was made. But look here, I I don't want to see you in no trouble. Oh, I'll take it easy. But I can tell you one thing. Hey, hey look out for that hydra. Uh, oh, look, look up. Danny. Danny. Danny, you hurt. Here, here, here. Let me help you. No. There. That's it now. Easy does it. Uh, up now. Uh, there. There we are. Uh, nasty spill. You just sit here for a bit. <laughs> oh, you... You took a real header. Yeah? How do you feel, Danny? Yeah, better let me see if you cut yourself. Yeah, uh, keep your hands off me. Who are you? Da what? What is this, a, a stick-up? Danny. Danny, are you kidding? Go away. Get away or I'll call the cops. Why? Danny, you're, you're out of your head. Get away. But... But don't you know me? Let me alone. Let me alone. Oh, come back here. No, don't go away. Come back. Danny! Danny! <laughs> Danny breaks away and quickly disappears into the fog. For a quarter of an hour, Captain Fowler searches the vicinity and finally hurries on to the anchor pool room. Hey, any of you guys here in the pool room seen Danny Price? Oh, hello there, Cap. No, I haven't seen Danny. Neither have I, Cap. Don't think he's been around. Oh, I see. Well, uh, is, is Duke Moran here? The Duke? He was here a minute ago. Where'd he go, George? Out in the alley, I think. Yeah, that's right. Some guy opened the back door and called him. Some guy opened... Oh. Uh-huh. But tell me, tell me, was it Danny? Uh, I don't know. I don't know either, Captain. We didn't pay no attention to who it was. Oh, I see. Well, okay, boys. Thanks. Later that night, groping his way along the waterfront, Captain Fowler arrives at the box office of the Crystal Motion Picture Theater. An attractive girl is selling tickets. Hello, Faye. Well... Hello there, Captain. Going to show? Oh, no, not tonight, Faye. I, I'm looking for Danny. Have you seen him? No, I haven't. And I'm sore at that big lug, too. He promised faithfully he'd be here to take me home, and it's time to close the box office right now. Well, look, Faye, I, I don't want to excite you, but I, I've got to tell you something. Danny's had an accident. An accident? Yeah. He fell down on the street. He tripped over a fire hydrant, and when he got up, you know what happened. He couldn't remember nothing. He was walking around someplace in a daze. Good heavens. Yes, I was with him when it happened, but I, I couldn't hang on to him. He, he ran off and left me, and I, I've been looking for him ever since. Well, did you tell the police? No. Well, for heaven's sake, tell him, Captain. Maybe they can find no, him. No, Faye, I, I don't want to tell the cops. Why not? There's a certain reason, and I don't want to talk about it here. Look, you wait here till I check in the cash. It'll only take a few minutes. I'll be right with you. All right, Faye. <laughs> All right, Captain, now tell me, why didn't you notify the police? Because, because Danny's got a gun on him. Oh. Yes, he was on his way to see Duke Moran, you know, about that money. Oh, yes. And he was afraid the Duke might start something. I see. You say you've been looking for Danny? Yes, I've been everywhere. Been to the casino, over to the bowling alley. Uh, have you been to Fred's Cafe? Well, no. Well, Danny goes there for coffee sometimes. Well, all right, we, we'll take a look. Fred's Cafe, why, it's in the next block, ain't it? Yeah. Oh, I tell you, Faye, we got to find that kid. He's like a crazy man. You know what he did? 
He looked me right in the face and he didn't know me. Oh, my goodness. Captain, suppose his memory never does come back. Oh, now, no, no Faye, don't, don't carry on like that. And don't you start worrying. Yeah, oh. I know how you feel. You and Danny engaged to be married and all, but don't you worry. I think everything will turn out all right. Oh, I hope so. Hey, wait! <laughs> well, listen. What's your hurry, folks? That's Danny. Well, sure it is. Uh, you going to a fire or something? I've been chasing you for a block. Oh, Danny. Are you, Faye? Oh, Danny, you're all right. Oh, sure. Sure, I'm all right. Except I... Well, I, I'm kind of mixed up. All of a sudden, I'm sitting in the Clark Hotel. And I don't remember going there at all. The Clark Hotel? Yeah. Well, so that's where you've been. Well, seems to me I, I was walking along with you, Cap. Of course you were, Danny. Don't you know what happened? You had a lapse of memory. Huh? Yeah, we've been worried to death about you. The captain and I were looking for you. Oh, Danny, I'm so glad you're all right. Oh, so I, I've been off my noggin. <laughs> sure. Don't you remember falling over that fire hydrant? Fire hydrant? Yes, that's what no. did it, Danny. When I helped you up, you, you thought I was a stick-up man. You run off down the street. Well, I'll be darned. How long ago did this happen, Cap? Well, it's been an hour ago or more. You've been in the Clark Hotel all that time. Well, how should I know? When did you come to your senses, Danny? Well, just now. I'm sitting there in the lobby wondering what it's all about when I've seen you folks passing the window. Oh, swell. But look, Danny boy, you're going to a doctor right away. What do you mean, doctor? Well, your head. You must have struck it when you fell. Oh, my head's all right. Oh, now, please, don't put up an argument, Danny. Oh, now, look. Hey, here comes an ambulance. Maybe I better flag it down and crawl in. Huh? Oh, now, don't be smart. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's no ambulance. Well, it's a police car. Yeah? Yeah. Come on, never mind the police car. Danny, come over here under the light. Let me take a look at your head. Oh, now, look, Faye. I tell you, there's nothing wrong hey, with Hey, hey, look. You see where that car's stopping? Huh? Over in front of the anchor pool room. Yeah? Well, wonder what's happened there. I, I don't know. Well, forget it. No, no, no. I, I want to find out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, so do I. Come on, Danny. Let's go over and see. <laughs> You people, get back now. Don't block the doorway. Hey, hey, what's happened, officer? The guy's been killed. Shot. Yeah? Yeah. He just found his body out in back of the pool hall. Well, who was he? Do you know? Yeah, Duke Moran. Duke Moran murdered, killed on the very night that you, Danny, with hatred in your heart and a gun in your pocket, were on your way to demand your money. Could it be that after your mind went blank, you continued on to the anchor pool room? Look at your gun, Danny. If no shots have been fired, you're all in the clear. <laughs> Did I kill him? Did I kill him? Did I kill him? Come on, Danny, let's go. Well, how do you like that? That guy gets bumped off owing me a hundred bucks. Yep, and you can kiss that dough goodbye. And how? Captain, who do you suppose killed Moran? Well, how should I know? Didn't have any enemies that I know of. Except Danny. What do you mean, except Danny? I wasn't the guy's enemy. I, I just wanted my money back, that's all. Sure, sure, I know. You know what? But you just wanted your money back. What are you getting so excited about? Hey, boys, let's not walk down this way. There's no doctor in this direction. Oh, Faye, will you let up on that doctor thing? I tell you, there's nothing wrong with my head. How do you know? Well, anyhow, I ain't going to no doctor this time of the night. Tomorrow, maybe. My head starts aching or something. Is that a promise? Oh, okay, that's a promise. Hey, uh, Danny. Yeah? You know, I went to that pool hall right after you disappeared. I thought maybe I'd find you there. Yeah? Was I there? No, no, you wasn't. I asked about Moran, and they said he'd just gone out in the alley. Somebody opened the back door and called him. Why, Captain, you must have been there just before the murder. Sure looks like it. I'm sorry now I didn't go out and back and see who Moran was with. It's a shame you didn't. Yeah. Hey, uh, Danny, I, I've been wondering... All right, go ahead and say it. It was me that called him out and back. It was me that killed him. Why, Danny. Well, that's what he's thinking, Faye. I can see it sticking out all over him. Danny, you mustn't say that. He knows I've been out of my head for an hour. Can't remember a thing, so now he's trying to pin a crime on shut me. Shut up, you fool. Shut up. Why should I want to pin a crime on you? That's what I'd like to know. What if you did kill Moran? I'm not holding it against you. You couldn't be blamed. You was off your nut. Well, I didn't kill him. How do you know? I didn't. I know I didn't. Yes, but how do you know? Oh, Don't... Captain, use your head. Danny lost his memory, and that includes his memory of Moran and his grudge against Moran and everything. Sure. 
So now what do you got to say? Well, maybe that grudge was in the back of your mind, Danny. Even while your memory wasn't working. Uh, you see, Faye, he's bound to make out I did it. Oh, no such thing. But look here, if you was mixed up in this murder, Danny, it's up to me to help you. I'm your friend. And I gotta find out about it, Danny. Let me see your gun. Huh? Let me see your gun. Now oh, the devil with you. Let him see it, Danny. That'll settle everything. Well, all right. Sure. Sure he can see it. There you are, Captain. Thanks, Danny. Well, the barrel smells of powder. Are you crazy? And two slugs have been fired, Danny. Look here. All right, so the gun's been fired. And that means I killed Moran, I suppose. You're crazy, I tell you. He's right, Captain. That gun doesn't prove a thing. He might have fired those shots anywhere for no reason at all. Sure, I've been out of my head, ain't I? Don't you worry, Danny boy. You didn't kill Moran. Of course I didn't. You couldn't have done a thing like that. Not even in a trance. So don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Don't worry, Danny, don't worry. Poor Faye. She doesn't believe her own brave talk. Deep down in her heart, she's afraid. Afraid that Danny is a killer. It is nearly midnight now. Danny and Captain Fowler have returned to their boat, the fishing boat Dolphin in the harbor. Danny sits on the deck, gazing morosely into the fog. Well, hadn't you better turn in, kid? You ought to get some sleep. Oh, I couldn't sleep. Stick here a minute, will you, Cap? I'd like to talk to you. Well, sure. I, I'm sorry I blew my top the way I did when we was ashore. Oh, that's all right, Danny. I know you was thinking of my interest when you asked to see the gun. Well, sure I was. All kidding aside, it looks pretty much like I bumped off Moran, doesn't it, Cap? Well, Danny, to be honest with you, it does. Still, there's room for doubt. And if I was you, I'd lay low and say nothing. And I know one thing. I could never be convicted of murder, even if I did do it. Why not? Because I was suffering from amnesia. Yeah. The trouble is, how are we going to prove that? How are we going to prove it? Well, couldn't you prove it? You was there when it happened. You saw me go slug nutty. Sure, but who's going to believe me? I'm your friend. They think I was lying to save your neck. Yeah. yeah I see what you mean. The things look pretty bad then, don't they? Ah, oh, now look, Danny. Don't go hanging yourself in advance. You know, maybe it's like Faye said. Maybe you just happened to fire them shots. Hey, listen. Hmm? I hear a motorboat. <laughs> so what? It's coming this way. Hear it? Well... Yeah, sure, sure, I hear it. It's the cops. They're coming here to ask questions. Oh. I'm getting out of here, Captain. No, 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 you keep your shirt on. I'll hail the boat and find out who it is. Now, you wait right here. Ahoy there! Ahoy! Who is it? It's me, Joe Rodriguez. Oh, there you are, Danny. It's only Portuguese Joe. What's he doing out here this time of night? Well, I don't know. Here is my life, Captain. You make me fast. I'm coming aboard. Okay, Joe. How'd you know we'd be up this late? Yeah. They just took a chance, Danny. But I am glad you are up. Oh, well, don't tell me you ran out of live bait again. Oh, no. They got plenty of live bait. Oh? What can we do for you, Joe? Captain, I got a little business proposition I would like to talk over with Danny. And I would like to talk to him private. Private? Oh, now, wait a minute. Anything you got to say to me, you can say in front of the captain. Oh, no, Danny. This is private. Very private. Oh, see, well, that's okay, kid. I, I'll go below. I was about to turn in anyway. Thanks, Joe, Captain. Oh, don't keep him up too long, Joe. He needs some sleep. Uh, it'll just be a few minutes, Captain. Good night. Good night. Well, what's on your mind? Danny, I ain't fed up with these town. Business is rotten here. They want to go to Seattle. Yeah? And I need a little money, Danny. Two hundred dollars. And I want for Jew. should let me have it. Are you kidding? Ain't you got two hundred dollars? Sure. Sure I have, but I'm getting married in a few days. I need every cent of God. Oh, yeah? The sweet young lady who works at the Crystal Theater, huh? You'll be very happy with her, Danny. <laughs> you bet I will. But you'll be much more happy if you give me the money so I can get out of town, Danny. What do you mean? I am your friend, Danny. And I do not wish to cause you any trouble. But I know something about you that nobody else in this world knows. 
Not one soul. Yeah? Yeah. Tonight I am in an alley behind the anchor pool room. There is much fog, but I can see a little bit because there is a light. I see you shoot to Moran. Twice. To the heart. You're a dirty liar. So, you see, then it's much better I should leave town. If I stay here, I might get drunk someday and forget I am your friend. <laughs> I might talk, Danny. You climb in that boat of yours and get back to shore. Go on or I'll throw you overboard. You come to see me tomorrow, huh? Before noon? If you don't come by noon, well, maybe I get drunk, huh? <laughs> Cap, Cap, you awake? Oh, oh, yes, yes, Dan. Well, there's no room for doubt now. I'm the guy that did it. What? How do you know? Portuguese Joe was an eyewitness. He was there in the alley, saw the whole thing. Oh, no, no, wait a oh, minute. That's right, Cap. The dirty rat came out here to blackmail me. Tried to shake me down for 200 bucks. Said I'd have to dig it up by tomorrow noon or he'd start talking. Well, I'll be darned. Kid, kid, I guess it's time we started doing some fast thinking. Now, that ain't necessary, Cap. I'm clearing out tonight. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. Don't get panicky now. Now, let's, let's give it some thought. Oh, no, no, I'm on my way, Cap. No fooling. Well, well, where are you going? I don't know. But I'm going for good. I won't be back. You won't be? Oh, now, look here. What about, what about Faye? What about your wedding? Well... That's just a broken dream, Cap. Oh, damn. Well, at least you're, you're going to see her before you go, ain't you? No. Well, Danny, what's the matter with you? It ain't fair of you to run out on Faye. It's the fairest thing in the world. I prolong the agony. There's got to be a clean break. Oh, but, but Faye's such a grand kid. And she'll wait for you. Faye's loyal. Yes, sir, Danny. After this thing blows over, you'll find Faye right here waiting for you. I don't want her to wait for me. And I ain't coming back. Can't you understand that? You think I'd marry Faye now? Me, a killer? Oh, yeah. I know. I love that girl. I wouldn't bring disgrace on her. And it would be disgrace even if I'd cleared myself of the charge. I'd still be a killer. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you would. Well, I guess there's no use talking to you. You won't listen to a word I say. No, Cap. I've made up my mind. I'm going to pack my grip now and go ashore. Mm. <laughs> ah, golly, kid, I sure hate to lose you. Yeah, I, I hate to go, too, Cap. You've been a prince to me. More like a brother than a boss. Well, all I can say is thanks, Danny. Even when you knew I was saving up my money to, to buy a boat of my own, to go into competition with you, you never said a word. Well, why should I? Oh, this is a free country. Every man has a right to advance himself. And, uh, about Faye, I wish you'd explain to her. You know what to say. Well, not quite as good, as good a talker as you are, Danny, but I'll try. You know something, Cap? I wish you and Faye'd get married. I know you'd make her happy. Me and Faye? Oh, no, she wouldn't have me. Don't be too sure about that. She'll forget about me after a while. But explain things to her, will you? Well, okay, Danny. I'll try. I'll do my best. Well, I'm going to hit the first freight train out of town. So long, Captain. <laughs> What are you doing here? Oh, Danny, I'm so glad I saw you. I was about to get a boat and go out to the Dolphin. Yeah? I've got some wonderful news for you. What? At least I think I have. What caliber is your revolver? Well, it's a 38. I thought so. Danny, you didn't kill him. You didn't kill Moran. He was shot with a 45. Huh? Yeah. I just came from the police hospital. They took the bu bullets from Moran's body. They were bullets from a 45. Oh, no. No, no, that can't be right. It is right, Danny. Well, there's some mistake, honey. Look. I hadn't figured on telling you this, but there was an eyewitness to the murder. Portuguese Joe, the bait peddler. He's just been out to the boat trying to shake me down for some hush money. Well, he's a liar if he says you did it. Oh, no, honey. You got a bum steer about them bullets. I didn't, I tell you. I got it straight from the doctor. What's more, I've been to the Clark Hotel. The 
clerk said you were there for practically an hour, sitting by the window. That means you went there right after you left the captain, so you couldn't have been to the pool room. Well, I'll be darned. Now, look, Faye, suppose you go out to the dolphin. Here, here, take this grip. Tell the captain what you just told me. And tell him I'm paying a visit to Portuguese Joe right now. this thing settled. Sure, sure. Don't you got any money? Joe, you didn't see me shoot Moran. Nah, damn it. I hope you're not going to put up no argument. You lied to me, and I'm here to get the truth. Now, look, Danny. Come on, admit it. You lied to me, didn't you? No. No, you shoot. Oh, you're... Oh, no, no. Let me go. Let me go. I'll choke the living oh. daylights out of you, you rat. Oh. Come on. Come on, tell me you lied. Come clean. You're going to give me the lowdown on this whole rotten business. Come on now, start talking. The fog has lifted now. The eastern sky heralds the approach of dawn. As Danny returns to the dolphin, he finds Faye standing on the deck. Danny, I thought you'd never get back. It's almost daylight. Well, I had a long ways to go, honey. Joe lives way out at the end of the Channel Street Wharf. That's where his bait shack is. Well, what'd you find out? Did you face him with his lie? I sure did. Is the captain in his cabin? No, he's not. He's uh, gone ashore. Gone ashore? Danny, there's something wrong with the captain. He's been acting very queerly. Yeah? When I told him you'd gone to see Portuguese Joe, his, his face went as white as a sheet. Then he went over to his desk and wrote a note. Sealed it in an envelope and told me to give it to you when you come back. I'll bet I know what's in it. What? A confession. But I won't need it now. I got one from Joe. What do you mean? Honey, the captain's been framing me. Framing you? Yeah, that's right. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Remember he said he didn't go out in back of the pool hall to see who it was that called Moran out in the alley? Yes. Well, he lied. He did go out there. And he saw the murder committed. He knew who did it. Why, Danny. And right then, he got a bright idea. He figured he'd make me believe I committed that murder. So I'd take it on the land. Get out of town. You see, honey? Well, uh, uh, why would he do that? Because he was in love with you. What? Our wedding day was getting closer, and the captain was half crazy with jealousy. He wanted me out of the picture so that he could marry you. Oh, Danny, I can't believe that. It's true, honey. Joe told me. I'd have got a lot more out of Joe, too, only he broke loose from me and dived into the water. Last I seen of him, he was swimming away. Well, what, what about the murder? Did you find out who killed Moran? I got a hunch that Joe himself did it. After he left, I looked around his shack. And I found an I.O.U. there signed by the Duke. You did? Then the Duke owed Portuguese Joe money, too. Yep. And I figured the captain made Joe a proposition. If Joe'd come here and make me believe I was the killer, the captain wouldn't squeal on him. Sure, Danny. That makes sense. Well, I... I'd better see what the captain wrote. Yeah. Open it up, Danny. Uh, dear Danny, I suppose you know everything by now. I haven't got the nerve to face you, kid, so I'll be the one to hit the freight. You won't need to save any more money for that boat. I've signed over the dolphin to you. You'll find the papers in my desk. Good luck, Danny. And make Faye a good husband. Yes, the captain was the villain in our story. But wait, what about Danny's gun with the two empty shells? That doesn't fit into our solution at all. Or does it? 
Remember when the captain and Danny were on their way to the pool hall and Danny stumbled over the hydrant? The fog was pretty thick, you know. The captain didn't have a bit of trouble in slipping that gun out of Danny's pocket. He wanted to make sure Danny didn't use it on Moran. And later, after the captain had formulated his plot against Danny, it was a simple matter for him to fire a couple of shots from the gun and then slip it back into Danny's pocket when he met Faye and Danny on the street. Yes, the fog sometimes has its advantages. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Herbert Connor, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, same time, 9.15, I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the unusual story of... Jealousy. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Golden Radio Hour. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to talk about those few minutes you have while you're waiting for dinner every evening. That's the perfect time for a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. You really feel like you're enjoying the good things of life when you take time for a glass of Petri Sherry. Hold that glass of Sherry to the light. Look at it. It's a beautiful dark amber. Yes, and Petri Sherry is clear and fragrant, the way a good wine should be. Now taste it. You've got something. That Petri Sherry has a real heart-of-the-grape flavor. Oh, and look, if you like Sherry dry, you know, not sweet, Petri makes a fine dry Sherry. It's called Petri Pale Dry. And if you don't know yet which you prefer, the regular sherry or the dry, why not try both? Don't buy one, buy two. But just be sure you always buy Petri. And now let's look in on our old friend, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Draw up your usual chair. I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, how did the story begin, Doctor? It was one day in the autumn of 1887, I remember. Holmes and I were seated on either side of the fire in our Baker Street lodgings. The great man, his eyes half closed, his long, thin fingers pressed together, lay back in his chair, filling the room with large blue clouds of tobacco smoke discoursing on one of his favorite subjects, Professor Moriarty. I can almost hear him now, Mr. Bartell, as he said... Absolutely, Mr. Crime Watson. He's the organizer of half that is evil and nearly all that is undetected in this great metropolis. Oh, oh surely that's an exaggeration, oh, Holmes. my dear fellow. He has a brain of the first order, and his agents are numerous and splendidly organized. He himself sits motionless like a spider in the center of his web. But that web has a thousand radiations, and he uh, knows every quiver of each one of them. <laughs> it's fortunate for me that there's only one Moriarty. 
If every criminal were equally astute, I'd be in bankruptcy within the year. I don't think you need to worry about bankruptcy, Holmes. As I came in just now, I picked these letters up from the whole table and slipped them into my pocket. Uh, here you oh, thanks, old chap. Uh, they didn't look like bills to me. I observed the crest of the Duke of Carlisle on the top envelope. Oh, oh dear me. Five hundred guineas. His grace is extremely generous in his evaluation of my services. I don't agree, after all. You did save him from a shocking scandal. Oh, listen to this, Watson. <laughs> I seen you yesterday when you come to the cricket match. You wasn't watching the cricket. If you value your life, keep your filthy long nose to yourself. <laughs> and it's signed Joe the Butcher. Long nose. Who knows? Joe the Butcher. A minor criminal that I was instrumental in sending to prison for a short term. He flatters himself, though. I was watching the cricket. No idea that Joe was back in practice again. I must keep an eye on him. Hello? Letter on Carlton Hotel stationery. Now, I... I said, this is interesting. Very interesting. Oh, what you say, Holmes? Dear Mr. Holmes, I've been informed that you are a man of ability and discretion. My life is in grave danger and I need your help. Upon receipt of this letter, come to my hotel at once. I shall be expecting you. And it's signed, uh... François Dulac. Oh, it's rather peremptory, isn't it? No, please, just come to my hotel at once. Who is this uh, Dulac? Anyway? What's not the love? Yeah? We were talking of Mariotti just now. I have a feeling that this letter may lead us to him. Well, what makes you say that? François Dulac, the writer of this letter, is recognized in France as the one indisputable authority on the paintings of Jean-Baptiste Greuze. Well, I still don't see the connection with Mariotti. If there is one thing Mariotti loves... More than the dazzling abstractions of mathematics and even more dazzling achievements of crime, it is the paintings of Greuze. The suggested combination of impending danger and a Greuze expert spells Moriarty to me. Get your hat and coat, old fellow. We're off to the car to tell you, Monsieur de Lac, at once. Someone to unlock the door? No, 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 Chad. Huh? Don't want to attract attention to our prospective plan. I tell locks shouldn't be very hard to pick. Here. Yeah. I think the skeleton key should do the trick quite easily. Well, the man at the desk downstairs said that Monsieur Dulac was in his room. You know, Watson. He said he thought he was in his room. Uh-huh. Easier than I anticipated. Come on, let's go in. Doesn't look as if anyone's occupying this room. No signs of any personal belonging. No clothes hanging in the wardrobe, no luggage. Yeah, yet he is still registered here. Hello. What's this stain on the carpet by the bed here? Great Scott, is it... It's a blood stain, Watson. Blood stain? And the stain is still damp. I'm afraid we're too late. Come on, we can do no more good here. You're not giving up, Holmes? No, of course not, my dear fellow. Let's see what we can find out from the hotel manager. I refuse to believe that in the 19th century a distinguished foreigner can vanish into thin air. Yes, Monsieur Dulac did have a visitor early on today, Mr. Holmes. Do you remember his name? I think it was Perkins or Parsons, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Can you describe his appearance? I think so, Mr. Holmes. He was a very tall gentleman, mm -hmm. tall and thin, with deep-sunk eyes. Clean-shaven? Oh, yes, sir. He had a high forehead and a funny way of moving his head from side to side. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Holmes. That's almost an exact description of Mariotti. Exactly, Watson. Have you seen Monsieur Dulac since this uh, Mr. Perkins or Parsons called on him? No, I haven't, sir. But his visitor came back only an hour ago. He had some men with him. They carried some large packages out of the hotel. Packages? But not luggage, eh? No, packages, Mr. Holmes. Has Monsieur Dulac received any other visitors since he arrived here? None that have been here to see him, sir. But I understand that Sir Henry Davenant has been most anxious to get in touch with him. Sir Henry Davenant? Thank you. I'm extremely obliged to you. Come on, Watson. Always proud to be of service to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. The plot begins to clear, Watson. Well, what makes you say that, huh? Sir Henry Davenant is a millionaire whose art collection is world famous. A year ago, the papers were full of his latest acquisition, the gem of his collection, Jean-Baptiste Greuze painting, Young Girl with a Gazelle. And now it would appear that for some reason Moriarty wishes to prevent a meeting between Sir Harry Davenant and Monsieur Dulac, a Greuze expert. Now, do you see why the plot begins to clear? Very good, but what are you going to do? Davenant said to, uh, there's something about permit. He won't have anything to do with officials, interviewers, and people like that. But we know that he wishes to consult an expert on the paintings of Jean-Baptiste Peurs. 
The next move should be obvious, old chap. Gracious me, you mean that you'll impersonate one? Certainly. If a grower's expert is what he wants, then a grower's expert is what he's going to get. Holmes, I must say, your disguise is, is amazingly effective. Uh, Missy, uh, you do me the great honor. Uh, if I appear convincingly astute, Dr. Watson, how can I fail to convince Sir Henry Davenant? Oh, my dear fellow, it's uh. marvelous. <laughs> Pulling the good. Yes. Here we are, sir. <laughs> Sir Henry's house. Let's hope for the best, old fellow. Uh, I don't know exactly what a French art expert looks like, but I could certainly believe that you were. I only hope that I can be equally convincing in the role of a patron of the art. You certainly look your part, old chap. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Uh, my name is Vernet. Andre Vernet. I am most anxious to make the acquaintance of Sir Henry Derrand. I'm afraid that Sir Henry is extremely difficult to see, sir. I can tell him you're here, but he very rarely gives interviews. That is a great disappointment to me. Perhaps uh, you would just go and tell him I am a pupil or and a disciple of the great François Dulac. I would do what I can, sir. Uh, come in, won't you, gentlemen? Uh, wait here for a moment. I'll take your message. Uh, what was the name again, Bernay, sir? Bernay, André Bernay, and this gentleman is Mr. Watson. Very good, sir. Well, we got into the house. Now let's hope that you can impress the master of it. Now, there's an easier task, I fear, old fellow. Hmm. I've had to match opinions on the paintings of Greer's with an expert. Now, your knowledge of the subject is uh, somewhat sketchy, I'm afraid. Yes, and mine is absolutely nil. Yes, Greer's was a naturalistic painter who flourished at the close of the 18th century, and though his paintings command a fabulous fee in this day and age, he himself died in great poverty. So... Shh, shh, shh. Someone's coming. Monsieur Vernet. Will you and Mr. Watson come with me, please? Sir Henry is most anxious to meet you. Merci, mademoiselle. My name is Violet Jackson. I look after Sir Henry's art collection. Indeed, a very pleasurable job, I'm sure, my dear. From what I hear, he has a magnificent gallery. He has one of the finest in the world. Yes. His latest acquisition is the famous young girl with a gazelle by Quirz. Oh, but I'm sure you know all about that, Monsieur Vernet. I think you said in your message you were a student of the great Dulac. I have that inestimable privilege, ma'am. Oh, this is Sir Henry's study. Come in. Oh, uh, thank you, Violet. Uh, you may go. Yes, Sir Henry. Uh, you're uh, Verne, I'm sure, and uh, this is Mr. Watson? That's right, Sir Henry. Mr. Verne is staying with me. I see. Well, uh, sit down, won't you? Uh, look, Verne, uh, you're a friend of Dulac's, aren't you? I think I may claim that on her, Monsieur. Then why in thunder can't I get in touch with him? He's staying at the Carlton Hotel, isn't he? He uh, was... Uh, or has been staying there, monsieur. Oui. I've left half a dozen messages for him, asking him to come and see me, and he hasn't answered one of them. I can't understand it. It's most important that I see him. Uh, monsieur is in some trouble, perhaps? Perhaps. Uh, now, you fellows are familiar with the painting by Greuze, the young lady with the gazelle, aren't you? Oh, yes, Sir Henry. Yes, indeed. Oh, you are, eh? Uh, 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 what do you think of it? Well, uh, uh, one, one of the greatest uh, works, in my oh, humble opinion, monsieur. Uh, of course, I have only seen a reproduction, uh, but it seemed to me uh, to have a freshness and vigor of the flesh tints, a great firmness and brilliance of line. You are indeed uh, fortunate uh, to own it, monsieur. Hmm, don't know how fortunate. cost me 40,000 pounds. I still say you are most fortunate, monsieur. Would you grant me the honor of... Uh, to examine the original? Well, I don't know whether I ought to. I, I've had to guard it very carefully ever since this... Uh, uh, well, but perhaps in your case I can make an exception. You received threats regarding the painting, Sir Henry? Yes, I have, Mr. Watson. And they've worried me so much that I've even thought of engaging the services of a private detective. Oh, indeed, monsieur. A very interesting... Uh, the Duke of Carlisle strongly recommended a fellow by the name of uh, Sherlock Holmes. I was seriously thinking of going to him. Instead of which... He has come to you, Sir Henry. A fact that will save us all a lot of time, I'm sure. Well, what kind of horseplay is this, sir? Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Then why do you come here masquerading as a French art expert? Because I, I'd heard of your aversion to giving interviews, and I wanted to see you urgently. I felt that in the character of a supposed Greuze expert, I was uh, most likely to gain immediate admission. Well, then, uh, your friend here? Uh, Dr. Watson, my colleague. Well, it's all turned out for the best, Sir Henry. You wanted to consult Mr. Holmes, and he was most anxious to see you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm glad you fellows are here. Uh, you see, I'm devilish worried about that grows of mine. Oh, why, Sir Henry? Well, I bought it at an auction. There was another man bidding against me all the time, 
And when it was finally knocked down in my name, he became most insulting. He seemed unable to bear not owning the picture himself. He told me bluntly that I didn't enjoy it long. Well, I didn't think much about it at the time, but lately I've been receiving postcards repeating the threat. I don't like it. That's a fact. Well, you've kept those postcards, I hope, Sir Henry. No, threw them in the fire where they belong. Oh, that's a pity, sir. Can you recall the name of this uh, bidder at the auction who threatened you? No, didn't know his name. Can you describe his appearance? Well, let me see. He was uh, tall, uh, clean-shaven. Mm -hmm. oh, curious habit of moving his head from side to side. Moriarty again. Yes, old chap. My supposition was correct. Now, tell me, Sir Henry, is the painting safely guarded? Well, I'd say that it was impregnable, Holmes. It's not in my regular galleries. I had a special strong room built for it when I started to receive threats. It has a lock to which only I know the combination, and a special clockwork device that so controls the room that even I can only enter it uh, during certain daytime hours. And yet, Sir Henry, with such thorough precautions, you appear to be frightened. Why? Well, I hardly dare trust my own shadow, Holmes. But as you possibly know, one of Greer's pupils, a certain Madame Ledoux, uh, imitated his paintings most successfully. Oh, several of the experts were fooled. I confess that I've been frightened lately, uh, since I received the threat, that a clever man might try and substitute a fake painting for the original, if indeed he hasn't already done so. Uh, that's why I was so anxious to get in touch with Dulac. Uh, he'd know a fraud at once. But a substitution would be impossible if you're the only one that knows the, the combination to the lock of the strong room. Well, that's what my logic tells me too, Doctor. And yet I'm very uneasy, I must confess. It's still daylight, Sir Henry. Would it be possible for us to examine the painting now? Well, oh, certainly. Uh, by the way, what happened to Francois de Lac? Did he uh, leave the Cotton Hotel? He did, sir. The circumstances of his departure made us think uh, uneasy. In what way? His room was empty. There were no signs of luggage, and yet... Come in. Yes, Violet, what is it? This note was just left for you, Sir Henry. I was asked to deliver it at once. Who left it, Violet? Well, he didn't give his name, Sir Henry. But he was a tall, thin man with deep sunk eyes. Oh. What's the note say? Wait. Well, it's the same fellow again. Listen to this. I told you you wouldn't enjoy the painting for long. You didn't, did you? It's cut it's money off. <laughs> Holmes, I don't see anything funny about this. What makes you laugh? It's obvious uh, that my painting has been stolen. I find nothing funny about it either, Sir Henry. But I must admit a certain pleasure. Once again, I'm crossing swords with an adversary who was more than worthy of my steel. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to remind you that Petri Sherry could really be called the all-round, all-American wine. That's right, Petri California Sherry. Now, the reason I say that is... Because Petri Sherry is not only a swell before dinner wine, but it's a perfect wine for almost any occasion. When company drops in, serve Petri Sherry. After dinner, when you're just sitting around chatting, Petri Sherry again is just right. Believe me, you couldn't ask for a better all-round wine than Sherry. You couldn't ask for a better tasting Sherry than Petri. Petri Sherry. Well, Dr. Watson, you've kept me on the edge of my chair so far with your story. What happened next? Did Sir Henry Davenant take you to see his famous man? He did, Mr. Bartell. Together with Miss Violet Jackson, we descended countless flights of stairs. Doors opened where no one expected a door to exist. Finally, after walking down a narrow stone staircase that turned and twisted, we came up against a blank wall. It seemed that we could go no further. But a time clock, a combination of numbers, and a hidden door slid back. We stood in the interior of a small room. A room with no windows and hardly any light. An oil painting stood on an easel before us. It was incomparable Greer's painting of the young girl with the gazelle. We stood looking at it for a brief moment and then... Sir Henry Davenant said... Oh. Heaven, the painting is still safe. Yes, Sir Henry. If it still is the same painting... It looks the same, Mr. Holmes. Well, certainly it does to me. The fact remains that... Only Francois Dulac could tell us if it is the same or a brilliant copy. Yes, and Monsieur Dulac has been uh, silenced. So it would seem. Of course, we could ask the expert at the British Museum to pass judgment. Yeah, but how could it have been stolen? 
It would be impossible to smuggle it out of here and replace it with a copy. There's only one way of being absolutely certain. With your permission, Sir Henry, I should like to make a test. You're going to take a sample of the paint, Mr. Holmes? Yes, that should give us certain proof. Well, very, very, very well. Uh, yeah, you'd better do it, Violet. Uh, but be careful. Remember, the painting cost me 40,000 pounds. A minute fragment of paint will be sufficient for the test, won't it, Mr. Holmes? Indeed. But with my fingernail, Sir Henry, I'll scratch off a tiny sample. Firstly, I think it's a dashed fine bit of work, whoever painted it. There you are, Mr. Holmes. Is that enough paint Splendid, Miss Jackson, splendid. Thank you. Please put it on this envelope for me, will you? That's it. And now, Sir Henry, I shall return to Baker Street and analyze this paint. Within an hour, I shall be able to tell you whether the painting is worth 40,000 pounds or a plug farthing. Did you, uh, make the test? I did, Sir Henry. And? I'm afraid there's no doubt that your painting is a fraud. A oh, fraud. A sample of paint that I examined was manufactured not more than 25 years ago. And Greus died in 1805. Well, I still say that if the fine painting, whoever did it, I wouldn't mind having it myself. I agree, <laughs> Dr. Watson. In fact, I'd be glad to buy it. It's a brilliant copy. And more than likely, it was done by Madame Ledoux. You're remarkably quiet, Sir Henry. 40,000 pounds. Forty thousand. Pounds. No, 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 sir. Put that knife down. Holmes, help me grab him. Uh, don't worry, gentlemen. I'm not about to commit suicide in despair, if that's what you're thinking. Now, why are you grasping that knife, sir? Because I have work to do in my strong room. I'm going to use this knife to slash that lying camera into forty thousand pieces. <laughs> Well, I suppose you're right, Violet. It's childish to mutilate this daub. It's a brilliant fraud, Sir Henry. I'd like to have it. I'll buy it from you gladly. Buy it from me? You can have it. Go and make arrangements to have the wretched thing taken away at once. I don't want any frauds in my collection. Yes, Sir Henry, and thank you. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'll pay you any fee you name if you can tell me how the original painting was stolen. Well, Sir Henry, the how must here precede the who. And the how, I must confess, seems impossible. Yes, I quite agree. This is a sealed metal room. The only entrance is through the door. That has a combination that only you know, Sir Henry. It's perfectly true. It's impossible for anyone to enter this room without my being present. Or I would have sworn it was. Let's examine these walls, Watson. Uh huh. Ventilator. No method of entrance here. Huh. Well, you'll find no flaws, I'm sure. This room is built like a giant safe. And the time lock on the door is equally solid. Is the time lock working now? Yes. It started five minutes ago when we opened the door. But don't worry. It's perfectly safe with the door open. But when the door's closed, it couldn't be reopened again, I take it, Sir Henry. Not until the morning, Doctor, no. I had the lock specially designed. Very ingenious. This presents as pretty a problem as ever I've tackled, Sir Henry. A large painting stolen and a fake one substituted in a sealed room to which only you have access. I must confess the how seems utterly impossible. Remember what you always say, Holmes. Throw out the impossible and whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the possible. Uh, let's consider the who for a moment. Is your butler absolutely reliable? Absolutely. How about Miss Jackson? Oh, completely trustworthy. Brought letters of recommendation from most of the leading art galleries in London. Intelligent, too. <laughs> and serious-minded. She's made a deep study of mathematics as well as her knowledge of painting. Mathematics? How do you know that, Sir Henry? Well, she had a book with her the other day. <laughs> I'm surprised that the title could have been a novel, but no... It was called The Dynamics of an Asteroid, and it was inscribed to her by the author. Dynamics asteroid, and inscribed to her by the author. Thank heavens for your memories, Henry. That book was written by Professor Moriarty. Violet Jackson must be an accomplice of his. Violet? What the, I... the door! Someone slammed it shut! Yes, and it's not very hard to guess who that someone is. Oh, but I, I can't believe that Violet is a criminal. Look, look, look. There's, a, there's a note being pushed under the door. I'll strike a match, will you, old fellow? Right, you are. What to say, Holmes? Forgive my unladylike eavesdropping, but with Mr. Sherlock Holmes as near the truth as he is, I'm afraid 
it would be unwise for me to remain here any longer. On the other hand, you are in no danger of smothering in the strong room, but your imprisonment should delay my pursuit till morning. Father Jackson. He's escaped at home. Don't worry, Watson. If Jackson's failure to procure the painting for Moriarty will land her in a far worse dilemma than anything we could subject her to. Moriarty has never tolerated failure on the part of his minions. A brilliant plot, Oakle, a brilliant plot. Moriarty is at the zenith of his powers. How fortunate that we were able to foil him. What do you mean, foil him? My painting's been stolen. Your painting, Sir Henry? Oh, no, 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 no. It's, uh, it's here in this room. What on earth are you talking about, Holmes? You reminded me of my own dictum, Watson. I discarded the impossible. It was impossible that the picture had been stolen, therefore it had not been stolen. You mean that this painting is the original, Gross? Yes, yes, of course, sir. Surely the whole plot is crystal clear now. Uh, just about as clear as porridge to me. <laughs> well, then, let me explain. The whole episode of Francois Dulac, the note to me, the empty hotel room, and the significant bloodstains and the apparent disappearance of Dulac were all part of Moriarty's plot. The real Dulac never left France. Moriarty created him in England to lure me into the case. Why in thunder should he want to do that, Holmes? Yes, I should think you're the last person he'd want on the scene. Oh, on the contrary, sir. He knew that I'd grab at his bait, the apparent murder of a Greer's expert who would make it seem likely that your painting had a substitute, Sir Henry. He wanted me to test the painting, which I did. I fell into his trap very neatly. The paint, Holmes, you said that it was no more than 20 years old. Yes, my dear fellow, the uh, answer should be obvious. I see it. Violet was his accomplice, had prepared the painting beforehand, and carefully scraped off a piece of modern paint. Exactly, Sir Henry. And Moriarty had assumed, quite correctly as it turned out, that as soon as you thought your painting was a fraud, you'd want to get rid of it. And that girl was going to take it out of this house with your full approval, and of course turn it over to Moriarty. What a fantastic scheme. A devilishly clever one, old chap. If it hadn't been for your chance remark about the book on mathematics, Sir Henry, I'm very much afraid the young lady with the gazelle might even now be on her way out of your house. Holmes... I can't tell you how grateful I am. And I'm going to express that gratitude in a very material manner, I assure you. Thank you, Sir Henry, but I wouldn't dream of accepting a fee for this case. I've been shockingly obtuse. I might simply have let them walk away with your treasure right under our noses. Uh, we locked in here for, for the night, sir? I'm very much afraid so, Dr. Watson. So I shouldn't be surprised if the butler notices our disappearance and comes looking for us. But he won't be able to open the door... It'll need a professional locksmith to get us out of here. Oh, really? It looks as if we'll spend a, a very cheerful evening. <laughs> ah, don't be gloomy, my dear fellow. Oh, gloomy, so to work You're locked in with one of the loveliest girls in history, and she's genuine at that. Strike another match, old chap, shall we? What? Let's, uh, let's look at her once again. Doctor, that was not only a swell story, but I really learned something. Oh, good, 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 Mr. Bartell. And just what did you learn? Well, uh, this fellow, Gers, the painter. Yeah? <laughs> I know this must sound stupid to you, but until you mentioned his name, I'd never heard of him before. You, you know, Holmes mentioned his name to me. I've never heard of him before either. <laughs> but then we'll never learn about the good things in this world unless somebody tells us. Exactly. That's the way I feel about Petri wine. Oh, no, no, just wait, wait a minute. Here's the way I look at it. There are thousands of people who know about Petri wine and love it, right? Yes, but... But the... even though it's a wonderful wine, there must be some people who don't know about it. So I tell them about it. And I tell them about the Petri family and how they've been making wine for generations and how they've been handing on down from father to son, from father to son... The fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. Yes, and when I tell them that the name Petri on a bottle of wine is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine, well, that's all you have to know. So it adds up to this. If you want a fine wine for any occasion, you want a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California 
invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Brooks in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And right now, I'd like to just briefly mention an idea you ought to try tomorrow night, just before you sit down to dinner. Just pour yourself a glass of that good Petri California sherry. Petri sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. Its cheerful, glowing amber color looks festive, and, well, it sort of lends an air of importance to the occasion. And as for the wine itself, just taste it. That Petri sherry is just ordinary wine, no sir. One sip, and you know that wonderful sun-ripened grapes went into its making. Yes, and you know that Petri Sherry was carefully watched over every step of the way. Incidentally, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. Regular sherry and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure just which kind you and your friends will like best, try them both. Don't buy one, buy two. But when it comes to sherry, or any other wine for that matter, be sure you always buy Petri. <laughs> Now, I'm certain our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Punctual to the minute, as always. <laughs> well, this is one doctor's appointment I'm eager to keep. <laughs> I should have said something, boy. Draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Well, Doctor, today's April the 1st. Did uh, anyone try and play any jokes on you? Yes, you did, Mr. Bartell, but I'm happy to say that nobody caught me. Uh, not as in the story that I'm going to tell you tonight, but an April Fool's Day prank, certainly called a bullseye. I see you have the dispatch box out again, Doctor. Been refreshing your memory? Yes, I have. The... I'll tell you, when I tell you the adventure took place in 1881, I think you'll agree that after such a lapse of time, a man can hardly rely on memory alone. 1881? Doctor, tonight's adventure must have been one of the really early ones. Yes, it was indeed. In fact, to be exact, it took place only a little while after Sherlock Holmes and I had first met and taken up lodgings together. How was the great detective in those early days? <laughs> profound mystery to me, Mr. Bartell, to give you an example, my boy. I'd shared at Baker Street lodgings with him for over a month before I was even certain of his profession, the knowledge of which I learnt to my awe and astonishment when our first adventure together took place. Oh, that was the one you called uh, a study in scarlet, wasn't it, That's Doctor? That's right, Mr. Bartell. The memory you've got study in scarlet. Uh, but even after that adventure, I found myself wondering at times what I had let myself in for, sharing lodgings with such a strange companion. It was in one of those moods of doubt and confusion that my story begins. Late one March evening, I found myself in the neighborhood of Piccadilly Circus. It was cold, and a steady drizzle of rain had dampened my spirits. I felt that a glass of wine and the sound of music put me in a better mood, and, and so, Mr. Bartell, I entered the Criterion restaurant. As I sat with a glass of rare vintage port at my elbow, the orchestra playing a dreamy Strauss waltz in the background, I couldn't help thinking of the last time that I'd been there. It was the night I met a young medical student by the name of Stamford. He was the man who first introduced me to Sherlock Holmes. Suddenly, I felt a clap on my shoulder. I turned, and to my amazement, once again, young Stamford was standing before Watson. Or should I say, Dr. Watson. How are you, my dear chap? Hello, Stamford. Come and sit down. Thanks. I'm glad to see that you're not holding any grudge against me. Why on earth should I do that? For introducing you to Sherlock Holmes. I've reproached myself ever since. I think he's as mad as a hatter. Not at all. He may be eccentric. In fact, I'll admit that he is eccentric, but he's an extraordinarily interesting fuller. He'll make a great thing for himself as a private detective one of these days. You'll see if I'm not right, Stamford. I saw something about him in the paper the other day. Yes, I think that was the Lauriston Gardens affair, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes, it was. He's a brilliant man, Stamford. Quite brilliant. Mm. So I must admit he's difficult at times. He works like a fiend as a rule, 
but occasionally a reaction sets in for days at a time. They lie on our sofa, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. It's depressing, I must say. I think he takes himself too seriously. Yes, perhaps you're right. How would you like to join in a little plot? Plot uh, against home? Yes, yes, uh, just a rag, you know. We thought it'd be rather fun. We? Murphy and I, we were just talking about it. I'll call him over. Murphy? Oh, is Murphy? I, I've seen him before somewhere, haven't I? I'm sure you might have done. He's been around at the hospital, and any time you go into the British Museum, you'll find him there. Nice fellow, but dull, definitely dull. Uh, yes, Stamford. Oh, uh, this is a friend of mine, John Watson. Uh, this is James Murphy. How do I think I've seen you at the hospital? And I know I've seen you, Dr. Watson. Oh, sit down and come and join us, won't you? Oh, thank you very much. I was just telling Watson about our little plot. Oh, you, you, you mean about uh, Sherlock Holmes? Now, now, look here. I'd like you fellows to realize that Holmes is a very good friend of mine. Oh, don't worry, Watson. This is all in good fun. Don't you realize what date is tomorrow? First of April, isn't it? Yes, April Fool's Day. Oh, now I see. You're going to play an April Fool's Day joke on, on Holmes. Yes, that's our plan. Well, it's hardly our plan, but it's really Lady Anne Partington's idea. You see, Holmes was very rude to her when she visited the hospital recently, and she wants to, uh, well, you know, take him down a peg or two. Oh, sounds innocent enough, but I must say he's inclined to be rather arrogant at times. Well, <laughs> what's, what's the plan? Well, we'll need your help, Watson. You must be careful not to give the joke away. I'll bet you a fiver that Holmes falls for the whole story, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> now, here's exactly what we're planning to do. Lady Anne is going to call on Holmes at Baker Street in the morning. Lady Anne, I'm very flattered that you called to see me in my professional capacity. Surely, my dear man, you didn't think this was a social call. You were much too rude to me at the hospital the other day for that. <laughs> that was the point I was trying to make. Uh, please sit down, won't you? Please, uh, take this chair, won't you, Lady Anne? It's by far the most comfortable chair in the room. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, what can I do to help you? You've heard of the Elphinstone Emerald. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. A magnificent stone of very considerable value. An heirloom in your family, I believe. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I keep it in a wall safe in my bedroom. This morning, when I had occasion to go to the safe, I discovered that the emerald had been stolen. Stolen? It's cut. Shocking business. Of course, you want Mr. Holmes to recover it for you. A remarkable deduction, my dear doctor. Uh, Lady Anne, when you opened the safe, did you observe any signs of it having been tampered with? Oh, I, I think it's rather stupid to sit and answer questions here in Baker Street. Uh, why don't you come up to my house in Cavendish Square and examine the safe for yourself? Uh, you are a detective, aren't you? Lady Anne, uh, just now you accused me of rudeness. I assure you that mine, at least was unintentional. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. Don't be so touchy. I can promise you a substantial fee, Mr. Holmes. I'm a struggling practitioner and a new profession, eh? My poverty, but not my will, consents. I pay thy poverty and not thy will. You see, I can quote my Shakespeare, too, Mr. Holmes. My carriage is waiting, gentlemen. Let's drive over to Cavendish Square at once. <laughs> at the wall safe, Mr. Holmes. Mm, not too difficult a safe to crack for an expert. You placed the emerald in it last night, you say? Yes, when I went to bed. And this morning, it had gone. Well, surely, Holmes, it is a good occasion to use that magnifying glass that you're always fitting about. <laughs> Excellent with. occasion, my dear doctor. That's why I brought it with me. Uh-huh. That's very interesting. What is it? This safe was opened by an expert. There isn't a sign of its having been forced. Hello. What have you discovered? There's a peculiar tarnish on the steel knob was obviously handled by someone whose fingers are habitually stained with chemicals. Amazing, Holmes. Let me mention, my dear doctor, uh, where does that door lead to? My boudoir. I should like to examine it, if I may. Oh, but of course. Thank you, Lady Anne. Dr. Watson, this is the most beautiful April Fool's Day fraud I've ever played. I say Murphy was right. He has hook, line, and sinker. Just the same, I'm beginning to feel guilty. I can't help feeling a, a bit disloyal. Oh, no, I'm not. It's all in fun. Are Stamford and Mr. Murphy listening? Yes, they're next door in my drawing room. I'm sure their ears are positively glued to the keyhole. Well, I do hope Holmes won't be angry with me. Shh, here he comes. Nothing of any interest in there. The windows haven't been tampered with. We may presume, therefore, that the thief did not enter by an upstairs window. Uh, Lady Anne. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This room has not been touched since you discovered your loss. Oh, no. I told the servants to leave it exactly as it was while I came to fetch you. Splendid, splendid. Deep file carpet, eh? Couldn't be better. Uh, the thief was a tall man with a long stride. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. I know your methods, but there aren't any footprints on this carpet that, that you can identify, even with your magnifying glass. My dear doctor, I've studied many crimes, and I've never seen one yet that uh, was committed by a flying creature. As long as a criminal remains on his two legs, there must be some, some trifling displacement can be detected by a keen observer. 
I assure you that the marks on this carpet indicate that the thief uh, was a tall man with a long stride. Mm -hmm. Faces of tobacco ash. Pipe tobacco. Tag tobacco that sells at fourpence an ounce. Now, really, Mr. Holmes, how can you possibly identify an individual tobacco? Oh, it's a hobby of mine. In fact, I've even written a monograph on the subject. Now, one more look at the face itself. Hello. What's this part of dust here? What? It's rosin. Trace of rosin. Lady Anne, I suggest that you get in touch with Scotland Yard at once. You mean that you've solved it, Holmes? I mean, my dear doctor, that I can give you a reasonably complete picture of the thief, and that picture is so individual that I'd be surprised if it would fit more than one man in London. Why, this is pure magic, Mr. Holmes. Please describe him to me. Uh, well, he's a tall man. The width of his stride indicates that, and he's thin. Well, what enables you to tell that, Holmes? His footprints have made a remarkably light indentation on the nap of the carpet. Our thief dabbles extensively in chemicals, as indicated by the tarnishing of the knob on the safe, and the traces of rosin would suggest that he plays the violin also. He smokes shag tobacco, has a great practical knowledge of the ways of combination locks, and he's obviously in close contact with the criminal classes. How do you know that, Mr. Holmes? Well, he wouldn't steal a famous stone unless he knew how to dispose of it through some trustworthy fence. Yes, it's a very comprehensive picture, Holmes. I almost feel as fine as a chap. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sure there's only one man in London, and it shouldn't be hard to trace him. <laughs> I agree entirely, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Oh. Watson, I think the joke has gone far enough. Joke? <laughs> oh, what do you mean? <laughs> You're quite right, Holmes, in, in saying there's only one such man in London. You've just given a perfect description of yourself. Oh, April Fool. <laughs> Dr. Stamford, Mr. Murphy, you can come in now. April Fool, Holmes. April, April, April Fool. April Fool. April Fool. <laughs> Into the drawing room, everyone. Let us drink a glass of wine to Mr. Holmes, who has so graciously forgiven us for the little trick we played on him. And also to Dr. Stamford, who thought of the whole idea. Uh, no hard feelings, Holmes. Oh, no, Doctor. No, it was a rather embarrassing experience. Yes, Murphy told me about the plan. I, I just couldn't resist joining him. Ah, here you are, Holmes. Here's a drink. Thank you, Stamford. <laughs> you know Murphy, don't you? Uh... No, I don't think we've met. Oh. How do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do, Holmes? How did you like the little game we played on you? It was rather a salutary experience. I suppose you gave them all the details to build up the picture of me, eh, hey, yes, Doctor? Yes, I did, Holmes, and knowing some of your methods, we tried to plant every clue that you'd pick up. <laughs> Very neat job, too, and incidentally, <laughs> a perfect example of the dangers of deduction based on purely circumstantial evidence. I shall profit from this little lesson. I must say it was worth a fortune in emeralds to see your face, Holmes, when you realized what you'd done. Well, the joke's over now. By the way, where is Lady Anne? I believe she said she was going to fetch the Orphanstone emerald. She thought you might be interested in seeing it. She probably feels the sight that will salve my wounded vanity. <laughs> oh, here she comes now. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! It's got... What's wrong? What's happened, Lady Anne? The emerald. It's not where I hid it. This time it's really stolen. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds, so I've just time to remind you that there are many, many different types of wine. But if you want one wine that's fine for almost any occasion, then you want Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is fine before dinner, of course. But Petri Sherry is good after dinner, too. And it's the perfect wine for cocktail time or any time friends drop in. Everybody will love the real heart-of-the-grape flavor you get in every sip of Petri Sherry. And you can serve Petri Sherry proudly because those letters P-E-T-R-I spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, your April Fool Day plot kind of backfired on you, didn't it? Yes, it's about to tell it was a perfect example of the, uh, of the bite of bit. <laughs> well, what happened next? I suppose Sherlock Holmes went into action once again. That's fair, Mr. Bartell, and it gladdened my heart to see the change in the fuller. I confess I'd felt rather ashamed of my part in the prank, for I could see that Holmes' pride had been hurt. But now, with a definite crime before him, the difference was amazing. He suddenly became a dynamo, galvanized into action as he stood there, firing questions at the other members. 
Lady Anne, who besides yourself knew of this fresh hiding place? Both Murphy and I did. Yes. Uh, after we left our deliberate clues on the safe, we went with Lady Anne and saw her secrete the emerald in the top drawer of her dressing table. We thought it would be all right there. After all, as soon as the joke was over, I was going to put it back in the safe. Now, I think our wisest plan, before we question the servants, would be for each one of you who were in this April Fool's Day prank to submit to being searched. Holmes, surely you don't suggest that any one of us took the emerald? No, Stanford, I don't. Uh, but if any one of you four are not guilty, this will be a splendid way of proving your innocence. I say, steady, Holmes. You're not suggesting that Lady Anne stole her own emeralds, are you? Are you, Mr. Holmes? I'm suggesting nothing, but I may point out that the recent vogue for the insurance companies has provided another interesting motive for these so-called thefts. I resent your insinuation. It's outrageous. Lady Anne, if I'm to recover your emerald, I must at least consider every possibility. A search is the most immediate practical action. Perhaps you'll retire into the next room while I persuade these gentlemen to submit to being searched. Very well, but but I think you're in danger of making a fool of yourself once again. No, wait, don't, don't go, Lady Anne. A search won't be necessary. What do you mean, Murphy? I... I must throw myself on your mercy, Lady Anne. I confess that I stole the emerald. Murphy! After you put it in the drawer, Lady Anne, I, I slipped back into the room and took it out. Murphy, that's a criminal action. I, I know it, but I'm poor. I need money desperately for my mathematical research. I knew the emerald was priceless, and I, I couldn't resist the temptation to take advantage of a joke. Here, Lady Anne, here's the stone, and please don't prosecute me. Please don't. It'd be my ruin. May I examine the emerald again? Thank you. Well, Mr. Murphy, I won't pretend that I'm not deeply shocked. I must ask you to leave my house. But you prosecute me, will you? It was a moment's temptation. No, uh, no, I won't prosecute you. Holmes, what are you doing with the emerald? Well, knowing something of the deceptive ways of thieves, I came on this case fully prepared to test the emerald when I found it. Now, uh, a drop of this acid from this vial, so... Mr. Holmes, what are you doing? You'll injure the stone. Uh, no, uh, not if it's a true emerald. Uh-huh, look at that. Good Lord, the acid's eating to the stone as if it was sugar. But then that means that... It means, Lady Anne, that Mr. Murphy has just imperiled his honor and his freedom to steal a singularly beautiful fake. Mr. Holmes, this joke has turned into a nightmare. Is there no way of recovering my emeralds? I hope so, Lady Anne. I've been taking steps in their logical order. The servants have all been questioned. We've searched Mr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy. Yes, most humiliating experience. Made me feel like a criminal. Well, personally, I was only too thankful to submit to a search this time. I knew I had nothing to worry about. You yourself, Lady Anne, you, you consented to being searched by the police matron that Holmes sent for? Only because he threatened to send for the police if I didn't. But distasteful though it was, I'd rather endure that than have this story on the front pages of the newspapers. And in spite of all these rather unfriendly proceedings, we've got exactly nowhere as regards finding the emerald. No, Stamford, but we have at least eliminated the possibility that the thief is secreting the jewel on his person. Mm. Still somewhere in these two rooms, eh, Holmes? I think so, though there is one remaining possibility. And that is? that the fake stone was substituted for the real emerald sometime before all of you engineered your April Fool's Day joke. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, that's not possible. I know it was the genuine emerald I took out of the safe this morning. How can you be sure? The substitute was an excellent imitation. Without a chemical test such as I performed, it would be hard to be certain. I can tell you why I'm certain. Last night, Papa came to dinner and brought a Mr. Vanderleider of Amsterdam. He examined the stone. And you'll agree that a jewel expert like that couldn't be fooled. That's true, Lady Anne. And what did you do with the emerald after Mr. Van der Leider left? I locked it in my safe and went to bed. Mm -hmm. I didn't unlock the safe again until Dr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy came here this morning. That settles it, then. The real emerald is still hidden somewhere in these two rooms. But where? That's the question. I must say it's completely mystifying. Well, let's go back to what we were all doing at the exact moment you came into the room, Lady Anne, and informed us of the loss of your stone. Now, we were... We were drinking a toast to you That's and... That's it. Uh, Lady Anne, hard thinking is, uh, well, it's thirsty work. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get you something. Uh, a glass of port, perhaps. No, no, thank you. But I, uh, I observe that you have a remarkably comprehensive assortment of liqueurs. I wonder if I might have a glass of creme de menthe. Oh, of course. I'll get it for you. Creme de menthe in the middle of the day, Holmes? I knew you were eccentric, but this, this really takes... This bottle, it... It clinked as I picked it up. I thought it might, Lady Anne. There's something inside it. Allow me, madam. Thank you. 
I'm sure you won't mind if I waste this liqueur on the aspidestra. Mm -hmm. So. Lady Anne, allow me to restore to you the Elphinson Emerald. Oh, great Scott. Amazing. Fantastic. Ingenious. The one safe hiding place in the room. Where could a green gem be more effectively hidden than in a bottle of green liqueur? But who stole it? Who substituted the fake stone? Frankly, I don't care. The gem is restored. That's all that matters. Uh, I prefer not to go to court. Neither you nor I, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would show up in the best of lights. And my father would disapprove of this whole affair, I'm afraid. Just as you wish, Lady Anne. In either case, I shall expect your check for my services in due course. <laughs> Criterion again, Stamford. Won't you come in and join us for lunch? Thanks, Watson, but I'll keep the cab and go on. I actually have a patient this afternoon. A rare and delightful experience for a young doctor, <laughs> as you probably know. <laughs> as rare and delightful as a client is for a young detective, eh, Stamford? Yeah. I quite understand, and I'm correspondingly grateful to you for your, for your profitable hopes. I'm glad it was profitable for you. Personally, I feel pretty stupid about the whole thing. Well, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, old fellow. Goodbye. 39 Onslow Square, cabby. You're remarkably quiet, Mayford. Well, I, I'm afraid my conscience won't let me do much talking, Doctor. I'm heartily ashamed of myself. Well, thanks for the lift. I'll, I'll leave you traps. Oh, Robinson Johnson, you'll join us for lunch, Murphy. But, uh, No buts about it, I insist. Come on. Well, you're awfully nice of you. Come, Murphy. Any one of us can make a foolish mistake. It's just lucky that you didn't have to pay for yours. Monsieur wishes it, David. Yes, the three, please. This way, Monsieur. Does this table please you? Excellent, thank you. All right, George, I'm as hungry as a hunter. How about you, Murphy? No, I'm afraid I have very little appetite. This whole case has upset me oh. dreadfully. You mustn't take it so much to heart, Murphy. Uh, by the way, Doctor, I'd like to have your opinion on the case. Who do you think staged the theft of the emerald today? Perfectly obvious to me. Lady Anne Partington did it herself to collect the insurance money. If she hadn't, she'd have insisted on your finding the thief. But uh, you needn't worry, old chap. You get your fee all right, I'm sure oh, of that. Oh, I'm not worrying about the fee. But I assure you, Lady Anne did not engineer that fraud today. You you, you mean that it was Stafford? <laughs> Tell him who was responsible, my dear Murphy. But how should I know? Oh, how? come now, Murphy. Let's not fence any longer. You did an excellent job, a superlative job. I was uh, almost no. sorry to spoil it for you. I don't think I understand you, Holmes. Oh, yes, you do, Murphy. You're a splendid actor, too. I was so deeply touched when you were apparently still in a fake jewel and... Uh, all the time you knew the real one was safely hidden in the bottle of creme de menthe. To be abstracted at uh, your leisure. <laughs> you scoundrel. Holmes, do you mind telling me what's going on here? I'm completely and absolutely in the dark. Surely it's obvious, my dear doctor. The imitation emerald was a brilliant copy. What makes you so sure of that, my dear Holmes? Because this April Fool's Day hoax was only conceived yesterday, or that is what you wish the others to believe. Such a superb paste gem could not have been made at such short notice. Therefore... It must have been prepared by someone who knew about the hoax before it was arranged. Now, my dear doctor, when Stamford told you about the plan last night, whose idea did he say it was? He told me that it was Lady Anne Partington's plan. Precisely. And yet Lady Anne referred to it today as Stamford's idea. Obviously, you, my dear Murphy, presented the plan to each as the notion of the other, and so only you could have arranged the real theft behind the hoax. I repeat, <laughs> a splendid job. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. May I... Uh... May I also compliment you on your cleverness in frustrating my plot? Look here, what is all this? One of you is a criminal, the other is a detective. Yet you're throwing each other compliments as if you were in the same profession. The dividing line between the criminal and the criminal investigator is thinner than you might imagine, my dear doctor. How very true, my dear Holmes. Would you consider coming over to my side of the line? Together we'd make an unbeatable team. Oh, oh. oh you flat me. Nevertheless, I must decline your offer, Mr. Murphy. Oh, a pity. On your side of the line, you'll never be a rich man. By the way, for your edification, my name is not Murphy, though Stamford insists on thinking it is. Then what is your name, you scoundrel? <laughs> your friend says the word scoundrel so much better than you, Doctor. Uh, my name? My name is Murphy. Oh, indeed. Uh, spelled M-U-R-T-R-Y? No. Dear me, I have so much trouble with my name. People will either misspell it or mispronounce it. I'm afraid I'll have to begin calling it the way it looks. M-O-R-I-T. 
M-A-R-T-Y. Moriarty. Moriarty. I shall remember that name. I have a feeling we shall meet again. I trust that we shall. You've won the first round, Sherlock Holmes. I admit that. But I believe that um, a return match is indicated. I shall look forward to it, Moriarty. And now, Doctor, I can't stand your baleful glare any longer. Let's order lunch, shall we? Doctor, that was a pretty hectic April Fool's Day. Yes, it was. I never want to see another one exactly like it. I don't blame you. You know, I'd sure hate to have someone come to my house and pull a trick like that on me. Why, Mr. Bartell, do you have a precious emerald you fear may be stolen? Are you kidding? <laughs> I wouldn't know the difference between a precious emerald and a piece of green glass. But when it comes to rubies, now that's something else. Oh, you would know a ruby when you, when you saw it. Sure, because a ruby has exactly the same color as a glass of Petri California port held up to the light. Mr. Bartell, you can find more excuses for talking about Petri wine than any man in the entire world. Believe me. Excuses, Doctor? <laughs> I don't need an excuse to talk about Petri wine. Why, there's a wine that actually speaks for itself. If I may borrow a phrase from Shakespeare or somebody, there's another wine quite like Petri wine because only Petri wine is made by the Petri family. And the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been handing down from father to son, from father to son, years and years of knowledge and experience of the fine art turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Yes, and because the making of Petri wine is a family affair... Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on a bottle of wine, are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. You never miss with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what's the prescription for next week's Well, story? next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a rather unusual story. It concerns a series of strange disappearances and a murder without apparent reason, and yet... It was a case that Sherlock Holmes solved without ever meeting any of the suspects. I call it the singular affair of the disappearing scientist. Well, I'm sure we'll all want to hear that one, Doctor. Oh, I'm sure. Well, we're going to... Oh, well, before you go, Mr. Bartell, I want to urge our friends to do all they can to save on the use of all wheat and rice products and also fats and oils. There are millions of families literally starving to death in Europe and Asia. They're not being asked to give them our food. But just being asked to take it easy on certain foods so that there will be some left for them to buy. I know there isn't one person listening to me tonight who would knowingly let anyone starve. And remember, unless you do help, thousands of little children will starve. So please, let's share a meal and save a life. Tonight, Sherlock Holmes' adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Golden Radio Hour. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke.
Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. You know, Chester, a morning like this makes a man glad to be alive. Oh, it's a fine one, all right, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. A little nippy, maybe, but just fine. Indian summer hanging on and winter holding off. You know, Chester, this time of year, I wouldn't trade western Kansas for everything east of the Mississippi. Oh, good. Pedro's got a fire going on. I built the fire, Marshal Dillon. Oh, good morning, Caleb. I've been waiting in this jail office for a full two hours. What time do you start work, Marshal? You know Caleb Andrews, don't you, Chester? Oh, yes, indeed. How are you, Mr. Andrews? Marshal, I have an order here from the U.S. District Court. I believe it's your job to serve such orders. Yeah, it is. I don't get them often, though. Yeah. Order of foreclosure and eviction on Ed Blake. Why are you doing this to Ed, Caleb? The man borrowed money from me. He gave me a mortgage on his farm and household effects. He can't pay it. Why do you think I'm doing it? It only came due three days ago. You sure didn't waste any time. I'm not interested in your opinions, Marshal Dillon. Yeah, amount of the mortgage. $420. What do you need with $420? You own half of Ford County now. Marshal, it's not your place. You know as well as I do why Ed Blake can't pay this off. His horse rolled on him last spring and broke his leg. And his wife and kid nearly broke their backs trying to get a crop out. I didn't come here to listen if to you. If you let this ride on through the winter, you'll get your money out of it. If you go ahead and foreclose now, you'll wipe him out. Marshal, I already have foreclosed. You'd break a man for $420 you don't even need, huh? As I said, your opinions don't interest me. All I expect from you is to serve these papers. All right, I'll serve them. You'll notice they're to be served today. I said I'd serve them. Now get out. What? This office belongs to the United States government, and as far as I know, that's one thing you've got no mortgage on, so get out. You may find I have some influence in Washington, Marshal Dillon. Then see if you can get me a decent salary for this rotten job of mine. It sure was a fine morning, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it was. All right, Chester, let's saddle up. This is one job I surely wish we didn't have to do, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. My... This sure is a nice farm. Ed and Martha have put in a lot of work here the last four years. We don't have any choice, Chester. Yes, sir, I know. It's a downright shame, though. Hey, Marshal! Oh, boy. Well, hi, Jimmy. Look at here what I got, Marshal. Well, looks to me like a mighty dead coyote. Sure, that's what it is. <laughs> He's been killing my chickens, so last night I hid off behind the barn. Yeah? I got him with one shot, Mr. Dillon, and there wasn't even a full moon. Well, that's fine, Jimmy. Matt Dillon, how are you? Oh, uh, good morning, Martha. And Chester, too. Miss Blake? Well, I'm glad to see you. Get down, come on in. Oh, uh, thank you. Jimmy, now that you showed that thing to Mr. Dillon, take it away somewhere. All right, Mom. <laughs> he sure is a big one, ain't he, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, about the biggest I ever saw, Jimmy. <laughs> He's real proud of those chickens of his. He's done fine with them. Well, here I am, though, keeping you standing out here in the yard. Come on, let's go inside. Well, uh, we really can't stay, Martha. Oh, nonsense. You don't get out here once in a goon's age. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you and see... And you're just in time. Your favorite dish, Matt. I was about to take it out of the oven when you rode up. Cornbread. 
buttermilk cornbread. Huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ed's not here, but you will say, won't you? Well, Martha, I'd like to, but well, we just can't. That's all. The thing is that, uh, uh, you say Ed's away. Yes, he's in town. Matt, you're not yourself. What is it? Well, I suppose I ought to talk to Ed about this, but maybe it'll be better if he hears it from you. Here's what? Martha, I, I got a court order here. It has to do with that mortgage of Caleb Andrews. It's a order of foreclosure and eviction and sale. No. Oh, no. Here it is. We were so sure he'd extend it. He knows what happened and why we couldn't pay it. We were sure he'd extend it. Well, he won't. I talked to him. Matt, uh, how long before we have to get out? Five days. So soon. You were right, Matt. It, it is better that Ed hears it from me. Coming on top of everything else, it'll... Well, I, I can't let it break him. I, I just can't let it break him. Martha, if there's anything I can do you... You let me know, huh? Matt, I, I don't blame you for this. I understand. Well, come on in now and have some cornbread with well, us. Well, I, I, I couldn't. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you anyway, Martha. But I, oh, well, I just couldn't. You've looked low all week. Oh, it's just things in general, Kitty. Sometimes you get to wondering if it's all worth it or not. The Blakes, huh? Huh? Chester was telling me. Ah, Chester talks too much. It's not your fault, Matt. Somebody had to serve the order. Somebody has to be hangman, too. <laughs> Life's never all good, Matt. There's always a little bad in it. Well, in my job, it's more than a little. <laughs> Try making your living sometime as a dance hall girl. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. But when you got to go out and boot somebody like the Blakes off their land and out of their home, then you start wondering what's right and what's wrong, that's so. Well, if you find out, Matt, let me know. I've always... Oh. oh, there you are, Marshal. I stopped by the jail. Well, all right, Caleb. What's on your mind? Uh, that Blake family, Marshal, they were supposed to vacate today. Well, they haven't done it. I rode by there a little while ago. According to the court order, they got until sundown. That they haven't made the slightest preparation to... <coughs> Marshal, I believe I'd prefer to discuss our business elsewhere than in the presence of this, uh, this... Easy, Caleb. Matt, uh, I'll go. Caleb, you're going to apologize to Miss Kitty right now. Matt, no. Apologize? <laughs> if you think I'm going to apologize to this cheap little baggage who's in this... <coughs> hey. Matt, you shouldn't have done that. Finnegan! Take him outside and throw some water on him. Yes, sir, Marshal. Why not, Kitty? He had it coming to him. He'll do everything he can to hurt you now. He'll take it out on the Blakes, too. Yeah, maybe. Look, Kitty, I I just got an idea. Uh, I'll see you later. All right, Matt. <laughs> But, Matt, the mere fact a man runs a bank doesn't always mean he's got a free hand in everything he does. A bank has stockholders, a board of directors. I've got to listen to them. I think they'd approve the loan, Clem. Another thing, Caleb Andrews is the biggest account I've got. If I crossed him by taking this loan you suggest, Matt, he'd break me. I see. <laughs> All right, Clem, forget it. Matt, I, I realize I'm under obligation to you. You saved my life that time the James brothers held me up. Saved the bank, too, in fact. But that was part of my job, Clem. There's no obligation. I I was just asking you as a friend to help out another friend. Oh, Matt, I'd like to do it, but I just can't. Don't you see? Yeah, that? sure, Clem. I see. Yeah. Just forget it. Got to think of my wife and the two girls. Yeah, of course you have. It's not that I don't want to help. I understand, but... Clem. I really do. Forget it. There. 
Well, I'll hold it a while. That fire feels kind of good, Mr. Dillon. It's getting chillish out tonight. Yeah, I guess we better have Pedro lay in some more wood. Yes, sir. When winter sets in, it always makes you feel good to know you got a warm place to hold up. Be mighty rough not to have a... Not to... Yeah, I was thinking of the same thing, Chester. You suppose they vacated this afternoon? I don't know. We'll ride out there in the morning and find out. Sure is a shame. It's just too bad that... Uh... Come in. Can we bother you, bother you man? Ed! Oh, oh well, come in. Come in, Martha. Well, hiya, Jimmy. Uh, well, uh, come on up to the stove, folks. Come on. Matt, the fact is that we... We kind of like to impose on you for tonight. We haven't got any place to go. No money. Wondered if we could sleep in the jail tonight. Oh, sure, Ed. Uh, uh, Chester, would you would you get a fire going back there? All right, Mr. Dillon. And dig up some blankets out of the storeroom, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, Want to come help me, Jimmy? Jimmy? <laughs> no, you... You go along with Chester now, boy. Go on. All right. He, um, he doesn't understand all this, Matt. He, he... Uh, Ed, we, we may as well get your stuff out of the wagon, I guess. Well, there ain't any wagon, Matt. We walked into town. Six miles? With that leg? I know, but that wagon, the horses, all the household goods, they're all covered by that mortgage. We didn't take anything. Except the clothes on our backs. Oh, so help me, Ed. So help me no, if it, I could... It's all right, Matt. We know how you feel. But after all, we started with nothing before. We can do it again. But there's no reason you should have to. We do have to, though. And that's that. Ed and I can accept it. We're not bitter any longer. Jimmy can't understand. He's He's been carrying on pretty bad, but he's just a boy. And in time, he'll be able Mr. to... Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? It's Jimmy. He grabbed a rifle from off the rack and took out the back way. I couldn't stop him. Huh? Where on earth's he going? I think I know where he's going. And heaven help Caleb Andrews if we don't catch him. <laughs> Turn for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, that widely traveled man of music, Mr. Vaughn Monroe, will land in Pottstown, Pennsylvania this Saturday night. The Moon Maids, the Moon Man, and the Monroe Ensemble will be on hand to enliven the session. Remember, tomorrow night and every Saturday evening, it's Vaughn Monroe and his musical caravan on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now, the second act of Gun Smoke. <laughs> Mr. Andrews' house there on the corner. Looks dark, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, you may not be home. I sure hope he isn't. No sign of the boy around. Reckon he broke in the house, Mr. Dillon? Maybe. Any hot's ten to one, this is where he headed for. His mother said he was real upset about it, and it's just like a kid. To... Chester? Hmm? There's somebody back of that tree up there on the left. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's him? I don't know. Just keep on walking. Yeah, it's him, all right. I can see the moonlight on the rifle barrel. Will we try to rush him, Mr. Dillon? Well, not unless you're thinking of suicide. I'm going to talk to him, Chester. Jimmy? It's me, Matt Dillon. Go away, Mr. Dillon. Better go away now. Don't bother me. I can't do that, Jimmy. You're a friend of mine, and I figure you're waiting here to do something that you'd be sorry for, and I, I can't let you do that. Nothing 
nothing you can do about it, Mr. Dillon. I got a gun here and I'm going to kill him. You go away now and leave me alone. Jimmy, I know how you feel. I don't like Caleb either, but killing him's no answer. You folks feel bad enough already. Think how it would hurt him if you did. Stop, Mr. Dillon. I'll stay where you are. Don't come any closer. I have to, Jimmy. It's my job. So if you're going through with this, I guess you'll have to kill me first. No, no. No, Mr. Dillon. Now stay back. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I don't have a choice. But you do. No. No. I couldn't shoot you, Mr. Dillon. You know that. Sure. I knew you couldn't. I kept waking up nights and hear mom crying. Dad would sit up all night without the lamp lit and no fire. Not say anything, just sitting. Easy now, Jimmy. Why is he doing it to us, Mr. Dillon? Jimmy, <laughs> listen to me. Will you do something for a friend? Yeah. If you say so. All right. Then take that rifle back to the jail and put it in the rack and go to bed. Now, you promise? Yeah. I promise, Mr. Dillon. I'm sorry. I'll do like you say. You're all right, Jimmy. Good night, son. I could have told you Clem Bates wouldn't do anything, Matt. He wouldn't dare. He'd be scared Caleb would take his money out of the bank. Yeah, that's about what he said. I don't know, Kitty. I've done everything I could possibly think of. Well, the worst of it is everybody in town's just as scared of Caleb as Clem is. I doubt if they'll even have the nerve to bid against him at the sale. Yeah, I know. He'll probably get the place at not much more than the amount of the mortgage. Four hundred and twenty dollars. Matt, I've seen more than that change hands across a poker table here in one deal. You think that's all it takes? I beg your pardon, Miss Kitty. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, Jack. I'm not usually one to eavesdrop on people, but I have been listening to you, too. Uh, Jack, have you met Marshal Dillon? No, I haven't had the pleasure. The reason I butted in, Miss Kitty, I heard you talking about these people losing their home. I don't know this fellow Blake. He's never done any business over my table and probably never will. No, I, I don't think he's ever been in here. And I don't know if this will make sense. But the thing is, I left home when I was ten years old, and I've been drifting ever since. When I see somebody like this Blake that sticks it out and works and fights and then gets a raw deal. Well, what I'm getting at, here's $50 if that'll help him any. Oh, Jack. Well, this is awful decent of you, Jack. Matt, I said a while ago that nearly everyone in town was afraid of Caleb. Yeah. Well, there's some who aren't, like Jack here and me and the rest of the dealers and the gamblers and the, the girls and the bartenders. That's right, Miss Kitty. Because we're drifters. We got nothing to lose. Matt, I'll raise $420 right here in the Texas Trail. By heaven, Kitty, I think you could. Well, I can't do as well as Jack, but... <laughs> Uh, here's 20 for me. Boys! Everybody! Now listen to me for a minute. I got something to say. He's sure taking his time getting here, Chester. Well, I told him what you said, Mr. Dillon. Well, that ought to bring him on the run, if anything, Will. Anytime Caleb figures he's about to lose a dollar or two, it's hitting him where it hurts. The Blakes turned in for the night? Yeah, I guess so. It's been quiet back there for the last few. Marshal, what's this all about? Well, shut the door, Caleb. We're trying to keep it warm in here. Would you mind telling me why I've been called over here at this time of night? Yeah, sure. Here's $420. The Blakes want to pay off the mortgage. They do, do they? The court costs up to now will probably run about $10. I'll pay that myself. That's mighty generous of you. Well, good night, Marshal. Is it a deal, then? I am not the least bit interested in having that mortgage paid off, Marshal Dillon. 
The Blake farm is worth about $2,000 now, and in five years it'll be worth three times that much. Land's going up in Ford County. That's why I'm grabbing every piece I can get. So I don't want the money. I want the farm. And when it's put up for sale, I'll get it at my own price. The foreclosure still goes. I see. Good night, gentlemen. Well, I guess that's that, Mr. Dillon. I don't know why I even thought he'd take the money. The Blakes won't get a cent out of the sale. He'll scare everybody off and bid it in a few dollars over the amount of the mortgage, and nobody in town will even try to... Even try to... Try to what, Mr. Dillon? Chester, I'm going over and wake up Clem Bates. I got an idea, and if it works, we'll hold that sale at noon tomorrow. That's pretty short notice to find an auctioneer. I don't need an auctioneer, Chester. This one I'm going to run myself. For this is a foreclosure sale of the property and household effects of Edward and Martha Blake, ordered by the court at the request of that fine spirited, good hearted public benefactor and friend and neighbor of us all, Caleb Andrews. Marshal Dillon, I refuse to tolerate this. Caleb, I think we better get one thing straight right now. The law tells me I gotta conduct this sale, but the law doesn't tell me what I gotta say while I'm conducting it. Get on with it. Get on with the sale. All right. Now, uh, the first item I'm offering is a breadboard. Ms. Blake tells me she's used this for nearly ten years. That's a lot of loaves of bread. A lot of years. As you can see, it's pretty badly battered up. I doubt if it'd be worth much to anybody unless they were used to it. Suppose we started at 50 cents. Is there anybody here low enough to bid 50 cents for Mrs. Blake's breadboard? How about you, Caleb? I'm not interested in the item. Get on with the sale. Anybody else? No? All right, then. The second item. It's a crib. Now, you'll notice it's handmade. Rough construction. Never been painted. And it's been well used. Ed built it himself 12 years ago, just before Jimmy was born. There are teeth marks all over the slats here, but that doesn't really hurt anything. There are Marshal also... Dillon, may I suggest you lump the household effects together and offer them as one bulk item? I'm sorry, Caleb. I'd rather offer them one at a time. <laughs> Unless, of course, you'd care to waive all claim to the household effects and withdraw them from the order of foreclosure. I waive the claim. The household goods are withdrawn. Now, get on to the house and land. So ordered. Now, the item offered is 160 acres of tillable land, a four-room house, and a barn. I won't read through the description. You all know the property. It's a good farm. The amount of the mortgage is $420. Held by Caleb Andrews. All right, the bidding's open. What am I offered? $450. I have $450 from Cable Andrews. Do I hear another bid? Oh, the farm's worth $2,000. You're going to let him have it for $450? How about another bidder? Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Well, I've been thinking some lately of getting me a little place like this and settling down. I'll, I'll bid $1,000. <laughs> I have $1,000. Chester Brown. Do I hear another bid? It's a trick. He doesn't want this place. $1,000 going once. $1,200. Caleb Andrews bids $1,200. What do you say, Chester? Well, sir, I, I think I kind of like this farm. $1,500. This is ridiculous. The bid is $1,500 going once. Going twice. $1,600. $1,600 from Mr. Andrews. Chester? $8,420. He never had that much money in his whole life. Do I hear another bid? Oh, what do you say, Caleb? Do you think I'm a fool? Go in once, go in twice, 
So, the Chester Proud Foot for $8,420. The buyer will come forward and complete the sale. Don't you worry none about me, Mr. Andrews. I got it right here. There, there there's 8000 in $500 bills, and here is the 420 Where did you ever get that much in cash? Well, I saved my pay, Mr. Andrews. Then, of course, I, I drink just mostly beer. It adds up after a while. Caleb, I guess $420 of this is yours. And that takes care of the money. Well, Ed, looks like you made a pretty fair profit on the place. Yeah, Here's a lot the... better than I expected. Here's Matt. your money. Thank you, Matt. But I tell you, I'd still... I'd still rather have the farm than the money. Well, now, I've been sort of thinking it over, Mr. Blake. <laughs> Maybe I kind of lost my head. But when you come right down to it, I don't know what I'd ever do with a farm, so... If you'd like to buy it, I'll take a $420 loss and sell it back to you for $8,000 cash. <laughs> Done. Here's your money. This is unheard of. They can't do it, Marshal. Well, as far as I know, there's no law against a man selling his own property. Now, the way I see it, Mr. Andrews, is right this minute you're a trespasser on my property. Come on, let's go. Let go. Hey, Gracie, who do you think you're laughing Chester. You better get that $8,000 back to the bank. Clem Bates is probably worrying himself into a breakdown for fear somebody will find out that he let us have it. All right, Mr. Dillon, I- I'll see you in town later. Yeah. Oh, Matt, Matt, I-, I don't know how we can ever thank you for what you've done. Oh, uh, not me, Martha. Thank the bunch that work at the Texas Trail. You know, they're bums and drifters, most of them. But when Kitty told them the story, they really came through. We'll pay it back, Matt, every cent of it. And, well, that that girl, Kitty, I, I guess I've said some hard things about her in the past, but... Matt, will you ask her to come out to dinner some afternoon? I, what? I'd like to thank her myself. <laughs> sure, Martha, I'll ask her. And I think she'll appreciate that more than you'll ever know. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Paula Winslow, and Richard Beals, with Joe Duval, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jim Nusser. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> suggestion for Saturday listening. Fun for All, starring Bill Cullen and Arlene Francis, and John Reed King's great show, Give and Take. Hear them tomorrow on CBS Radio. Clancy Cassell speaking. And remember, you'll find Western adventure and music with Gene Autry Saturday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. There are places west of the Missouri where gambling stakes are rather high. This is particularly true when the wager depends on a man's life. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with
is an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual story. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territory. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. <laughs> I had stayed in Montana Territory hoping for an interview with Sitting Bull or even Crazy Horse. But General Crook's attack across the Tongue River put an end to that hope, at least for the time being. And so, with a full-fledged Indian war exploding around me, I had no choice but to remain where I was. The settlement with a normal population of perhaps a hundred had swollen to four times that number. The saloon keeper, gambler, and others were doing a thriving business, and the... The most popular spot in town was undoubtedly a place bearing the rather, oh, sanguinary legend, Jug of Blood. It was what is known as a honky-tonk. I was passing outside when the trouble began. The doors flew open and half a dozen brawling men erupted in the street. In sheer self-defense, I became a combatant. My dear fellow, I have the slightest idea. You could buy that. Jolly good. Oh, oh it's just some no good son of a gun was cheating at poker. And no good son of a gun. Really? Yeah. One of those? Uh, how should I know? I wasn't playing. I just heard it all. Yeah. You know, if there's anything I hate, it's uh, no good cheating. Son of a gun. Yes. Bad form. I don't blame you. Hey, well, what's your now, hurry? if you'll pardon me. Hey, come on in and have a drink. No, I don't think so. Thank you. Oh, come on. There's mighty pretty little gals in there. Yeah. You know, Jay Carter hired them all the way out from back east. It's on their way up to Virginia City. Well, his Sue Ruckus has held him old. I'm sorry to hear it, but now, really, I must be going. Oh, mister, you ain't seen such dancing, such carrying on. I'll be a son of a gun if I'll let you move on without seeing the nicest bit of female woman flesh this side of St. Louis. Son of a gun, come on, let's go. You won't be sorry. <laughs> Right. Well, it's kind of early. It's still a little quiet. You warm up by and by. Hey, my name is Smith. Walleye Smith. J.B. Kendall, Mr. Smith. Howdy. Hey, what are you drinking? Oh, I'll take a beer if you don't mind. Oh, it'll make no never mind to me. Jake? Yeah? A beer from a pound of whiskey for me. Tell Andy to bring him over. Okay. J.B. Kendall, huh? J.B. Hey, you any kin in Arizona, Kendall, down at Tombstone? No. What's your business, mister? I'm inside from fights. I'm a newspaper correspondent. Oh. Hmm. Well, I'm a cow puncher myself. Got paid off last week. This here's a good place to spend your money. <laughs> hey, how do you like that there picture over the bar? Ain't she something? <laughs> There's quite a bit of her, isn't there? What'd you say? I say there's quite a bit of her, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. A little out of proportion here and there. Ample. Well, son of a gun, I like you, Kendall. <laughs> I like you. Son of a gun. Hey, what paper are you write for? London Times. Well, son of a gun. Hey, Annie. How are you, Mrs. Smith? Hey, hey sweetheart. This here's J.B. Kendall. Hi. How you are you? for a newspaper, London Times. He's an important man. Now, you go call Christmas. Now, drinks are on me. Yeah, Mr. Smith. Hi, <laughs> Yeah, me, I go for the nice fat one. It's something you can grab a hold on. Never did like dancing with them skin and bone gals. I gather Annie is your choice, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's some looker up. Oh, no doubt of it, Mr. Smith. 
course, now, there ain't nothing wrong with Crystal. She's the one close herding with that son of a gun, Bill Bassett. Uh, See? I said it's fine, I don't think he's taking kindly to your friend Annie's suggestion. Uh, he's a raunchy buzzard, ain't he? He's drunker than all. Uh, I say, uh, look here, old boy. We don't want to cause any more trouble. You and your young lady have a nice evening. I'll be running along. Oh, sit down. Huh? I owe you for that fight. I always pay my debt. Well, here they come. Ladies, meet J.B. Kent. Uh, this here is Crystal, J.B. Crystal, how do you do? Go on, sit in his life, sweetheart. The poor uh, fella ain't feeling his oats yet. Well, well, no, I, I'm, I'm sure Miss Crystal will be much more comfortable in a chair. Come here, Annie. Here we are. <laughs> uh, uh, would you, um, care for a drink? No, thanks. Oh. Uh, the, the, the gentleman you were dancing with, uh, he seems rather upset. Oh. Are you sure I can't get you something? What's the matter? You don't like me? Ain't I good enough to sit in your lap? Oh, well, not at all. I, I'd be delighted, but... Uh, but I... I'm Wild Bill Bastard. Ain't no man nor dog would taste my gal away from me. You riding hurt on Christmas, I'm Bill? I riding hurt on no one. But I paid good hard cash, and I'm going to have my dance out. You go rattle hocks out of here. And I said good hockey to you, all I. Gentlemen, I think the language is getting a trifle right. After all, there are ladies present. Well, who are you, you son of a gun? The name is Kendall. Well, good hockey to you, You Kendall. have your ride, mister. I ain't dancing no more with you. He'd like to stop my you feet off, Mr. Kendall. I rather, think, I rather think it's up to the lady. Don't you, chum? Lady? She ain't no lady. Bill. Son of a gun. Bill, I'm right. giving you one second to rattle hocks out, and then I'm going to blow your ears off. No, 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 no. Oh, no need of that, are. Mr. Smith. You'll go along quietly, won't you, Mr. Baskin? Oh, you think you're a pretty big son of a gun, don't you? Well, you don't stampede me, mister. Now, come on, girl. Oh, no. Not at all polite. Hey, you're breaking my heart. Then, then be a good chap, and as Mr. Smith puts it, go rattle your heart. Ain't no son of a gun telling me what to do. I'm Wild Bill Bascom. Get out of here, Tommy. Get out of here. Oh, son of a gun. You killed me. What do you mean, you killed him? He shot himself. You didn't even draw on him. Now, I don't allow no gun shooting in here. Uh, Jake, it's Bill Baskin. He aimed to salivate Mr. Kendall here, and he killed himself instead. Oh, that silly son of a gun. Now, you boys, you get him up out of there. That, that rug cost me $300. Will somebody get a doctor? He's not dead. Yeah, I bet he is. How much you bet, mister? He ain't dead. I've seen him move. Look. Why don't you shut your mouth? Get him off my rug. Take him in back. You can put him on the faro table. Give me a hand. Yeah, sure. Somebody yeah. find a doctor, please. Ain't no doctor except my army surgeon. He's getting himself scalped oh, by his nose. Well, that's true. Ain't no doctor around here. Yeah. I never know Carefully this now. is heavy. Carefully. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, break up the game, boys. There's a goner here. Needs a table. Come on, brother. I tell you. All right, all right, boys. Put him down. I'm dying, boy. Give me a drink. I'll get it. Put him down, I said. Put him down. All right, he's there. Oh. My old Marcy. See me now. Annie, see if you can find some bandages. Clean rag, hot water. Sure. And don't you fret, Bill. Right. You're going to be just fine. Well, i got to get back to the bar. Anything you boys need, you let me know. Whiskey's on the house, Batman. You're a good man, Jay. I'll put in a word for you when I get where I'm going. Yeah, well, you do that. So long. All right, now. Let's get that jacket off, Dustin. Oh. Mister, mister you're treating me like I, I don't deserve it. Don't talk now. Smith, get the other arm. Oh, sure. Hey. No, I'm not. Now, wait a minute. Now, look, I, I ain't kidding you. These are my dying words. I... <coughs> I tried to kill you. Yeah. In my drink, I, I, I tried to, and it's heavy on my kind. 
Well, I sure wish I had me a preacher to make my peace with. Bill, will you shut your I... son of a gun mouth and let us get this here jacket no. off of yeah. you? I ain't careful now. Uh, uh, there we are. Now I have to tear the shirt. No. No, boy. This is my my bare shirt. I I want to be buried in it. Here's the whiskey, Bill. Let me uh, chop his head up. Crystal, you angel of mercy. That, that's what you are, Crystal. You... <laughs> Crystal girl, I'm asking your forgiveness, sweetheart. <laughs> I acted purely like a boom tail with you. Forget it, Bill. Finish your drink. Does look mean, don't it, Mr. Smith? Kim? Smith, Smith, come over here. Yeah, mm-hmm. Just hold it still. I reckon he ain't got long. You know, if he don't bleed to death, it's gangrene for sure. Now, we can stop the bleeding, I think. But we've got to get that bullet out. Oh, ain't nobody yeah, around here look. crazy enough to try that. Bottle, ain't no man. sense carving up the poor son of a gun. Let him die comfortable like he doesn't he have is. to die. There might be a chance. Will you help? Help what? Operate on him. You're loco. There's nothing to lose. How about another drink, boy? I'm going fast. All right, Give him all he wants, Chris. We'll keep pouring it into him. Now you think it's fitting for a man to die drunk? I think it's fitting for a man not to feel any more pain than he has to. What you doing with that knife? I told you I'm going to take that bullet out of him. If you want to help me, good. If not, you'll oblige me by rattling your hocks out of here. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Poor Jack Benny. The gang arranges a surprise party for him on his birthday. But the surprise backfires in a hilarious way today on CBS Radio's Jack Benny program. Never mind the greeting cards. Forget about buying him a present. Just be sure to join us on most of these same stations later on today when everybody has a good time at Jack Benny's birthday party, except Jack himself. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. There are some men who possess a rather odd sentimentality about pain and death. They don't hesitate to empty a gun into a living body. With clear and shining conscience, they do this deed. But for those same men to retrieve a life, to cut into flesh to do so, that is a different matter. Walleye Smith was of this type. The thought of operating on Bill Bascom offended his sense of delicacy. You ain't no doc. You can't do that. I can bloody well try. Sheet up. And here's your water. Good girl. Put it down on the table. Now, which one of you ladies will help? I will. Oh, sure. Me too. All right. We'll try to stop the bleeding first. How do you feel, Bill? I'm dying, partner. How about another drink? Annie. Sure. Crystal, take some sheeting. Press it over the wound. Keep holding it there. Son of a gun, Candle, I say you can't do it. My dear fellow, will you step over here for a moment? Now, now, Smith, look here. The fact that Bascom might die is partially my fault. How come? He shot himself. The circumstances. Excuse me. Well, you ain't no doc. So you said. You'll kill him. If we're lucky, I won't. If a man's luck runs out, that's the end. Don't pay to go again, nature. At a less pressing moment, I should be delighted to enter into a philosophical discussion with you, Smith. But not just now. Now, be a good chap and don't argue. But I ain't arguing, you son of a gun. I'm telling you, you ain't going to cut Bill up. Smith, I took you for something more than a thick-headed club hopper. I see I was mistaken. Oh, mister, you go on talking like that, there's going to be another dying man in here. Oh, dear. Awfully sorry. <coughs> out and stay out. Oh, son of a gun. Now, how's our patient? It's half the bottle. There's enough rot gut in him to melt that bullet. <laughs> Wishful thinking, my dear. Bill, I'm going to take the bullet out. You'll do. All right, Crystal. Take a handful of rags. And when I tell you, wipe the blood away. What do you want me to do? Hold his hand. Try to keep him still. 
Ready? Yes. Here we go. I didn't know how deeply the bullet had penetrated. I could only guess at its approximate direction. I made an incision. I'm doing it. Get out. A hundred said Bascom makes it. Who said that? Me. You're on. Wipe. He ain't breathing so good. I know. I'm... Will you get out? No, no, not me. I got money on Bill. Anybody else want to make a little bet? Yeah, 50. He's still alive in two hours. Odds on that, two get you one. A bet. Wipe. Oh, why don't you go on out? We're trying to save him. You go right on trying, Annie. Anybody else? Well, I'd like maybe... Uh... Kendall... What do you think? Has he got a chance? How the devil should I know? Sure is a mess, ain't he? Hey, poor old Bill, he was a good man. Yeah, he sure could top a hole. Yeah. Jake, 200, he's still alive come 4 o'clock. Uh, midnight now. I'll take it. All right, now, Candle, you son of a gun, you pull him through. You want a chance to win? Oh, sure I do. Get these people out. All right, come on, Jake. No, Everybody, no, no, on. I'm staying. I got a big investment in that boy. Very well. I'm finished. You stay here. I won't go on. Let him die. I oh, see. Let him die. Oh, all right. All right. All right. We'll wait outside. Now, Walleye, you stay. You give us the word every five minutes. Well, sure. Uh, hold him. Hold, hold him down. Hold him. I got you, Billy boy. Yeah. Rest easy. Easy. Uh, uh, now, I can't find it. I can't find it. Give me a rag, Crystal. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Look at the color of him. He's going. Annie, give him whiskey, quickly. Yes. Yeah. That's better. Uh. Oh. Ah. I can feel it. I, I, I can feel it. Yes. There. Yes, I've got it. White crystal. There. There. Now, ain't that something? I never did see a piece of lead dug out before. Son of a gun. Hey, everybody, he got it out. And the son of a gun is still alive. We bound up the wound, made him as comfortable as he could. He lost a great deal of blood and was terribly weak. There was nothing to do now but wait. The two girls stayed in a room with me, and there was something very different about them. Both were far from being beautiful, but there was a softness, a quality of loveliness, which made their garish costume seem completely out of place. Howdy. Uh, how, how, how's he coming? Uh, about the same. You know, there's better than 10,000 been bed outside. At 3.30 now, you, you think he'll live till 4? He might. i got 200 says he got to. Yeah, and obviously he's got to. <laughs> kind of funny if he does pull through, though, huh? It'll be a miracle. He ain't a bad son of a gun. Sure looks white. Quiet. Almost like a kid, don't he? Uh, anything I can do, Kendall. You say a prayer if you feel like it. Yeah, well, I ain't a praying man, but I, I hope he makes it. Uh, not on account of my 200, I just hope he makes it. For you, that's a prayer, Smith. <clears throat> You'll have a drink. No, no, thank you. Well, I, I, I'll go out and, and keep them all quiet. Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> Mister? Yes, Crystal? I know a prayer. You think it'd help? I don't know. It might. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff. Bascom. Bascom. Bill? How do you feel? Bill? Can you hear me, Bascom? I'm dying, boy. Give me a drink. Wild Bill Bascom didn't die. A number of people won money because of it, and a number of others lost. Mr. Smith insisted on dividing his winnings with me. During his presentation speech, he was so overcome that not once did he refer to me as a son of a gun, an omission I was happy to overlook. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Stacey Harris, Virginia Gregg, Eve McVeigh, Barney Phillips, and Charles Seal. Music was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. Bailey, Matt King Cole, and Eartha Kitt may not tell all to Mitch Miller tonight, but knowing Mitch as we do, we're sure his talented visitors will feel free to talk about anything and everything of interest. For an informal get-together with some of the brightest names in show business, hear the Mitch Miller Show every Sunday night on most of these same stations. Now stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman. John Wall speaking... This is the CBS Radio Network. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.